Deceased is a wildly popular series over at DC, telling us the story of anti-life virus zombies taking over the planet. It has now come to its full conclusion, with three parts, one, two, and three, and two spin-off titles, giving us five years of Deceased. So we felt it was time to make one giant video so that you can enjoy the entire Deceased storyline from start to finish. This is the Comic Storian channel where we take comic books, turn them into audio drama so that you know what's going on in the world of comics and what to add to your collection. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video, and if you want to support us further, check us out on Patreon. Thunder echoes as blow after blow falls on Darkseid's face, the final punch breaking his jaw, and the Kryptonian steps back. Wonder Woman tightens her hold on the lasso of truth, which finds itself wrapped around Darkseid's throat. The invasion lasted a week, with the entirety of the Justice League mobilized to stop it. You will leave Earth now, Darkseid, Superman tells the god glaring at him, and Batman steps forward. You will not return to our world. Say it, Wonder Woman snarls, tightening her hold. The lasso compels you. Darkseid stands, his wound seemingly having no effect on him. He tugs free of the lasso, turning to an opening boom to I will not return, for I have no need. The truth is, I have what I came for. The cosmic being tells them as he steps through the portal, disappearing. The team straightens up, danger having left their miss. You know, I thought that was going really well, up until that ominous last sentence. Green Arrow equips, slackening the arrow on his bowstring, when suddenly a device on Batman's utility belt begins to chime, bringing everyone's attention to him. Cyborg's missing, he states simply. He's not in Metropolis. He's not on Earth. The group doesn't understand how Batman would know that, but he simply tells them that he has a tracker monitoring Cyborg's every movement. He's a walking weapon with apocalypse technology running through his body and brain, which we've barely scratched the surface of understanding. It would be irresponsible to let that kind of unknown power move freely. The team all stare at Batman as a Superman finally asks the question. Did Vic know you were tracking him? Batman's silence is answer enough. And anger courses through the flash as he's suddenly whirling around asking questions. Do you have a tracker on Superman? He finally asks. No. Sighs of exasperation fill the team. Anyone concerned about the slight pause there? Green Arrow asks. The team puts aside the question of the morality of Batman's decision for a moment. They need to find Vic. On Apocalypse, Desaid finishes pushing the final stake through Cyborg's limbs, pinning him to a table like an insect. He smiles a toothy grin, questioning Vic on whether he knows of the anti-life equation. He smiles, explaining that it is the end of all free will. That whoever controls the anti-life equation will dominate all sentient races. Desaid continues to preach, ignoring Cyborg's sarcastic comments, when finally, he tells Vic that Darkseid has found the final half of the anti-life equation. In you, the god states as he steps out of the shadows. Cyborg stares at the massive villain, raising one eyebrow. Were you waiting in the corridor to make a good entrance? He asks with a slight smile. The dark ruler stares at him for a moment before ordering Desaid to take his tongue. With a cackle of glee, the torturer sets about his grim task. Darkseid then asks Desaid, if he's ready to begin. And the evil minion informs him that if Cyborg is killed by the merging process, then the anti-life equation will be lost. Darkseid nods. We must control Victor Stone's end. He states, pulling free his mother box. I will summon death. Summoned, the black race just suddenly appears in the room, with Darkseid reaching out, grasping the deity by the throat. I have need of you, he growls. Desaid moves forward, using his technology to steal a piece of death. The energy merging with Victor Stone, he begins to chant the anti-life equation. But the use of death corrupts that which is already corrupted in nature. Darkseid can suddenly feel it, scratching at the inside of his mind. And he screams, his fingers clawing at his face. Desaid looks on in fear, and the black racer watches with the passivity of death. It is time for God to die. He intones hollowly. Desai turns. While immune to the disease, he knows that he must send Cyborg away before all of Apocalypse falls to this. The boom tube opens and suddenly, the hero is gone. But it was too late. Darkseid lashes out and the Black Racer falls. He leaps upward, destroying the city in his wake. And finally, he falls into one of the fiery pits, plummeting to the very core of Apocalypse itself. The planet shudders before it explodes, killing all of those that call Apocalypse its home. On Earth, the tube opens, and Victor falls into the streets of Metropolis. 
He can feel the disease course through him and he tries to wall it off, yet he is not quick enough. His bloody mouth with no tongue opens to warn those around him. Some try to help while others are merely taking pictures in their ever-present smartphones. Merging with Victor though, the equation has become digital, leaping quickly into the internet. From there, it infects all of those that it comes in contact with. Those that surround Vic suddenly become frightened, their fingers clawing at the flesh of their own bodies as they try to scratch free of the disease that has overtaken them. But the fear disappears and the infection spreads. Victor watches as the frightened turn to rage and they begin to lash out at those around them. Meanwhile, in the home of Scott Free and Big Barda, Superman questions his allies about whether they can help him save Victor. Mid-conversation, though, he stops, his super hearing picking up the disturbance in the city. Did you hear that? He asks before leaping through the window. Superman looks below the city. The world is screaming. The people fight and they kill below him. Blood flowing from their eyes, their ears, their mouth. Fear fills Superman's eyes as he turns towards home. John, Lois. In their apartment, Lois is looking for her phone when John and Damien play a video game. Damien, where is it? John asks, looking away from the screen. You have x-ray vision, Damien responds. That's actually a good point. He finds the phone on the other side of the room and he begins to reach out for it. But a blast of Superman's heat vision takes it out. And the Man of Steel turns, blasting the TV as well. Don't look at the screens, he orders them. No screens. But in the Batcave, Batman finishes firewalling the Batcave, and he orders the computer to swing to the analog cameras that are positioned around Gotham. He watches as his city tears itself apart. The people are barely human anymore, attacking those that are left. The Bat computer runs projections. 600 billion are infected worldwide, with the virus spreading to the rest of the internet in a matter of days. Has the connection been disabled in the house? He suddenly asks, and the computer voice informs him that it has not. Fear takes over Batman as he suddenly lurches from his chair, ordering the computer to activate the EMP in the manor. Upstairs, the house goes dark. At their apartment, Lois and Clark look out on the city in chaos. I need to assemble the League, Clark tells her. Look out there. Who knows what's left of the League, she tells him. Damien looks down at the radio in his hand, unable to reach his father. The radio is so always supposed to work. Superman continues to look out on the city and he tells Damien that Batman will have contingencies in place. He'll do anything to reach Damien. I've learned to never underestimate your father, he tells him. But at the manor, Batman moves quietly through the darkened house, calling out to his family, and finally hearing Alfred yelling for him from the kitchen. He rushes through the darkness and he explodes into the room, discovering Alfred trying to hold the infected Nightwing at bay with a knife. The zombie rushes forward, with Bruce managing to knock him aside. Feebly, he tries to reason with Dick, but the young man is no longer there. Tim comes in from behind, biting hard under Batman's arm. Alfred, run! Bruce screams as the boys that he raised begin to bite into him, their hands clawing at his flesh. Run! The first days of the outbreak saw the people of the world isolated from one another. In the middle of the North Atlantic, a ship dips in the waters, gently pushed by the waves of the ocean. And behind it, a trail of shipping containers dip below the water. Pulling himself over the side, Aquaman moves along the deck. Hello. Is anyone here? He calls out and silence is his answer. As he passes one of the bulkheads, a strange noise reaches his ears. It's all right, he calls out, reaching for the handle, pulling the door open. Help is here. But the creatures, they all turn, their eyes drawn by the sound and the movement of the door opening. Aquaman can't help it. He stares in surprise at the hold full of the dead. They rush him and the hero falls back as their bloody claws reach for his flesh. Aquaman is pushed back, tumbling over the side of the ship as the dead attack him. They drift beneath the waves until the waters are clouded. But back in Metropolis, John, aka Superboy, and Damien, aka Robin, stare out into the destruction of the world that they have known. The city is bright in the distance, alit with dozens of fires. Damien, Batman will be okay, John tells his friend. I'm not worried, John. Why not? I'm like 70% sure this is Armageddon, John tells him, glancing briefly at his stoic friend. I'm not worried, John. Behind them, Lois puts down the phone, telling Clark that her parents are okay and they're headed into the bunker. Superman nods, telling her that he needs to get to Smallville, but not before he knows that they are all safe. The planet, head to the Daily Planet, Lois tells him with a determined look on her face. Meanwhile, over in Gotham City, I want to state for the record that I think this is a terrible idea. 
Harley tells Poison Ivy, readying her bat. The two stand outside a plain door in the back alley of Gotham. What record? Harley nods to the question, turning and heading away, offering to go ahead and make an official record. But Ivy stops her, vines growing from the earth wrapping around her leg. Should you be using the green like that? Harley asks. Ivy nods and smiles, letting Harley know that the vines actually enjoy crushing people. Right, well, I'll never sleep in the same room as a houseplant again. Ivy steers Harley towards the door again, giving her a kiss on the cheek and tells her that she is strong enough to do this. I'll be waiting by the botanical gardens. Face your monster, she tells her. The door swings open to a dark room with weapons lining against it. Mr. J? Harley calls out in the quiet. The faint flicker of TV screens reach Harley's eyes and she crosses the room, finding the Joker sitting in front of a row of screens. I've been thinking, and I know you don't like it when I do that, she begins. I'm here to say, our life is over, she tells him. The Joker begins to turn, his eyes crazed, his face covered in blood. And outside of Metropolis, I hate camping. I don't know how you two talked me into this. Hal tells Oliver and Dinah as he holds a marshmallow over the fire near the tents. The three friends are chatting around the fire, away from all the screens, with Dinah telling Hal that they just saved the world from an invasion by Darkseid. They deserve a night away from everything. Eventually, Hal walks away from the group, letting them know that he's going to go turn in. He's on his phone, Dinah notes, seeing the gentle glow of the screen through the tent. So much for getting away from it all, Oliver agrees. And suddenly the pair are greeted by strange noises coming out of Hal's tent. The campsite is torn apart as the green hard light constructs erupt outward, throwing Oliver and Dinah away. Hal? Oliver questions from the grass. The pair can only look stunned as the Green Lantern stares at them, his eyes filled with a look of murder. Hal Jordan of Sector 2814, lethal force is not authorized. The ring begins to chime. Oliver realizes what this means and he yells for Dinah to move, diving away as the green tendrils suddenly shoot out of the ground, destroying the spot that they were just at. One of the tendrils nicks Dinah and Oliver doesn't hesitate. He fires his boxing glove arrow to try and stun Hal. The trick arrow seems to have no effect and Hal begins to float over to Dinah. Oliver nods, drawing a deadly arrow next. Jordan, I don't know what's going on with you, man but the next thing coming at your face isn't a punch. Suddenly, the massive green teeth are launched at Oliver, and fear shines in the hero's eyes. Dinah screams with her canary cry, knocking Jordan away, breaking his concentration. But back in the city, Superman and his family land on the rooftop of the Daily Planet. Lois moves to the doors, knowing that they need to get inside so that they can start linking up with survivors and broadcasting a warning to the world. But Clark stops her, scanning the floors below them with his x-ray vision. The whole building is swarming with monsters. People we know? Lois questions. Clark bows his head in sadness as he answers. Yes. Suddenly he turns and he begins to float into the air before turning back to his family. John, do not let anything through that door before I return. I heard something. Back in the forest, Dinah stands over the body of Hal Jordan, Oliver behind him, a former hero laying still. Green Lantern of 2814 is deceased. The ring begins to chime, sliding off of Hal's finger, scanning for a replacement. Briefly, the ring turns before finally hovering in front of Dinah Lance. Dinah Lance of Earth, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. The forest is filled with a bright green light as Dinah is suddenly turned into a lantern. Whoa! Oliver gasps, stunned, but Dinah looks down at herself. She doesn't want this. Take it, Clark tells her as he hovers into view. We're going to need it. The three heroes quickly make their way to the Daily Planet. We made contact, Lois tells Clark as the three heroes come in. Damien holds up his radio. It's Batman! The Dark Knight quickly begins to tell the group that these creatures are not zombies. They're consumed by hunger. They're not feeding. They're spreading death, he tells them. They're stealing life. These are the anti-living. The trigger is an equation. I always knew that math would doom us all. Oliver nods, but Batman doesn't have a lot of time. We see him standing in the Batcave, clad in one of Mr. Freeze's suits in order to slow down his infection. Behind him, Alfred stands ready, shotgun in hand. Bruce, Clark responds, sadness in his voice as he realizes what his friend is saying. But Batman tells him, there's no time for sentiment. The virus is a technological and biological hybrid. To save the world, you're going to have to destroy any human carriers and take down the internet. Oliver nods again. I always expected we'd have to destroy the internet to save the world. I just didn't know it'd be like this. Bruce, there must be something we can do for you, Dinah asks. But Batman tells them, there isn't anything. Damien, Alfred has something for you. It's something that I've always wanted to give you. 
Something I know that you would have earned. One day. Batman says, sadness in his voice. I'm sorry that I won't see you. But the words are choked off. And Damien stares at the radio in his hand. Father. Dad. In the Batcave, Alfred watches as Batman begins to convulse, his hand reaching up, clawing at the helmet of the Mr. Freeze suit. It shatters, spilling glass around the computer. Batman turns, a crazed look filling his eyes as he stares at his butler. Computer, cease transmission, Alfred orders, racking the shotgun. I'm sorry, my son, Alfred tells Bruce as he aims the weapon. That day, the cave was filled with the sound of gunfire. After Alfred was forced to put down an infected Batman with a shotgun, he stands in the Batcave, staring down at the bodies of the three men that he thought of as his sons. My boys, he intones softly. I'm sorry I couldn't save you, he whispers. Though they can no longer hear him, Alfred hangs his head, taking the steel case that Bruce entrusted him with, and he turns to climb aboard the Batwing. The plane streaks across the sky, flying high over the undead, teeming streets of Gotham City. Alfred reaches for the controls, his eyes determined now. And with a click, he releases the bombs, something that Bruce would never have used on living targets. But the people of Gotham, they're no longer alive. The bombs fall, exploding in the streets below, sending the once human population flying, limbs ripping free in the destruction. And Harley runs as the building behind her explodes, rounding the corner and finding a survivor trying to defend himself. His shotgun goes flying as the monsters swarm him. She doesn't hesitate. She grabs her weapon and racks the flesh round in. Back off! I mean it! She yells and the monster that was once the Joker careens down the alleyway towards her. His hands reaching out. She turns, jamming the barrel into the Joker's stomach. Mr. J, you were never any good for me. She snarls, pulling the trigger. The shotgun kicks in her hand and the blast cuts the Joker apart. His body falling to the ground and Harley Quinn staring, shocked. My God, that was the most cathartic thing ever. She yells in triumph and she turns, striding down the alleyway. But she stops when she sees two heroes drop to the ground in front of her. Oh, come on. The zombie birds of prey? She groans as Huntress, Batgirl, Batwoman, and Catwoman land, their eyes blank, their bodies covered in blood. Harley nods as the creatures reach towards her, racking the shotgun once again. Really? Okay. She sighs. I guess we're going bird hunting. But on the rooftop of the Daily Planet, Damien sits against the wall, with John coming over to talk to his friend, but the young boy isn't in the mood. So John just sits with his friend. Is the kid gonna be all right? Oliver asks. And Superman nods as he looks at the two young boys. Damien is his father's son. He'll find a way to bury it and keep on going. But he just lost his dad. Finally, Clark turns to Lois, telling her, I have to go home. I'll secure the building first. Dinah steps forward, asking Superman if he needs any help, but Clark just shakes his head. Thanks, Dinah, but I'll manage. In a blur, he's gone, moving through the building at super speed. He grabs the infected, pulling them out of the building and dropping them into the streets. After the last of the infected are deposited outside, he flies upwards, ripping free the Daily Planet globe, dropping it in front of the exit. Landing on the rooftop, he gives his family one last hug before he goes, with Damien watching from his seat. Ali, Dinah, please keep my family safe. Clark asks his friends as he takes to the air. Of course, Dinah tells him, the newest Green Lantern. Deep below the ocean, the tide swirls against the ancient city of Atlantis. Concentrate, Garth! Mara hisses. You can do this! You can push against the tides! And if you can't, maybe you should rethink the name Tempest! She tells him. From now on, your new superhero name is going to be Mild Weather Event. But the ocean around them grows darker, and the two Atlanteans look up. It's not the setting sun that darkens their day, it's the water itself. Blood is clouding the water around them as Aquaman, turned into one of the infected hordes, fights through the warriors of Atlantis. The blood seeps down, filling the lungs of Tempest, with Mera trying to warn him. But it's too late, and Garth suddenly roars as his brain is altered by the infected blood. His fingers begin to tear at the flesh of his face as Mera watches in horror. The infected rush towards her as she looks on with fear in her eyes, and as she begins to swirl the waters using her power, she screams out, YOU WILL NOT TAKE ME! She flees as all of Atlantis is consumed by the blood around her. But back with Superman, he flies towards Smallville. He can't help but stop and aid the survivors that he passed along the way. His breath saved a couple from the horde, and he later lifted up a school bus to safety. 
Along the way, he also found Black Lightning and his family, fighting an infected Clayface. The villain fell quickly, though and Superman told the hero to head towards the Daily Planet. Finally, he arrives at his family farm. He arrives home. Martha stands in the yard, shovel in hand, as she stares at the barn door. Where's Pa? He asks, and his mother motions quietly to the barn, before telling him, he's inside. Gently, Clark opens the door, stepping inside of the cool building, and beneath his feet, he can hear his father banging on the hatch to the root cellar. He reaches down, snapping the lock without any effort, and then he opens the door to reveal his father, crazed, covered in blood. The man who raised him reaches for him, thirsty for death and destruction. Clark takes his arms, sadness filling his face as he forces his father back into the cellar, and he shuts the door. His heat vision cuts through the door quickly. He steps back outside, his mother standing there in tears, crying. It's time to go, he tells her, but she shakes her head. We can't leave. This is our home. Your father. She begins to cry as Clark lifts her in his arms. He isn't here, Ma. He tells her as they leave the place that he grew up. He isn't here. The streets of Washington, D.C. are bright with fire and destruction. Deep below the earth, Captain Adams stands in the Cadmus headquarters, looking at the dead body of an infected woman. Any word? Amanda Waller asks behind him. Adam shakes his head, telling her that Ray Palmer is still inside of the woman, trying to figure out a way to destabilize the virus from the inside. But Waller just shakes her head. They've activated Plague Protocol C. Satellite imagery has isolated the worst infected areas, and we need you to start exercising the infection, she tells him. I'm sorry. Captain Adam flies over the city streets, using his powers of radiation to burn the infection away. His blast cuts through the creatures that line the streets, but suddenly his eyes go wide. Amanda, something's inside me. Within Captain Adam's body, the infected Ray Palmer continues to attack his bloodstream. His eyes are crazed, and his hands attack anything that gets close. Outside, Captain Adam screams as the infection attacks from within. Meanwhile, back at the Daily Planet, Clark finally arrives with his mother. For a brief moment, John is happy, asking about his grandfather, but Martha only begins to cry, and Lois moves in to comfort her. Briefly, the family comes together in their grief, embracing one another. But afterwards, Lois explains that they're almost ready to start broadcasting to any survivors. I can't stop. I have to get back out there, Superman tells her in the group. But Oliver puts his hand on the Man of Steel's shoulder. We talked about it. You can't, Superman. I understand that restraining you with my hand is entirely symbolic, and I know that you can walk straight through me. Diana steps forward, telling Clark, It's too dangerous for you to be out there. If you saw a scream... I won't, Clark assures her. I've been using my x-ray vision from the nanosecond that I worked out what was causing this, he tells her. Diana finally nods, letting Clark know that she's just going to come with him. Lois steps up, finally broadcasting to as much of the world as they can reach. This is Lois Lane of the Daily Planet. I know the world looks like a nightmare. If you can hear me, I know you're scared, but you are not alone. Around the world, survivors huddle in the dark rooms, pulling closer their radios. Heroes, who weren't sure if they were the last ones, feel a measure of hope. Villains, who once planned to rule the world, pause at the death and destruction before them. We are regrouping. The Justice League is gathering in Metropolis. Anyone with power or means to confront this, please come to the Daily Planet roof, if it is safe and if you are capable of doing so. Meanwhile, on Amazon Island, Mara stands before Queen Hippolyta, having actually survived. My city is gone. My people are gone. I didn't know where else to go, she tells her. Hippolyta steps forward, reaching out an arm to the proud Queen of Atlantis. You are welcome in Themyscira. Behind them, Wonder Woman stands, listening to Lois's message, and finally she turns to her mother as she questions where she's going. Metropolis. Lois continues her message as Superman and Black Canary search for the heroes that might be able to give them more time. I've seen them, Clark tells her, using his ability to find Wally West and Barry Allen. He rips off the door to their bunker, but Barry looks at him in fear. We can't leave, Superman. Batman told us what to do. If either one of us becomes infected, it would spell disaster. I can move you safely, Dinah tells them. Barry looks at her in surprise. You're a Green Lantern now? Back in Gotham, Harley stops and turns, firing the shotgun down the alleyway. The spread rips through the zombie birds of prey, but it doesn't stop them. She racks another shell, squeezing the trigger, but the weapon clicks empty. Aw, nuts! She whispers. 
but the birds are suddenly thrown aside as vines wrap around them and Poison Ivy steps forward, her vines crushing the zombies. Now that was pretty romantic, Harley tells her, taking her hand. Crushing the undead is romantic. The two head off into the city, leaving the undead behind them. Come, the green will protect us, Ivy tells her. And on the rooftop of the Daily Planet, Lois begins her message once again. But John stops her as he hears something. It sounds like thunder, he whispers. It sounds like impending doom, Oliver tells them. Trust me, I've been doing this for a long time. I have a finely tuned ear for the impending. Everyone's eyes grow big as Giganta pulls her way up the building, the giant zombie reaching for the heroes. Black Lightning and Green Arrow open fire, yelling for the others to push her back, when suddenly missiles sail out of nowhere, exploding against the giant creature. Damien looks on shocked as the Batwing sails in, but Giganta reaches out, snagging the plane out of the sky. It begins to spiral and crash, but Dinah reaches out, plucking it from the sky with a giant green hand. Superman! Take her down, she screams. The mana still doesn't even slow, barreling into the giant, knocking her to the ground. Superman, move! Wonder Woman orders as she flies in, her sword gleaming and ready to strike. But Clark catches her, stopping the attack. Are you serious, Clark? That is an undead giant. I'm not giving it time to get back up. But Clark tries to reason with her, letting her know that there is still hope for saving everyone. When suddenly, Giganta explodes into a shower of blood and guts. Cyborg stands there his hand cannon smoking from the shot that blew a hole in the giant zombie's head. She wasn't alive, he tells them, and Superman looks at him shunned. None of them are. We need to talk. Up on the rooftop, Dinah gently lowers the Batwing, with Damien running over yelling for his father. But that cockpit raises, and it reveals Alfred. Damien, I'm sorry, my son, he tells the boy, sadness in his eyes. Alfred lowers the case, opening it to the boy, and inside, there's a bat suit and Batman gear awaiting its heir. He said you were worthy of it, that he was proud of you, and that he should have told you that every day. Tears begin to fill the eyes of Damien as he closes the distance between him and Alfred and the two embrace. On the rooftop, special lenses are given to Wally and Barry to protect their eyes from accidentally looking at any screens. But Cyborg is there now, trying to explain that these creatures aren't zombies. Hey man, if it groans like a zombie and shuffles like a zombie, Oliver starts, but Cyborg explains that the creatures are a blight, an extension of the anti-life equation. The blighted ones want to spread death, nothing more, he tells them. Oliver calls out to Hawkgirl, who suddenly drops out of the sky from above them, her wings blackened and singed. Wonder Woman grabs her, asking what happened. Captain Adam, she tries to tell them. He turned and he's going to blow. In DC, Captain Adam continues to pulse with power. Superman and Wonder Woman speed forward, trying to stop him. They reach out, snagging the former hero in their arms. Superman, hold him! Wonder Woman screams as the radiation hits them both, but the hero suddenly erupts, the blast catching them both, and it begins to spread outward, destroying everything in its path. The survivors on the Daily Planet watch as the blast radius crawls towards them, Black Lightning reaching for his family, pulling them close. Close your eyes, he tells them. Hold on to me. And the light fills their world until that is all there is. Superman and Wonder Woman float over the remains of Washington, D.C. The city scorched, the smoking landscape below them. Metropolis. Superman whispers, and the two take off at top speed. The city passes beneath them, destroyed by the dying blast of Captain Adam. When they arrive in the city, though, they find the remains of the Daily Planet, floating in a bright green ball. Clark reaches out, and within the orb, Lois presses her hand against her husband's. Suddenly, from below, a voice calls out, reaching Superman's ears. Superman! Lex calls. The Man of Steel floats down to his greatest enemy. His eyes burning with anger. Lex, by row of you so much as... He snarls. But Lex holds up his hands, offering a truce with his former enemy. I'm not here to... Lex begins, but he can't finish as he falls to his knees. Look what happened to our city. Tears in his eyes. Days pass and the heroes work to stop the spread, with Flash taking out the internet, speeding around the globe, destroying all of the servers. In space, Diana works to take out every major broadcasting device, her sword destroying the floating satellites. Next, she heads to Themyscira, where she convinces her mother to open up the island to the survivors of the world. We're supposed to be their protectors. It is time that we offered protection here, she tells them. With her agreement, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Mara use their powers to lift more of the sea floor, creating more landmass on Amazon Island. In Gotham, 
The jungle grew around the city, walling it off against the infection. Dinah, Damien, and Oliver arrive, hoping to convince Poison Ivy to accept more refugees in her jungle safe haven. Let me do the talking, Damien tells him, clad in his bat suit. Are you sure you're not exactly a people person? Oliver asks. Ivy's not exactly people. Suddenly there's a roar behind them, and the creature that was once Killer Croc leaps from the bushes. Arrows and batarangs fly, but it is the vines that pierce his flesh, which finally end the monster. The vines then circle the heroes, but Damien orders his friends not to hurt the plants. Good call, bad boy. Harley smiles as the gate opens to reveal her and Poison Ivy. Why are you here? Why is Robin dressed as a tiny Batman? Ivy asks, pulling Damien closer. Batman's gone, he tells her. The two villains look surprised, and even Ivy turns a sad eye to the boy. I'm sorry, she tells him. Once they are freed, Damien asks the villain that they be allowed to bring the survivors to her jungle, to be protected from the plague. Harley smiles, admitting that she has been trying to convince Ivy to do just that, but Poison Ivy crosses her arms, sighing. <sighs> there will be rules. Elsewhere. Cyborg and Luther were able to set up closed communications, setting the Fortress of Solitude as a new information hub, and the remaining heroes of Earth gather there. This is quite impressive, Victor, Luther admits. Why have we never worked together before? You kept trying to kill me and my friends, Cyborg tells him. Sure, but in my defense, that was before I realized you could be useful. Green Arrow joins the duo, asking what they are working on as Cyborg leans over his blueprints. The two look up, telling him that they are plans for arcs. Each arc can hold seven million people, Lex tells Superman as the hero joins them. But Superman just looks at him sternly. We're not leaving. Superman, I am the most intelligent person on the planet. Lex suddenly stops and looks over his shoulder at Cyborg. Wait, Batman is dead, yes? Yes, Cyborg nods. Right, then I am the most intelligent person on the planet and I'm telling you, the world is over. If the human race is going to survive, we have to leave the Earth. Anger fills Superman's voice and he tells him, we are not leaving the Earth if we can help it. Lex suddenly smiles, realizing what this means. Losing two homeworlds in one lifetime, how careless. But Lois is there, her fist cracking the villain across the jaw. Open your mouth against my husband again and I will smash it closed. Understood. She stomps away, turning to see John and Damien smiling at her. Uh, violence is not the answer, John, she tells him. And the Boy of Steel looks at his friend and he smiles. Looked like a pretty good answer to me. Weeks pass and survivors are brought to Gotham and Themyscira. Construction of the arcs also begins with the heroes mourning those that were lost. But as time passes, in the fortress, the heroes begin to twitch as buzzing fills their ears. The buzz erupts into a scream, and some of them begin to fall to the ground, when suddenly Lex is cut in half, his body falling to the floor in a spray of flash whirls around trying to see their attacker. Martian Manhunter suddenly appears, slashing him across the back, drawing blood. Quickly, the heroes try to defend themselves, but it is Firestorm whose voice can be heard. MOVE! He orders as the flames around him flare up, and the blast shoots across the room, cutting through the Manhunter. The monster dies, melting in an amorphous pile, but Wally suddenly turns. Barry, where did Barry go? Where is the Flash? Superman looks outward, using his supervision. He's running, he tells him, and Wally nods, preparing to sprint after him, but Clark stops him, turning with a look of determination in his eyes. I'll go. Do you think you can even catch him? Oliver asks. No. The Flash, now infected, is running through the world at super speed, infecting those that have managed to survive. In orbit, Superman looks down at the world below still, despite the death and destruction that now spreads across it. He asks over the comms. He is. Promise me. I promise, Superman. Superman nods, and he begins to fly, picking up speed as he goes. Over the comm, Cyborg asks how the Man of Steel intends to catch the fastest man alive, but Clark just tells him, I don't have to. I just need to fly in the opposite direction and meet him. Head on. Sadness fills the Man of Steel as he smashes through the Flash, sending bones, blood, and flesh scattering, destroying him in one second. He turns, looking back on the mist that was his friend only moments ago. Barry, I'm so sorry. But then he stops, and he looks down, and he realizes that the Flash's bones and fingers have pierced his skin. Even now, the Man of Steel, our one beacon of hope, can feel the infection taking over. He moves fast, crossing the world in seconds, returning to the fortress, and he stops, telling Wally that he's sorry for what happened to Barry. He asks him if he can connect him to the Speed Force. So Wally nods, seeing that Superman doesn't have very long. And Superman goes to his family. Ma, 
Thank you for finding me, for raising me, for teaching me, for giving me your name, your values, and your empathy. He tells Martha, and he hugs her, bring her in close. My world ended, and you and Pa give me another one. Next, he turns to Lois, his wife, tears filling her eyes as he pulls her close. I don't know how I got so lucky. I crossed an ocean of stars, and somehow I found you. Thank you for choosing me, he tells her. Finally, he turns to his son, who's already crying. I know things look dark, but you are the light. You are the hope. You are going to change the universe. I know it, he tells his son. No pressure. He smiles as tears spill out of his eyes. I've seen so much of the universe, and you're the best thing in it, John. With those final words, Superman rockets out of the fortress and into space, and as he clears the atmosphere, he looks into the cold void of space and suddenly stops. His eyes go wide. He took too long. The blight suddenly takes him, and he roars in anger in space, and suddenly his eyes burn with heat, and he turns back to the Earth. No longer our beacon of hope, but now the beacon of our nightmares. He is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. And as cold rain falls on what is left of New York City, the people look up and they smile. For Superman, always inspired hope. But their smiles of hope soon turn to stunned looks of fear as the man of steel plummets towards the earth. The people can't see his crazed eyes or the blood leaking out of his ears. They hear the guttural screams of rage. He smashes Earthward hard, destroying the world's largest residential building with an earth-shattering quake that wipes out most of New York in seconds. The end has begun. In the Fortress of Solitude, the remaining heroes have gathered around Cyborg. If Superman is turned, it's over. It's just over. The Ark's ready. If we leave Earth now, he tells them, but Lois shakes her head. Superman can take down both Arcs in a heartbeat. We have to take him on, Wonder Woman agrees. And it is Black Lightning who questions how they can stop the most powerful being on the planet. With this, Damien tells him, holding up a small case from his utility belts with Superman's symbol on it. Batman left a takedown plan for every major hero, Damien explains. And Green Arrow steps forward, mildly amused. Of course he did. Batman doesn't even have to be alive to scheme against us all. Damien pauses for a moment. Actually, he didn't have one for you. Oliver stopped short, shocked that Bruce didn't even think that he was dangerous. You're hurt because Batman didn't have a post-mortem Machiavellian plan to end you? Dinah asks. Well, yeah. I could be a planetary threat if I wanted to be, Eric tells her, crossing his arms, pouting just a little. Of course you could, dear. Damien removes the container, showing the kryptonite to the group. Within are also a set of schematics that Cyborg can use to create a kryptonite gas that will slow down Superman. That's not enough, Wonder Woman states, stepping forward. Bruce was a lot of things, but he was never lethal. It was admirable. But we can't hold back now, she tells the group. Dinah steps forward, asking if she has a plan. Of course. You think Batman is the only one with enough sense to plot against his friends? She turns, ordering Dinah and Cyborg to follow her while the others go and begin to load the arcs. The three heroes move through the Fortress of Solitude, and deep within, they find Superman's forge, where Wonder Woman begins to create. Her hammer rings through the icy fortress as she forges a weapon that could kill a god from beyond the stars. And while she works, she explains that Clark is most vulnerable to kryptonite and magic, and that she and her mother believed that they could combine the two. Are you sure that it'll work? Dinah asks, watching as the warrior combines her sword with the kryptonite. This is the sword of Athena. Athena was a war goddess. We fight of everything, she tells them, the hammer ringing. She was the goddess of craft. We have fused mythology with an element from a world that no longer exists. The blade dips into the icy waters, cooling and sizzling, until Wonder Woman holds it before her. Last, she was the goddess of mathematics. We are fighting an equation. This is not a coincidence. I believe we hold fate in our hands. With their work done, the three heroes fly to try and save the last people of their worlds. In Gotham, the last civilians are loaded onto the Ark, with Damien turning to Wally, telling him that it's time to go. But Ivy steps forward, shaking her head. I am not abandoning the green. She tells him, and Harley is at her side smiling. And I'm not abandoning her. Minutes go by and the two watch, hand in hand as the Ark leaves them behind. And Themyscira, Green Arrow calls for the last of the survivors to get on board. And as they wait, Queen Hippolyta and Queen Mera are interrupted as one of the Amazons points to the strange storm rolling from the sea. Briefly, Mera stares in stunned fear before speaking to the Queen of the Amazons. Move the evacuation to high ground. Ready your warriors around the Ark and the refugees. 
Is it a storm? A bullet asks. No, it is a tempest. The water suddenly churn and break as mighty tentacled beasts rise out of the ocean depths. The creature roars into the storm and hundreds of Atlanteans taken by the anti-life equation boil out of the sea. The Kraken, Mara hisses. From the creature's back, Aquaman appears with his own roar of rage and pain mixing with an army of undead the one that he commands. His cries are cut off as an arrow pierces his eye though. Dead, he plummets from the monster's back and into the ocean below. And Batman didn't think I could be dangerous, Green Arrow whispers, his bow in hand. Just fired an arrow half a mile and raging winds into the brain of the undead king of the sea while he's controlling a damned kraken. Screw you, Batman. Hippolyta orders her warriors to assemble as Mera tries to hold off the rest of the undead horde with her water magic. The two queens stand side by side, trying to hold off the tide of the dead, but they are not alone. Without fear, the Amazons of Themyscira crash into the dead of the deep. And in New York, Superman roars, his heat vision flashing out, destroying all that is around him. He wasn't that hard to find, Dinah notes as they fly over the ruins of the city. Cyborg confirms that no one is alive, and Dinah nods. Then I don't have to hold back. She says, creating a megaphone with her ring to amplify her canary cry. The piercing shriek shakes the ground around them and the shockwaves crash into the Man of Steel who falls to his knees. But over in Themyscira, the Amazons continue their battle, their blades hacking into the undead Atlanteans. Fists and feet lash out and arrows find their targets as the brave warriors try to hold back the tide. But they begin to fall. With every bite and scratch, the virus is transmitted and another warrior joins the ranks of the undead. Green Arrow keeps firing, holding the door as the last of the refugees gets on board. He yells for Mera, telling the queen that they need to leave, and her fist punches through another undead. Amazons! She shouts back. But Oliver motions to the vast army of the undead that fight below them. Mera, there's no extracting them from that, he tells her, sadness in his voice. On the beach, Apollo's fists throw more Atlanteans aside as she orders Wonder Girl to retreat. The queen knows that she won't be leaving this beach. And in a brief moment, she hands her crown to the young girl. Tell my daughter that the promise of Themyscira is hers to honor now. The young girl nods, flying from the battle to join the Ark. And on the beach below, the battle rages on. The Amazon stayed so that millions could flee. And eventually, they fell. They fell fighting. Paradise held off oblivion. And in New York, Superman has begun his battle with the Canary Cry, slowly gaining ground on Dinah. Her radio crackles and Oliver tells her that the arcs are away. Dinah can't hold out her cry. And Superman charges, smashing against the green shield that she has thrown up. Cyborg fires a shot, hoping to hold the Man of Steel off. But Superman's grasp begins to crack the shield. Suddenly, Diana is there. Her kryptonite lace sword slicing through the arm of Superman. She rears back, stabbing into his chest, and the Man of Steel roars in pain with his fist punching through her stomach. Dinah screams as Wonder Woman falls to the earth, and Cyborg watches as Superman rockets into the sky, chasing after the arcs. The two heroes gather around Diana on the ground, blood coughing through her lips. <laughs> He's seen the arcs, she tells them, her words strained. You have to stop him, she tells Dinah, handing her the sword. Green Canary stares down at the weapon in her hands before finally turning to Vic. It's okay, I'll stay with her, he tells his friend, and Dinah tries to tell him that he can't stay, but Vic shakes his head. The virus started with me, Dinah. I was never coming with you. In space, John and Damien stand at the viewport, looking down at the earth below them. He's coming, my dad, John tells his friend, and the two friends look panicked at each other. Can you do anything? Damien asks. Look after my mom. The young boys share a final hug. You're gonna be a great Batman, buddy. John whispers. Lois tries to stop her son, but John knows what to do, revealing the shield on his chest. The last beacon of hope. He rockets into space. John is the only one standing between the last survivors of Earth and extinction. His father would be so proud. The two Kryptonians rocket towards each other, connecting in the darkness of space. The force of the blow echoing throughout the void. But Superman is only stunned as John drifts away. But that moment was all that they needed. Dinah flies forward prepared to fight and end this battle. She readies the sword, but suddenly she's bathed in green light. Attention Green Lantern of Sector 2814. Her ring chimes. More Green Lanterns swarm around her, coming to her aid. Seriously, Dinah! Guy Gardner asks with a smile. I leave you alone for one month and the whole place goes to hell. 
Dinah questions what is happening, and one of the Guardians explains that the Lanterns are quarantining Earth, which, you know, isn't great because this is our space sector. Losing our whole world kind of reflects very badly upon us. Gardner notes, Dinah is shocked that he is still joking at a time like this. Hey, I might not have the incredible willpower of Hal Jordan or the stunning creativity of Kyle Rayner, but I am a master of masking my emotional terror with jokes, he tells her. The Lanterns all turn to see the undead Men of Steel floating before them. What is Superman doing? Guy asks. Dinah tells them that the creature is thinking, trying to decide if it can take them all on. The monster stares at them silent for a few moments, and then it turns, and it flies away. The Lanterns give chase, but the monster disappears into the sun. The Guardian orders the Lanterns to stop, and deep within the sun, the monster stretches, absorbing the energy from the star. It's feeding, draining the sun, the Guardians explain. In time, this entire solar system will be cold and die. Dinah floats next to him, questioning whether the Lanterns are going to let this happen. Even the Green Lantern's light is not powerful enough to reach into the heart of a star. The Guardian explains, When the sun dies, the virus will sleep. The Lanterns will monitor the situation as needed, and finally the Corps will provide escort as the Arcs make their way into deep space, searching for a new home for humanity. On Earth, Cyborg watches as Wonder Woman roars in a rage, her eyes dead now. I have a question, Cyborg shouts, tightening his hold in the lasso of truth. Can you speak? Wonder Woman stops her thrashing and she straightens up. We have a voice, she growls. He asks if there's a way to stop them. We are death. Nothing can stop us. You are a virus. Can you be cured? Yes. The rain falls around them as Cyborg asks where the cure is. The monster that was Wonder Woman struggles and he tightens his grip further. Where? She stops again. The cure is in you. Cyborg is stunned as she explains that Vic is both man and machine. Off and on. Patient Zero. The One. The Alpha and the Omega. Vic drops the lasso looking into the sky. He needs to tell the arcs. Wonder Woman roars, wrapping her arms around his head, twisting it with all her strength. She throws the head away, letting the body fall to the ground. Life is fleeting. That is the only truth. The monster whispers, death is eternal. The arcs travel and the lanterns provide support. And eventually John and Lois stand before one of the viewports. A tear in her eyes as her and her son look out the window, looking at the world that lays before them. They look over this new world, their fresh beginning, their Earth too. They are finally safe. The monsters are all behind them now. The boom tube opens in the midst of the vast destruction. It's true, Barta says to Mr. Miracle. Apocalypse, the whole planet. God is dead, Miracle nods, bowing his head for a moment, knowing that his father is dead. How do you feel? Barta asks him, and Scott looks at her for a moment. Honestly, pretty good, he tells her with a smile. They kiss amidst the destruction before turning back to their tube, leaving the planet of Apocalypse to its own devices. They need to go back to Earth and face what God has unleashed upon them. Captain Boomerang is pushing against his restraints, his eyes dead and blood covering his body. Some from the cuts all over, some from his victims. Mr. Terrific stares down at the creature deep in thought. No response to audio or visual stimuli, he says into the recorder. No reaction to touch or pain. No noticeable change after second exposure to virus. He taps a few buttons on his screens, noting that he has 14 PhDs, but he is still stumped. An alarm beeps and Terrific tells his recorder that they have to go to the source. And he launches himself out the window. On the streets, the creatures see the man leave and shamble after him. Barta and Scott stare out the window. Do we just, like, go out and start hitting Scott? They turn as a knock sounds at the door and Barta moves to answer it with Scott grabbing her hand asking, What are you doing? I don't think the undead knock that politely. She smiles at him, and Scott thinks that it only sounds like a knock. It could be a bloody stump banging against the door. And then the doorbell rings. The bloody stump found the doorbell. She smiles, answering the door, revealing Terrific standing there, explaining that he was tracking the planet for Apocalyptian tech and got a spike when they arrived. Scott comes out with a veggie platter, because you always celebrate with a veggie platter. Mr. Terrific explains that he's been studying the virus and his T-visor shields him from its effect. Did you know that it would do that? Scott asks him. No. You're one of the smartest men on the planet and you just got lucky? Yes. Terrific explains that he needs to go back to Apocalypse to find a cure for this virus. But Barda tells him that the place is destroyed. Then we move on to other plans. 
Later, at Cord Industries, Booster Gold and Blue Beetle stand ready, the door being pounded on by the undead. It's okay, the door is solid titanium, Ted tells his friend, when suddenly it explodes inward and the dust settles, revealing Big Barda. Hi, she says, leaping back outside to join the fight with the zombies. Do you want some help? Booster calls out, but Mr. Terrific's T-spheres cut through most of the zombies and the others are quickly dispatched. No, I'd, I'd say we're good, she tells him. It's good to see you, Barda, Ted tells her. You too. I'd give you a hug, but I'm covered in undead bits, she smiles. I have a part of an ear in my tights, Mr. Miracle notes. Later, the group is flying overhead in the bug, Blue Beetle's airship. It really is the end of the world, isn't it? He notes, looking down at the sea of the undead that team beneath them. I still hope we have a say in that, Terrific tells them all. Barda then asks why they don't go to the Justice League, but Terrific shakes his head. He doesn't want to be around if one of the most powerful beings on the planet gets infected by the anti-life equation. Terrific tells them that the origin of the virus is gone, so the next choice is to turn to magic. Magic is, like, notoriously unreliable. What if it's a dead end? Ted asks. Terrific is quiet for a moment before answering. There is a third option, but it could go badly. In Liverpool, John Constantine runs down the streets, hordes of undead chasing him down. Chaz! He screams, jumping into the back seat of his friend's cab. Chaz, start the car! He slams the door shut, barring the undead for a moment, but then he stares in shock as Chaz turns to him from the front. Blood covers his face from where he tore his own skin, and rage is filling his eyes. The creature reaches out for Constantine, growling. Oh, mate, I'm so sorry, John tells him calmly, his eyes burning with mystical fire. He mutters a spell and his friend bursts into flames, burning to ash before him. John pulls himself into the front seat as the monsters continue to hammer on the windows. He peels it down the street, leaving the horde behind him for a moment before slamming into another car. Ugh, why didn't I learn to drive? He groans. The horde swarms around his car, but suddenly they burst into flames. And John stares around, momentarily stunned. John Constantine, Mr. Drivet calls on the lights of the bug. John smiles, rolling down the window. Why can't you people have, like, regular names? He asks. I mean, Mr. Terrific, what kind of arrogant sod is comfortable walking around with that hanging over him? John steps out, sitting on the hood of the car as the undead burn around him. Are you okay? Scott asks him. Peachy! Just set my best man on fire and crashed his car while sitting on his ashes. How's your day going? My planet is destroyed. All right, it's not a competition. Mr. Terrific tells John that they can't find a technological solution for the problem, and they're hoping that he had a magical one. You think I can just click my fingers and make this all go away? John asks, waving his hands at the carnage around them. He shakes his head, telling them that this is beyond magic. You're not going to help? Terrific asks him. I'm going to hide and get so irresponsibly drunk that I can hardly feel anything. Care to join me? We have a world to save. Right, all of you pop and do that then, John tells them. The group turned to go, flying away in the bug with Ted watching from the window as John moves his hands, casting a portal and stepping through it. Our magician just stepped through a portal and vanished. Yes, it's option three. Terrific sighs, and the group turns, questioning what their third option could be. It's you, he says, pointing at Booster. Booster Gold, I believe you're the only person who can save humanity. Booster stares at him. You're supposed to be a great thinker. Think better. Terrific looks at him. You own a time machine. Ted turns to his friend, asking, where is your time machine? It's in safe hands, Teddy, Booster tells him. And later, the bug hovers over the home of fire and ice in Malibu. Well, this doesn't look good, Booster notes, staring down at the destruction below him. Barda notes that it looks like they fought hard, but there's no way of knowing if they're still alive down there. Mr. Miracle yells a warning as he sees fire flying towards them, her body ablaze covered in blood. She slams into the bug hard, knocking it out of the sky in a green blaze. Barta kicks the door free, yelling for the group to get to the house. So Barta and Scott hold the zombies at bay, yelling for the others to run. Fire and ice appear, and the two heroes begin to become overwhelmed, with Barta yelling out, There are too many! Knocking ice away from her. We can always escape, Scott tells her, his kick connecting with Fire's stomach. But they can't. They need to hold off the horde to save the world. We have to give Booster a chance to save the universe, Scott tells her as he lashes out at another creature. What a ridiculous statement, Barta notes as they fight. The creature slashes at Scott and he falls, and Barda catches him in her arms. But if he can turn back time, if he can find a way, he gasps as the horde closes in on them. Are your last words really going to be quoting Cher? Barda asks, holding her love in her arms. Scott reaches out, caressing Barda's cheek. I like Cher, he whispers. The horde crashes in him around them, and they're lost at a sea of the undead. Inside, the team runs through the building, blasting the undead as they pass, with Booster leading them into the basement. 
but he stops short when he sees the being standing before his time machine. Michael Carter, Wave Rider tells them as arms crossed over his chest. You will not be permitted to change time. Meanwhile, over at the pocket dimension of the Oblivion Bar, John Constantine sits at the counter. What can I get for you, John? Bubba the Chimp asks. John nods, pointing over the chimp's shoulder. Give me the bottle from the top shelf that made the Phantom Stranger forget his name, he tells him, and John stares at the bottle for a moment before cursing and getting to his feet. Tell anyone who asks that I was out of my scone when I decided to do this, he calls over his shoulder when he heads for the door. Where are you going? Bobo asks. To be a bloody hero. Back with our heroes at the time machine, Wave Rider is standing before the heroes, the flames of his head shifting in the room as he blocks the time machine. Wave Rider is a guardian of time, preventing any changes to the timeline. You are under arrest, Michael Carter. The machine will be confiscated. Oi! John calls, portaling into the chamber in a swirl of magical energy. Take a look, Sparkle Face! Can you see my future? He asks, crossing his arms. Wave Rider stares at the man, confusion crossing his features. No. John nods, crossing the room, telling the being, Watch my hand! This is called misdirection, he tells them, and he rears back, head-butting Wave Rider. The being falls, clutching his broken nose. Yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you, Time Lord? He smirks, turning to the group, his hands glowing with magic. Do what you do. I'll hold off shiny hair here, he tells them. But suddenly the walls explode inward and Barda emerges. She launches herself at John Constantine. Terrific knocks the woman off of Constantine, trying to throw her away, but Barda's hand lashes out, slashing Mr. Terrific across the stomach. Bloody hell, John whispers, with Beetle yelling for Booster to go now, to use the time machine. Booster struggles to move, but he falls. What's wrong? Get up! Ted yells at his friend. It is as it should be, Wave Rider tells them, and he explains that they have reached the end, that Kal-El has found Barry Allen in the destruction of Keystone City. Teddy, Booster groans, bringing his friend over. I think we just lost the future. I don't think I was ever born. He mumbles, and Booster begins to fade from existence as Ted yells for him to hold on. I'm sorry, I'll never get to know you. Booster whispers as he fades away. Ted stares in sadness at where his friend once was, but Barda is there knocking him away, slashing into him. It's time for me to go, Wave Rider says, staring at the mass of monsters. You get to just walk away? You're happy that this is the timeline you chose to protect? John asks him. A portal opens and Wave Rider begins to walk through and he turns back to the magician. No, I am far from happy. Goodbye, John Constantine. I don't know if we'll ever meet again. Oh, we'll meet again. I'll find you, John promises. And he suddenly snaps out his hand, grasping the Wave Rider, who is frozen. What have you done? Why can't I move? Because you're bound to me. I can see the future, John tells him as the undead close in on them. It's short. The monsters lash out and Wave Rider is cut down, blood spurting out of his body. John turns to the hordes as they close in around him, waiting for death. But suddenly, the creatures stop moving. A voice yells. He turns to see a portal opening up to reveal Dr. Fate and Zatanna. Dr. Fate reaches out his hand. John Constantine, it is not your time. Another fate awaits you. John lashes out, cracking fate across the helmet. And then he clutches his hurt hand in frustration. Brute force cannot hurt the hell, fate tells him. John holds out his hands, motioning to the death around him. I get a last second rescue, but the real heroes had to die, he asks. And Fate explains that Bobo told them where he had gone. I'm sorry that we didn't get here any sooner. Fate's eyes glow as he stares at the magician. The world is ending, John Constantine. We must prepare for what comes next. The Lords of Order and Chaos can eat a bag of bullocks, John interrupts him. The world isn't over until I say it is. Jimmy Olsen looks at the collection of photos that sit before him in the dark room. He never wanted to be a war photographer, but here we are. He looks down at the photos, pictures of heroes standing back to back, or simply living their normal lives. He doesn't know why he's documenting these things. He holds up one in his hands. Of the new Green Lantern, the former Black Canary pulling a Batman cowl, over Damian Wayne's head. It was two weeks ago that he stepped into Perry White's office, the chief complimenting him on the photos that he had taken. You got a picture of Superman breaking Darkseid's face. I can't believe you got so close to that fight, the chief was saying. This is outstanding work, Olsen. You couldn't be more. Suddenly, though, the chief trails off as a strange red light glows out of his computer screen. Jimmy asked the chief if everything was all right when suddenly Perry stood up, his fingers clawing at his face. Screams begin to echo throughout the Daily Planet as Jimmy steps back out into the main office. 
He stares in horror as everyone begins to scream, tearing at their own bodies and changing. He snaps a few photos before grabbing everyone that still seems normal and pulling them into the next room. Ron, Cat, the broadcast room, go, he yells. And he yells for them to close the door as he glances to the photos, realizing that everyone who was infected seems to have been on a computer or a phone. He turns to them, telling the others to stay off their phones. No phones, he yells, ripping cats from her hands. They watch from the windows as the city tears itself apart from below. And suddenly the door begins to slam as the creatures are fighting to get in. Jimmy runs back, yelling for the others to help him hold the door, greeted by the sight of Superman. It's good to see you, Jimmy. The man still tells his friend. You didn't use your signal watch, he notes, but Jimmy nods. No, I mean, it's not like I'm the only one who needed you, he tells him. Superman nods, asking his friend to keep everyone safe. He's needed elsewhere. The heroes began to fall, but Jimmy and the others remained safe. They watched from the window as Captain Adam explode, sure that it was the end, but they were saved, shielded by a bubble of green light on the rooftop they met the surviving heroes. It was hard for Jimmy to see a crack in Superman's determination. He became a shell of the man that Jimmy once knew. The Man of Steel hovered over the rooftop, telling Dinah to take the survivors to the Fortress of Solitude. Where are you going? Dinah asks. Where we're needed, Superman tells her simply. It was then that Jimmy knew that there should be a record of these events. He clicks on the light in the dark room, staring around at the photos with his one good eye. He'll never forget what happened. But he also knew that there should be a reminder. He wants everyone to remember the heroes that fought for the living, you know, after tomorrow. Because he knows that tomorrow could be his last day. He stares down at the photo that shows Black Adam, Hawkman, and Black Manta standing amongst the day, lightning flashing behind them. Tomorrow is the day the greatest heroes left on Earth try to halt the Anti-Life Army. Black Adam flies from his place in Kondok. The anti-life virus has already begun to spread, but it would be stopped in Kondok. Take Kondok offline, Black Adam orders. The Blighted Ones have already reached the palace, but the dictator flies through them, exploding the monsters before they can infect anyone else. He flies over his kingdom, possessing the wisdom of Zehudi. He knows what he must do. Below, his subjects try to fend off the infected, calling out to their ruler for help. He turns his gaze upon them, energy crackling from his eyes, and lightning springs forth from Black Adam, destroying everything in its path. For those seeking aid, they face only the storm. He moves through his kingdom, burning the infection from Kondok with the lightning of the gods. He does not hesitate. He does not worry about the innocents that might be within the swarms. Speed is more critical than mercy. It is done, he tells his aide as he returns to the palace. He passes him, taking steps up to his throne, sitting heavily upon it. I have saved Kondok. I am sorry, he whispers. The citizens look up into the sun, seeing the flying figure there. The blighted surround them, limbs reaching out to slash and tear. He's here, Andy, look, a father tells his son. Can he see us, Dad? The young boy asks. And with blinding speed, they are pulled from the grasp of the blighted and into the air. I saw you, Andy. You're going to be all right, Superman tells the boy, smiling down at him. The group returns to the survivors that the heroes have gathered. And Superman flies up to Dinah, the new Green Lantern. I can't protect them forever. What are we going to do? She asks him, but suddenly a voice fills their mind. I think I can help with that, Martian Manhunter tells them. The heroes gather and Jean tells them that he might have found a refuge, but he believes that the others will have a better chance of convincing the ruler. Later. Time passes, and lightning cracks from behind Black Adam as he floats over the border into his kingdom. That's far enough, he warns. He ignores Superman's greeting, demanding to know what they want in Kondok. We're hoping to find refuge for survivors, Wonder Woman tells him, and Black Adam lifts an eyebrow at her statement. And why would you think that there is safety within my borders? He questions. Superman floats forward, asking Adam to work with them. I don't know how your nation overcame this, but... He begins, but Black Adam interrupts him. Kondok survived because his ruler had the strength to do what you never could. Superman, you can tear through these monsters faster than the speed of sound. You can reduce the infected to ash with a glance. Will you? With all that great power, can you destroy the infected Superman? Superman stares him down. No, 
But if you open up your borders, we can help protect your borders and your people, along with Earth's refugees. Superman tries to explain. So much power, yet you are so weak. My people do not need compassion. They need to know that you will end the unliving to save them, that your morality will never come before their lives. Now leave my borders and do not return. Superman makes one last attempt, pleading with Black Adam to think like a man for once instead of a god. But the ruler turns his back. Goodbye, Superman. He returns to the palace, explaining what had happened to his advisor. He questions whether the people see that he is doing the right thing. Do they not see what I have done for them? He asks. And Voronis tells him that the people are hurting, but they will come to realize that his actions have saved them. Black Adam leaves the palace and Voronis comes close by. He tells the man that he is going for a walk. Shazam! Magic cracks from the sky as Black Adam shouts the word and is transformed back into a man. I want to see our nation and its people with different eyes, he tells Voronis. They move through the city streets, seeing the frightened people. Of course they're scared. You flew across the entire country, raining death from the skies. What did you expect? Black Adam turns to his trusted advisor. Do you believe that we should offer the world refuge? And Voronis nods. I believe that conduct can always be more, he tells his ruler. And Black Adam finally agrees, knowing that should the infection return, he will not be able to hold it off. They both stop as they see a woman crying at her doorstep, and they walk up to her, questioning whether she is all right. My son, he was hurt in our Lord's attack, she explains, and Black Adam is stunned. Black Adam did not attack, he tells her, and he steps past her, telling her, we will help if we can. The woman nods, unlocking the door to her son's room, and the child rushes forward, blood covering his face and crazed eyes glaring at them. His hand reaches out, and Black Adam steps back with shock. His mouth begins to utter the words as claws slash into his chest. Shut! He begins. Shut! The infected Black Adam finishes. Lightning courses through his body as he begins to tear at his own face. Wally pulled Linda close to him, hugging her tightly. Stay here. Stay safe. Don't look at any screens. Keep the door barred, he tells her. I'll be back as fast as I can. And with a crack of blue lightning, Wally is gone. The energy of the Speed Force crackles around him as he moves throughout Keystone City, watching as the city tears itself apart. He's never seen anything spread this quickly. The virus spreads through screens and the blood of the victims that lash out at each other. He knows that every second he stands still, it's another second that his city doesn't have. Wally makes the only choice that he can. He doesn't stand still. In a blur, he moves, destroying screens as he goes, snatching phones out of people's hands. He keeps moving, he keeps saving, blue lightning moving throughout the city. He begins to move as fast as he can and he can feel it. The speed force brushing against him and he reaches out. But a voice suddenly fills his ears. Wally, listen, I need you to hide. Batman tells him over his comms. But Wally refuses. If this virus takes you, Batman warns. You're not always right, Batman. You're just very confident, Wally tells him. There's a pause, and Batman informs him. Barry listened. Good for Barry. I'm going to save my city. Another pause. Don't get bit. Don't look at any screens, Batman warns. Wally thanks him for the advice and tells him to let Dick know to stay out of trouble. Back at the Batcave, Batman turns to see the corpse of Dick Grayson and Tim Drake laying behind him. Godspeed, Wally. Godspeed. Wally keeps running, but he knows that he can't be everywhere at once. But his eyes widen as he realizes that he can. not At the home of Max Mercury and Bart Allen, Max walks into the room questioning whether Bart can hear the screaming coming from next door. In a blur of blue lightning, Wally is there destroying the TV in a swipe. Wally, no, not the TV! Bart howls, but it takes less than a picosecond for Wally to catch them up on what's happening. Less if Bart hadn't kept interrupting with expert zombie advice. A quarter of a second later, Jesse Quick arrives as well. Keep stopping the spread in Keystone. I'm going to look for somewhere that we can move these people nearby. In Central City, a woman is about to be infected and in a blur, the blighted are gone. In New York, Roy Harper is trying to hold off a swarm of creatures, protecting those on the rooftop with him. But in a crack of lightning, the blighted are gone. And in Gotham, the creatures silently reach out for Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. But a gust of wind and they are safe once more. Did you hear someone? 
Ivy asks and Harley smiles at her words. Yeah, are you hearing the voices in your head too, Red? I hope the voices are nicer than mine. Wally returns to the others, telling them that everywhere on Earth seems to be infected. That we have to find another Earth, Max tells him. They run to the Flash Museum where they find the Tandem Quantum Treadmill, the only thing that will allow them to go fast enough to purposefully open up a portal into another universe. Max nods, telling Wally and Barry that they are the only ones fast enough to get on the treadmill. You're gonna go out there and battle zombies while I run in a straight line? Bart asks, worried about Max. This is the only way this is going to work, Bart, Max tells the young boy. Wally tells Max and Jesse to make sure that none of the survivors have any screens or they'll bring the infection to the new world. The two of them begin to run on the treadmill, opening up the portal. 12 minutes pass and 146,000 people have been brought through the portal. But Bart, he's struggling. He's clutching at his chest. And finally, the last of the people are brought through. You two get your butts. But as Max begins to state that, Bart collapses, falling, tumbling through the air backwards as his speed stops. He flies through the wall. Keep running. I'll get him. Keep the portal open. Max orders, turning and dashing away. He dashes outside, seeing the young boy surrounded by the blighted ones. Inside, Wally is running. It's too much for him though when he begins to slow down, his lungs burning, and he can feel his heart trying to beat out of his chest. He begins to trip, but Max is there, pulling them both through the portal. And on the other side, Wally congratulates Max, but the old speedster shakes his head. There's no time. The others see that he was cut by the undead. Sorry, kid. I'm not as fast as I used to be. Max tells him that he can feel the infection. He can feel it crawling through his body. He tells Wally to do what he has to do, and he leans down, hugging Bart. I love you. Be good, boy. He tells the young lad. Wally reaches out, putting his hand on Max's shoulder, and they run. They run through the light, through sound. They run into silence and calm. And Max turns back, looking at Wally as he enters the Speed Force. Thanks, Wally, he says with a smile. And then he's gone. A streak of blue. Outpacing pain. Outpacing death. Forever running. The Airy flew forward with Wink in their arms towards the towering fortress that was Jotunheim. They had been flying for three days, yet they couldn't stop. Far below them, the dead continued to spread. Wink knows that they need to rest, but Airy knows that they can't stop. And finally, they reached their destination. It was safe. It was heavily defended. The villains known as Manticore and Raza Kuta ordered their soldiers to open fire. The bullets, they fill the air, but Wink pops out of existence in a puff of smoke, taking Aerie with her. What? Manticore snarls. When suddenly the pair appear behind the soldiers with Manticore and Raza Kuta moving to defend their fortress. Wait, please! Wink shouts, holding up her hand, and Aerie sags in Wink's arms, exhausted from their flight. We've traveled for days. We only want shelter. We can help you, they explain. Anger fills Wink's eyes as she explains that if she wanted to, she could teleport them all away to smash on the rocks far below. But meanwhile, in other parts of the world, the heroes gather at the Fortress of Solitude. Wonder Woman returns with more survivors while Damien stares at the uniform that his father left him. John walks into the room, letting Damien know that Wonder Woman arrived with more survivors in her invisible jet. Is the jet still there? Damien asks. Uh, hard to tell. It's invisible, John responds. He looks down at the case in Damien's hands, asking if he's going to change out of his Robin costume, and the young boy looks down, telling his friend that he doesn't think that he's ready. I get it, really. This symbol doesn't exactly come free of burden, you know? John tells him. At Jotunheim, Manticore pulls back the curtain where Wink and Eri are resting. You said you would help. It is time to do so, Manticore tells them. Wink tries to argue, telling them that Eri has flown for three days straight, but the winged being pulls themselves to their feet, telling Wink that it is okay. Two of our members, Nightshade and Hive, were sent to scout to the west. They have not returned, Manticore tells them. Eri nods, telling him that they will search for them, and the two quickly leave the fortress. There's a knock at the door, and Superman enters the room, bringing a pot of tea for Alfred. And the butler is shocked. Thank you. I'm not used to people waiting on me, Master Kent. Alfred tells the Man of Steel. But Superman waves him off, telling him that there are no masters in the Fortress of Solitude. He asks if he can have a word with Damien alone, and Alfred agrees. So Superman sits down before the young Robin, looking at the case, telling Damien that Bruce believed that he deserved this. And your father was almost always right. 
Almost irritatingly so, Damien, Superman tells him. Bruce was not always right, Damien huffs. Of course not. When you're young, your father's rarely ever right, but when we get older, we realize that they were just protecting us. Damien turns his back. I liked your dad. He was old school. Jonathan Kent was as genuine as he seemed, wasn't he? Are you all right? Damien asks the Man of Steel. Superman pauses, smiling at the young man, telling him he was a good person. I'm guessing it's not the actual symbol of the bat that scares you, is it, Damien? Superman asks, and Damien nods his head, admitting that he feels that if he puts on the uniform, his father, Bruce Wayne, will really be gone. Superman puts his hand on the young boy's shoulder. Bruce became a hero because he lost the people that he loved. He fought every day so that that wouldn't happen to the others. The world needs that now more than ever. I believe this world needs you, Batman. Alfred finishes putting on the new bat suit. The cow doesn't feel right, Damien tells him. It will. Alfred responds without a thought. Do I look stupid? And Alfred tells him, no. And he steps back admiring his young charge. You look like your father. He smiles. The world has its Batman again. But meanwhile, over in the mountains, Aerie flies back, grabbing Wink and flying as fast as they can back towards Jotunheim. We have to go. We have to warn Jotunheim. Aerie screams. An hour after Black Adam was infected, all of Kondok was also infected, and now death is spreading, and an army is coming. The Fortress of Solitude. John Kent lands in front of Cassie, telling her that he and his father were severing internet cables off the coast of Ireland. The internet is down, permanently. I'm gonna miss it, not the bit that turns people into agents of death, obviously, though. He tells her. Cassie rubs her forehead, a look of exasperation on her face. Look, I'm not quite sure how to tell you this, John, but I'm pretty sure that Damien just stole the invisible jet. Moments later, the two heroes pull up alongside Damien Wayne. You know what the problem with stealing an invisible jet is, Damien? John asks, looking at Damien, who seems to just be flying through the air while sitting. It's your visibility. Take it down, Cassie orders the young Batman. And Damien lands, stepping down the invisible stairs to stand beside his friends. Want to explain why your first act as Batman is Grand Theft Arrow? John asks. And Damien looks at them both, explaining that his mother is in Gotham. If I go back to the fortress, do you honestly think you can stop me from leaving? Damien asks John. I have x-ray vision and super hearing, John explains. Good for you. Do you honestly think you can stop me from leaving? They finally agree, but admit that they're going to go with him. They're going to find Talia al Ghul. Do you honestly think that you can stop me? Cassie asks Damien when he begins to argue that his friends shouldn't be coming. So later, as they enter Gotham airspace, Damien tells the others that his father was keeping tabs on his mother, but he's interrupted as Cassie shouts that they have incoming. A zombified kite man rushes towards Damien, bent on his death, and with a splat, the villain smashes against the invisible jet's windshield like a giant bug. Undead kite man? Damien questions. Blood begins to smear as Kite Man slides down the windshield before plummeting to the streets below. Despite themselves, the young heroes begin to laugh. We have to remember to wash the Kite Man bits off the plane before we give it back to Wonder Woman. Cassie reminds them as they finally land. John finally asks why Damien and his father were keeping tabs on his mother, and Damien explains that she had arrived in the city with assassins to kill the mayor. I've missed something, haven't I? Cassie explains. My mother is Talia al Ghul, daughter of Raz, the demon's head, Leader of the League of Assassins, Damien quickly explains. It's kind of a sore subject. Don't really make a big deal out of it, John whispers to Cassie. Damien motions down to the Gotham City Bank below them, explaining that it is his mother's safe house. How is the Gotham Bank a League of Assassins safe house? Cassie asks as they leap off the building. Because my grandfather owns it, Damien tells her. At the entrance to the bank, they look in to see hundreds of blighted ones inside. Damien explains that his mother will be locked inside of the panic room underneath the vault. Before his friends can react, Damien leaps into action throwing smoke grenades and batarangs at the monsters. He's kind of infuriatingly living up to that costume, isn't he? Cassie notices. John agrees with a smile and the two leap to help their friend. They quickly find their way through the monsters, finding themselves inside of the vault, which John can't seemingly look through. Wouldn't really be a safe house for assassins if Superman could just peek in, John. Cassie doesn't give them much more time to discuss, as she tears open the wall quickly, revealing Talia standing within, and around her, bodies of the monsters are laying on the ground, dead. Uh, Miss Al Ghul, we're here to rescue you, John tells her. Talia smiles, pulling her sword from the back of one of the monsters. From a pile of monsters I just murdered. 
Uh, yeah? Talia questions why Damien is with John, leaning into the young Superboy as he explains that Damien is his best friend. He's so innocent. We all can't be raised by assassins, mother. No, I suppose not. It's a shame, she tells him, before spinning around motioning to his bat suit with the sword. And why are you wearing that? She asks. You know why, Damien tells her looking at the floor. Shock fills her face and she refuses to believe it. I'm going to go see him. You can come if you'd like. Damien offers his mother. And with that, the group is standing in the bat cave, looking over the graves of Bruce, Dick, and Tim. Who buried them? Cassie asks. Jason Todd. I recognize the sentiment. Dick Grayson, brother, Nightwing, the one who got to grow up. Bruce Wayne, father, mentor, bastard, Batman. Tim Drake, friend, Robin, the best of us. The moment is interrupted though as John scans the room with his x-ray vision, warning of an intruder behind the dinosaur. And that's when Stephanie Brown walks out. Hi. Spoiler tells them that she was hoping to find Batman. She comes forward looking down at Damien in his Batman suit. Damien, I'm so sorry. She tells him, pulling him into a hug. And for a brief moment, Damien is taken aback, his face showing the urge to fight against the feelings that are welling up inside of him. It's okay. You're wearing the mask and I've got you. You can say goodbye. Stephanie whispers in his ear. And with that, tears begin to roll down his cheeks as he lets the sadness overwhelm him. Your father made you soft, Talia huffs. And anger fills John and Cassie as they leap to their friend's defense. But Damien yells for them to stop, telling them that Talia loved his father and that she merely wishes to start a fight. There's nothing left here. Let's go back to the fortress, Damien tells them. But Steph tells him to wait a minute as she goes back into the shadows, returning to reveal her new costume. If you're Batman, you're going to need a Robin, she tells him with a smile. In the Jotunheim Fortress, Eri and Wink step forward, warning the others of the undead army that is bearing down on the mountain fortress. They're looking to be millions marching here with Black Adam at their head. We have to assume that your friends, Hive and Nightshade, are with them, and their powers now belong to the anti-life equation, Eri tells them. If we sit here, we're going to die. If we leave, we die, Raza nods in agreement. Either way, there's a lot of dying going on, Wink tells them both. And Manticore steps forward, telling the two newcomers to leave, to escape while they have a chance. We're not really built that way, Manticore, but thanks. You're the most caring lion scorpion man I've ever met, Wink tells him. She turns back to the group, telling them that the only way that they will survive this is if they have heroes. And Eri argues that they don't know where to find the heroes. They've all vanished ever since the anti-life equation created these rage-like zombies that are trying to take the life out of the world. The mascara, you know, is in the Aegean Sea, Wink suggests. There are islands in the Aegean Sea, Eri argues, and Wink smiles at them. Ask for directions when you get there, she suggests. For a moment, Eri is silent. Before they can ask why Wink isn't going, the young woman steps forward, telling Eri that she wouldn't be able to survive the speed and height that they would have to climb in order to get there in time. Eri begins to argue, but Wink puts her hand on their shoulder. Every second it takes for you to realize that I'm right, is a second lost, she tells them. Eri finally nods. Take me outside, they whisper. Outside in the cool night air, they pull each other close. Eri whispers to Wink, promising that they will return. I won't let you face this alone, they tell her, as they kiss. Wink teleports away and Eri takes flight. Now Eri's top speed has never been clocked. It was over Lebanon that they broke the sound barrier. And by the time they reached the Mediterranean, they were traveling at supersonic speeds. But it wouldn't be fast enough. Because back at the fortress, Raza and Manticore are ordering the defenses. They push those who can't fight higher into the fortress, while those who are capable of shouldering a weapon stand ready. Wink steps forward, telling Raza that she has a plan, as he explains that even this fortress can't hold back an infected Black Adam. I also have a plan, he tells her, creating his glowing blade. This sword can cut through anything, and I'm gonna chop him in half, he growls. Wink nods, but knows that his plan could end in a zombie Raza. She needs him to draw Black Adam in. And Manticore yells that the army has arrived. Black Adam flies out in front. All oh, fire! Raza orders, and the defenders open up. With the bullets doing nothing, Black Adam rushes forward, bellowing in rage. Gotcha. Wink smiles as she teleports onto the zombie's back. They both suddenly teleport away again, mere seconds before Black Adam can reach the fortress walls. Huh? It works, she gasps. Moments later, as she reappears in the fortress and Raza turns to her surprised. 
Where did you bring him? He asks, and she smiles. I teleported to the other side of the mountain. I let him go about halfway through. Can he survive being inside of the mountain? Manticore explains. I have no idea, she answers. And suddenly the entire mountain around the fortress begins to rumble, causing everyone to stumble. Okay, I have some idea now. Over in the Aegean Sea, Ari finishes getting directions from a flock of seagulls. Thankfully, that somewhat useless power of talking to birds has finally become useful, and they fly towards the secret island, only to be interrupted as Wonder Woman appears before her. Can I help you? The Amazon asks politely. Ari nods. I hope so. You and everyone that you can reach, they say. Outside Jotunheim, the millions of Blighted Ones continue to march forward, and among their ranks are Hive and Nightshade, who has the ability to open up a portal into the Shadow Realm. And in mere seconds, all of the infected are inside, with death coming to the mountain fortress. Manticore begins to bellow, madness taking over him as he tears at his own flesh. The tremors from the deep within the mountain grow more violent, with a rending tear, and the mountain is split in half. The fortress begins to topple, thousands of people screaming in fear, and there's a blur as a woman is there catching the 36,000 ton building. The concrete fortress cracks and dents as she pushes against it, saving those within. And for a moment, Wonder Woman holds their lives within her hands. With a crack of lightning, Black Adam tears free of that mountain, madness in his eyes, highlighted by the magical energy that crackles around him as he floats before Wonder Woman. The moment, it didn't last long. The fortress of Jotunheim cracks as the full weight pushes against Wonder Woman. She grits her teeth, knowing that the lives inside depend upon her. Glancing to her right, she sees a blighted Black Adam flying right towards her, blood dripping from his mouth as his madness failed eyes stare at her. Yet Wonder Woman wasn't about to let it go. Luckily, she did not come alone. Before she left Themyscira, she called her friends. Suddenly, Black Adam is struck by several laser beams, throwing him to the ground. Wonder Woman turns to see the others. You okay, Wonder Woman? Cyborg asks, flanked by Superman, Green Canary, and Martian Manhunter. I'm holding the fortress, Vic. I could use a little help. She groans, so Green Canary flies up using her ring to encase the mountain fortress in a green bubble. I'll take it, Diana. Let's get these people out of here and keep Black Adam off of me, she tells her friends. Superman uses his x-ray vision to warn the others of the blighted inside. The others are almost here. I'll let them know and we'll handle those inside. We must stop Black Adam. Manhunter tells the Kryptonian. The three superheroes turn their attention onto the infected Black Adam, hitting him hard with heat vision and laser blasts. Inside, Raza continues to fight, trying to protect the rest of the people inside of the fortress. He swings his sword, yelling for Wink to shut the first floor door. Not until you're back on the other side, she yells back. But he jumps down the stairs, slamming the door closed, and then turns back, his flaming sword in his hand. I'm ready. I'll take as many of you with me as I. But he's interrupted as Wink appears behind him, teleporting them both to the other side of the sealed door. Sorry, Raza. Noble sacrifices are severely overrated if there's another option, Wink tells him. But it's only a matter of seconds before the powered blight begin to cut through the metal door. Raza and Wink stand with the other soldiers. As soon as that door comes down, fire everything, Raza tells his men. And they prepare to fire, but suddenly the doors explode inward, revealing Hawkman, Hawk Girl, and Wonder Woman. The heroes tell the others to stand back, but Hawkman smiles to Kendra. You ready to take a horde of undead, Kendra? When have I not been? She smiles, taking his hand. The three heroes launch into the fight, driving the undead back into the portal of darkness. Hawkman turns away as the portal begins to close, but at the last second, he's ripped through by Manticore. Carter! Kendra screams, but now Hawkman is surrounded by nothing but darkness. Kendra, I can't see you! You sound so far away! He yells, a growling whisper behind him. So he steadies his hand, gripping the mace tighter. As Green Canary begins to carry the fortress over the ocean, the others continue to fend off Black Adam's assault when suddenly the undead king stops. What's wrong? Cyborg asks as the others continue to watch the creature. It's waiting. It's too far from the rest of the blighted ones. The anti-life equation knows that it's outnumbered. The horde can't get across the sea, but it will keep spreading. We have to get these people to safety. Then we'll plan how to stop the anti-life equation army. Superman tells them. Cyborg's radar begins to ping and he warns the others that something is coming in fast. Superman looks up, telling him that it's a friendly, as Aerie arrives with a whoosh of their wings. 
Wink? They asked. She's okay, and she's inside, Superman tells them. Thanking them for raising the alarm, Ari arrives in the fortress, finding Wink and telling her that they went as fast as they could. You flew just fast enough. It's okay. But not everyone is, Wink says, looking back as Wonder Woman tries to comfort a crying hawk girl. As the fortress flies away, the blighted army begins to regroup. Hawkman flies up, nothing left of the former hero as he growls. Nightshade steps forward, opening a portal, allowing the blighted ones to march through the land of night and across the sea. There once was a girl who lost a horse. It fell, and when it fell, it broke. But the girl, the girl was with others. She was running towards a bus. A bus that would lead her to salvation, but instead, she turned back to get her horse. And she was left behind. But she wasn't alone. They were there. Fortunately, not everyone left her behind. Someone was there. A dog. A formidable dog. That dog's name was Ace the Bat Dog. Ace protected that girl. He dragged her out of there, and he brought her to a building. Which is where I found them. Bobo walked into the room, and Ace begins to growl. Bobo holds up his arms. It's okay. I'm not gonna hurt her. Ace pauses for a moment and asks, No. And Bobo tells him, No. The girl asks, Are you talking to the dog? Bobo turns to the girl. Yes. My name is Bobo. Detective Chip. Ace says that your name is Amy. Amy looks at Bobo and says, You're a monkey. Bobo corrects her. Actually, I am a chimpanzee and a detective. I take it you're going to the garden. Amy tells him yes, and Bobo tells her, Good, I am as well. Why don't we go together? I saw someone out there that might be able to help us. I just need to go out there and talk to them. Bobo looks down at Ace and asks, Will he be able to hear me down here? And Ace tells him, we'll hear. Bobo nods. Okay, Amy. When Ace moves, move with him. A few moments later, down outside, Bobo asks, hello. And the horse sitting by the stable says, hello. Bobo comes in closer and sees the horse is sitting by a body. He thinks to himself, this is a horse who lost a girl. She fell. And when she fell, she was broken. Bobo calls out to Ace, go ahead and bring Amy. As Ace and Amy come down, Bobo heads into the stable, grabbing a piece of cloth. I'm sorry, was she a good human? And while Bobo drapes the cloth over the young girl, the horse says that she was. Once Ace arrives with Amy, Bobo tells them, It's okay, the horse's name is Comet, and she really wants to meet you. Amy pets Comet, stating, Hello, and Bobo tells her, She likes you. But at that moment, Ace smells in the air. Bobo asks, What is it? And Ace tells him, Death moving. Bobo pushes Amy onto Comet's back, stating, We gotta hurry! We gotta get out of here! Now! And with that, they're off. But in their haste, they were struck. First Comet on her side, and Bobo on his arm. As Comet pulls ahead of the swarm of undead, Amy looks back at Bobo's arm, asking, Why aren't you turning like the rest of them? And Bobo laughs. <laughs> Cause that equation was ruined up by gods, and gods are notoriously arrogant. They don't think that animals are sentient, which is pretty stupid. Because if you really wanted an unstoppable living death virus, the obvious thing you would do is stick it in mosquitoes. But for the world's greatest detective, I should have been more observant. I should have seen the attack coming before it was too late. There was a girl and a horse, and they fell. And then they were out of time. The detective thought that they all were. As Bobo lay on the ground, he hears Ace barking and he asks, what is it? And Bobo focuses his eyes asking, flying? What happens next proves that even the greatest detective in the world doesn't know everything. And with a loud coom, the super dog Crypto lands, showing his teeth to his foes. He uses his heat vision to rip through the horde, and within seconds, it was over. Crypto asks, you live? Bobo says, yes, I live. Thank you. Crypto looks at Ace, still guarding? And Ace responds, Still guarding. Crypto tells him, good dog. Crypto flies up, clearing a path forward, and Bobo then thinks of what had happened. There was a girl who lost a horse. A horse who lost a girl. And they fell together. But they weren't broken. They held on to each other. Together. I hope you guys enjoyed that heartwarming tale of the Super Pets, but now it's time to go into the Nantucket chapter in Deceased, A Hope at World's End. 
Inside the Fortress of Solitude, Superman stands with Lois Lane and fills her in on what happened at the Nation of Kondok. Why didn't Black Adam let us help? Superman wonders, and Lois nods, telling her husband that some people see accepting help as a sign of weakness. She takes his hand, explaining that she knows the opposite is true. Asking for help takes strength. You're Superman, and you've never been afraid to ask for help, she tells him. They hold each other, kissing. Suddenly, the door opens up, and in walks Jimmy Olsen. The young photographer is shocked by what he sees. Holy crap, Lois, Superman, what would Mr. Kent say? Jimmy shouts. Both Lois and Superman are stunned, but Jimmy just flashes a huge smile. I'm just messing with you. I've always known who you are, Jimmy tells them. Clark is shocked, but Jimmy just explains that he's taken so many photos of Superman over the years. Plus, he shared an office with Clark. He finally leads them out of the room, explaining that Cyborg wants to show the group something. In the main chamber of the fortress, Cyborg and Lex explain that they have used Lex Corps satellites to identify large pockets of the anti-living. They believe that the creatures are drawn to the living. Barry and Wally nod, agreeing that each cluster of monsters could be a group of survivors that they should launch rescue missions for. Both Wonder Woman and Black Canary agree, telling the group that the Gotham Garden and Themyscira are willing to take survivors. We'll start moving people today. Now, we will need to be careful. Strike teams will be assembled. Superman begins, but he's interrupted by Talia Al Ghul. She's shocked to hear that the heroes are discussing putting the surviving members of the human race into two places. She looks to Luther, confirming that they know where all of the undead are. You have these ridiculous powers. Don't tiptoe around them. Attack! She shouts. Lex turns to the rest of the group, agreeing with the deadly woman. She gets in Superman's face, telling him that he should fly out there and disintegrate them all from the sky. But Lois steps forward, ordering the woman to back up. John smiles. <laughs> Our moms are fighting. It was always going to happen. Damien sighs. Thank you for bringing me here. Stephanie smiles, hugging them both from behind. Talia continues to try and convince the group, and a few of them seem to be leaning towards her idea. But Superman steps forward, telling them, I refuse to give up on the people of Earth. Not when there is a single sliver of hope for them. My God, you're just as bad as Batman! Talia snaps. Thank you. Superman tells her with a smile. Cyborg interrupts the fighting, telling them that they need to head to Central City first. Every blighted one has been drawn out to a single building. Now, inside of that building, David Singh blocks the doors as the blighted ones are trying to get in. He turns back to the Pied Piper, asking him if he can stop the monsters. But the Piper explains that he can't control the monsters, only attract them. David nods, pulling out his guns, telling the Piper that he has two bullets for them. Suddenly, the dead begin to bang harder against the door. The two men prepare themselves for the end, and suddenly they hear a voice in their minds. A hand reaches through the wall, and Singh fires his last rounds into the wood. It'll be all right, you're safe now, Martian Manhunter tells them as he phases through the wall. He picks them up, flying through the air, bringing them to the waiting Wonder Woman and Superman. Why are they all here? Why this building? The heroes question. Pied Piper holds up his flute. It's because of me, and because of this, he tells them. Meanwhile, on the island of Nantucket, Jimmy Olsen snaps pictures of the survivors that have been brought in. You would think that the end of the world would bring people together, but not everyone. A woman begins to yell at a man for staring at his phone, and he shouts back at her, yelling that there's no internet anymore. The woman keeps shouting, and the man suddenly pulls out a gun. The shot echoes through the air as Batman grips the man's arm, forcing the gun to be pointed into the sky. We're fighting the undead. We don't have time to fight ignorance too. He hisses at the man. And the man glares at him, shoving the phone in his face. You scared of this kid? He snaps. Suddenly the man is hit hard from the side and he looks up from the ground to see Robin, Stephanie Brown, standing over him. Damien stomps on the phone as his mother charges over with her sword. Did that man seriously just try to show you a phone? One that will infect you with the virus? Move, I'm going to behead him! She snarls, but Batman and Robin tell her to calm down. It's hard to claim the moral high ground if you're going to murder people. Stephanie reminds her. The heroes continue to gather the survivors, and using Nantucket Island as a processing center, they then move them to Themyscira or the Gotham City Garden. Beneath the ocean, Black Manta is suddenly attacked within his own submarine. The Blighted Ones tear through the hull and he opens fire. The explosion leaves him floating in the water, but he's quickly scooped up by John, who carries him to the island. Is he still evil? Wonder Woman questions. Let's find out, John tells her. Cassie leans down, trying to wake up the supervillain, and he comes back to consciousness quickly, firing his eye lasers at her. Cassie! Damien shouts, but the smoke clears to reveal that she's okay. Ow! She whispers. Okay, I am at least beheading this one, Talia shouts as she charges forward, but John steps in the way, blocking the attack again. Talia glares at the young boy, telling him that Black Manta will never join their side. 
There are only two sides now, the living and the dead, Damien reminds her. The villain stands, telling the others that he is leaving as he heads for the water, but John rushes after him. You don't have to face what's out there alone. Stay, we could use you, the young boy tells him, but suddenly they are interrupted. There's a bright flash of light in the distance as a portal opens up on the far side of the island, and an army of anti-life swarm in from the land of the Nightshades, led by Black Adam and Hawkman. Black Adam opens fire as John leaps into the air. Protect the refugees, he orders, and the heroes launch into an attack with Adam Smasher grabbing a massive ship, swinging it at the monsters. His size made him formidable, but also the very obvious target. Adam Smasher suddenly pauses in his attack as a blighted Black Adam flies right through him. Oh no, the hero whispers in the brief moments that he has left, and he suddenly falls to his knees, beginning to scream in madness as the anti-life equation takes him over. There were 20,000 people on Nantucket Island when the anti-living attacked. They run through the streets now, fear in their eyes, as a wave of monsters moves through the streets and the buildings. Adam Smasher, now taken by the undead, stomps through the area, leading the charge. The only thing standing between the people and the wave of death is Superboy, Batman, Robin, Wonder Girl, Blue Beetle, Black Manta, and Talia al Ghul. Ignore Adam Smasher! Batman tells his friend as he looks up at the giant. That's not that easy. He's a giant, John reminds him. Black Adam is the biggest threat. We have to keep him off of us, Damien says, as Cassie nods, preparing herself for the fight. Blue Beetle, Superboy, with me, she orders. Jaime, can Black Adam crack your armor, she asks. And the young hero doesn't think so, so he steps up to hit the charging villain with an attack. But I want to apologize in advance if I get turned and try to kill you, he tells her. Oh yeah, same, she agrees. And as the refugees run past them, Talia turns to Black Manta and she tells the villain that he has one job. Keep Adam Smasher back. Black Manta turns his beams upwards, shooting the giant in the chest. The rest of the heroes continue to fight the undead as the refugees rush towards the boats. Talia orders for her son to join them, but he refuses. I'm protecting the people, covering their escape. He shouts at her as he continues to leap and flip amongst the monsters, attacking them where he can. Damien, move! Stephanie shouts as she leaps and tries to pull both Batman and Talia out of the way of Adam Smasher's massive fist, but they're not going to make it. Suddenly, that fist is stopped in place as Cassie and John slam into it. Did you just save us from a giant? Talia asks as they pick themselves back up. Yeah, I'm a little futile, I know. Stephanie admits, but Talia tells her that it's the thought that counts, and she must reassess what she thought of this girl. Thanks, wait, what did you think of me? Stephanie asks. Cassie and John continue to lift Adam Smasher away from the island, but the giant brings his hands together, trying to crush the young Superboy and Wonder Girl. Keep flying, John shouts as the two continue to take him away. They push his hands apart, allowing the former hero to plummet into the ocean below and create a massive wave. That wave then rushes over the island, sweeping both the anti-living and the survivors away. Jimmy Olsen looks up, seeing that Black Adam is using that moment of chaos to end the fight. The anti-living villain calls upon his power, sending a bolt of lightning into the water on the island. Thousands of people, knee deep in water, lightning striking, but at that moment a boy catches that lightning. John flies into the path of the bolt, taking it hard to the chest. The bolt leaps off of him, catching Jimmy in the eye, taking out half his vision. Cassie rushes to her friend's side, asking him if he's okay. John gasps for air. It didn't tickle. But John shrugs it off, rushing to Jimmy's side. Look out, the young photographer whispers, and Black Adam comes in fast, his fist slamming into John, holding him under the water. Cassie and Damien leap onto the monsters, trying to stop his barrage of blows, and with a roar of power, the monster throws them off. John struggles up, using his last breath to call for his father. Dad! He screams out, and half a world away, Superman hears his son. He appears far faster than a speeding bullet, far more powerful than a locomotive, and he knocks Black Adam away in a single blow, his eyes blazing in fury. Moments later, John and Clark are using their super breath to scatter the anti-living. Superman using his telepathic link with Martian Manhunter to warn him of the attack on Nantucket and ask the other heroes for aid. And in a few mere moments, John contacts Dinah, Barry, Wallace, and Wonder Woman. We're needed, he tells them, and the League arrives in the battle. 
You said that we were doomed, Stephanie tells Damien as they continue to fight. I never said we were doomed, Damien tells her. Maybe not with your words, but with your body language. You were doing your bat slump, she tells him. I don't bat slump, he huffs, punching another monster in the face. And as the others arrive, the young heroes fill them in on the plan to get everyone to the boats. The flashes move fast, bringing everyone quickly to safety. Superman flies Jimmy to the boats, telling Jean that he hit Black Adam hard. It should take him a while to get back up, but we need to get everyone to the ships and out of here, Superman warns. The heroes move quickly to get everyone aboard, and Stephanie sees Black Manta hanging by himself, questioning whether he still wants to face the apocalypse alone. She notices the wound in his side too late. She turns. She tries to warn her friends. As the anti-living Black Manta turns, firing his eye beams at her, the blast takes her in the side, flying across the harbor, hitting the ship. Everything is on fire as John and Superman try to pull the survivors from the blaze. John stayed behind, opening his mind to find the rest of the survivors, but something else came. Black Adam steps out of that blaze, snarling at the Martian. They all felt it as the creature's claws cut through Jean and he tumbled to the ocean. They all felt his fear, his pain. They felt it as he phased into the seabed. He moved through the earth and his last thoughts were to protect his friends from what he would become. And then Martian Manhunter was gone. Superman and Wonder Woman attack, beating Black Adam back and the survivors finish boarding. And then they're lifted into the air on a green light. Still on the island though, Damien cradles the body of Stephanie Brown. Cassie and his mother stand near him, warning him that they need to leave. I can take her for you, Cassie tells him softly. And they return to Gotham City Garden, where Damien stands over the body of his Robin. Cassie comes up behind him, putting a hand on his shoulder. She didn't know the young woman as well as he did. Do you want to tell me about her? She asks. Damien, he pauses for a brief moment. She drove me crazy. She always tried to find the fun in the most inappropriate situations. She refused to take me seriously. She mocked me. He shouts, but Cassie stares at him. Of course she did. That's what big sisters are supposed to do. She tells him. Talia comes over, leaning down over the body. She looks at her son, telling him that there is a Lazarus pit nearby. Can you bring her back? Cassie asks. Perhaps, but there's no guarantee she'll be the same. Talia tells her. She looks down at her son's friend and tells him that she would like to do this for him. I can come with you, Damien tells her, and Talia shakes her head. I can move more freely by myself, and Batman is needed here. The anti-life army will be here soon, she tells him. And she lifts Stephanie into her arms, walking away. Now at their last line of defense, Cyborg and Luther have come up with a plan. They currently have 3 million people sheltered here, and the virus has weakened them to the point that Black Adam will strike at the heart. So far, they have hit and run, but that is no longer an option. The answer of what they must do is simple. Tomorrow, they must work together and destroy Black Adam. And when the army gets to the garden walls, Green Canary drops a shield, and they drop a whole lot of bombs on their side. Superman tells them, no, they're not blowing up a million people. They don't know yet if they can't be saved. Luther scoffs, stating that there's a good chance that everyone will die. How can someone so powerful be so weak? I am not staying here for the inevitable. As Luther begins to leave, Jimmy chases after him, telling him that Superman is his best friend, and it must drive him crazy that Superman is more human than any of them. Luther rubs his eyes. Is there a point to all of this? Jimmy tells him, you're supposed to be the smartest man in the world. Prove it. Think of a way to win tomorrow. A way where we don't destroy a million people. And Luther takes what Jimmy said to heart. And begins to think of a plan, one, that he'll need the help of a few heroes. First, he stops Kid Flash, asking him for time. Six minutes. That's how long Luther was connected to the Speed Force. To him, it was days. And at the end of it, he came up with a plan. One that he was not freely going to share. He ran the scenario over and over. He knows what will happen tomorrow. It will be a bloodbath. And Superman's compassion will be their undoing. He knows how the anti-life army is going to access the garden. There's going to be a moment, a single moment, and that is when they will need the Pied Piper. He goes to everyone else that is a part of his puzzle until he goes to the last piece. And it is in this moment that he suggests that everyone spend what time they have left with their loved ones. Later, with the help of Wonder Woman, she stands with a lasso around one of the infected, asking Luther, how did he know? And Luther says he didn't. He suspected this is how they're going to win. If this works afterwards, she will still have to do what Superman can't. She will have to end Black Adam. Wonder Woman then asks how many people are going to die in his plan. And Luther says, 
two. Two sacrifices to save the entire human race. Wonder Woman asks, who are they? And Luther tells her, no, you still might do something stupid. I can't risk that. While Wink and Pied Piper spend their last night with Aerie and David, elsewhere Superman walks with Jimmy, and Jimmy asks if he think it worked. Superman smiles. Absolutely. Sounds like you played Luther perfectly. With the next day rapidly approaching, and with it Black Adam and his army of undead, Poison Ivy's garden has done well to keep the virus out of it but it hasn't been able to stop Black Adam. He begins to breach inside, which is what the heroes expected. It was a part of Luther's plan. Superman and Wonder Woman grab Black Adam, slamming him into the ground, holding him in place, but it wasn't long before he broke free. John and Wonder Girl watched, given very strict instructions not to join until Black Adam was pinned, which they both completely ignored as soon as their heroes looked like they were in trouble. But while the four of them, with the help of Green Canary, keep Black Adam busy, the others are getting ready for the next part of Luther's plan. Nightshade opens up the portal to her land so that she can cross into the garden. Just when he lines up his shot, Green Arrow says that he can take her. Luther shoots the bow from his hand. No. But before Green Arrow asks why, Luther then tells Piper that it's time. David asks what's going on, and Piper tells David, I'm sorry, but this is goodbye. And Wink tells Aerie that she loved them. In a flash, Wink disappears with Pied Piper, both David and Aerie asking what the hell is he planning? Damien tells Luther to answer them. What has he done? And Luther says, I've probably saved you all. You're welcome. Inside the land of nightshades, Piper plays his music, drawing the attention of the undead. As the infected get closer, Wink would teleport them back further and further, all while Piper continued to play his music. Wink radios over, asking how are they looking, and Luther says that about a tenth of the army has crossed over, following them into the nightshade land. As Luther watches from above, though, Aerie flies up, asking where are they? Did he send them into the land of the nightshades? Ignoring them? Wink asks to give her an update, and Luther tells her, Keep Hartley playing. Keep attracting Nightshade to you. You don't die until I tell you to. After a bit longer, Luther radios back stating that the last of the anti-living are entering the portal. It is time. Wink says okay, but they have an issue. The problem with the million undead swarming towards you is that it's not so easy to find and kill a single one. But when Eri flies in calling out to Wink, she asks, what are they doing here? This is a one-way trip. If they kill Nightshade, that door closes. Eri says that she left them, and they aren't interested in a future that she isn't a part of. If she isn't coming back, they aren't coming back with her. So they can argue or save the world. Wink says fine, but the plan is to find and shoot Nightshade, but they have no idea where she is. Aerie flies up stating that they guess it's lucky that they didn't abandon her, huh? Back outside of the land of the Nightshade, the other part of Luther's plan was continuing as expected. Wonder Woman wrapped her lasso around Black Adam and told him to say it. Say Shazam! He struggles, and Wonder Woman tightens the hold. Say it! With what little air he had left, Black Adam says, Shazam! The lightning bolt strikes, and Black Adam is reverted. But before the lasso is taken off, he says, you will cease to exist. You will fall. Wonder Woman tells him that some of them may fall, but not all, and not today. The plan was going properly until Superman changed it. With a combination of X-ray vision, microscopic vision, and heat vision, Superman performed microsurgery to sever Black Adam's vocal cords. Meanwhile, inside the land of the nightshades, Aerie spots Nightshade grabbing her, flying her to the front, yelling for Wink to do it. Wink begins to pull the trigger, saying goodbye to any chance they had of getting out. But before she does, a laser shoots through Aerie's wing and Wink's gun. Everyone turns back to see Black Manta standing there, his vision glowing, getting ready for another attack. And Aerie yells that they need to get ahead of them, but Pied Piper says no. We stay. And he stops playing the music. Wink asks what is he doing, but Piper says... I'm done playing, and he stabs Nightshade in the head with his flute. Outside, the gateway begins to close, and Luther says that they did it. The anti-life army is trapped in the land of the Nightshades. David asks, where is Hartley? What did you do, Luther? And Luther tells him, I did nothing. If anything, Hartley chose this. You should be proud of. But at that moment, Wink appears with Airy and Piper, and everyone turns to stare. She laughs. I can't believe he said I'm done playing. And Piper says, okay. Maybe I practiced that line for a few years. Wink then holds out the bloody flute, stating that she managed to grab this for him if he wanted it. And Piper tells her, nah, I'll make another. 
David yells that they came back, and Wink says, yeah, noble sacrifices are severely overrated if there's another option. And with that, Superman grabs all of the survivors, telling them that he wanted to speak to them. He knows that they're scared. He knows that they've lost much. The world has changed, but they are still here. He doesn't know what comes tomorrow, but he knows this truth. If they are together, they can overcome anything. He believes in them. They will overcome this virus. Until then, they'll care for each other, and they'll keep each other safe. This is not the end of the world. While they still breathe, while they still fight, while they still resist, there is always hope at world's end. The motorcycle slows to a stop and Deathstroke looks up at the large house. He didn't like Kentucky, but nine million dollars is nine million dollars. Someone was burning down churches and someone else didn't like it very much. Pulling free his sword, he walks calmly up the front door and he rings the doorbell with the tip of the deadly steel. This was day one of the anti-life virus being set forth onto the world. A third floor window shatters as a man sails through it, landing hard on the ground, his legs broken. Yet he still tries to run. Destro pulls his pistol, killing the man with a single round to the head, finding it odd that he has seen people running, but not typically on shattered legs. The door behind him bursts open as people try to run away, so Destro swings his blade, cutting one, and then he stops, because he realizes those people aren't running from him. He turns back to the house, hearing the first growls from within, and the zombies begin to rush him, so he moves inhumanly fast, his blade cutting through their soft flesh. He spins, firing his pistol as the sword swings, and as more zombies fall, Slade decides that it's time to renegotiate his contract. He pulls out his phone, ready to call up the individual who gave him the mission, and he stares at the red glow of the screen. Suddenly, like many others, he feels it inside of his mind and he drops to his knees, screaming and tearing at his face. This virus is sent across screens, and once you see it, you can't stop it. It's in my face! He screams out and everything goes black. The blackness gives way to red, and Slade looks down at his hands around a man's throat as he pleads for his life. Suddenly, Slade is back to normal and he looks around at the destruction all around him. The creatures are attacking the city. It is now day two of the anti-life virus. Meanwhile, deep beneath Wayne Manor, Jason Todd steps through the Batcave, calling out to Alfred or Bruce. He stops pulling free, looking down at the puddle of blood that he stepped in. Oh no. He finds the bodies of Bruce Wayne, Dick Grayson, and Tim Drake laying on the Batcave floor. I thought you, you of all people, he whispers to himself, and a growling comes from deep within the cave. Jason turns, pulling free his pistols, but Ace the Bat Dog steps out of the shadows, still growling. Jason steps forward, letting the dog sniff him as he pulls him in for a hug. I know, boy. Don't worry. I'm not going to leave them like this. It's okay, he tells him. Jason takes the time to bury all three members of the family that he finally lost for good. With that done, he looks over at the Batmobile. He never did let me drive the car. He nods, moving towards it. Car, show me the locations of the Bat family in Gotham other than me. The screen flashes, showing eight members within the city. How many heartbeats? Jason asks. Two appear, and Jason looks up, seeing Ace stare at him with his head to the side. Well, are you getting in? The dog leaps forward, jumping into the passenger seat. Good dog. Jason pets him, and the two speed out of the cave. Elsewhere, night falls in the city, and Rose Wilson is sitting in her apartment, two pistols and a radio at her side. She can hear them in the hall. And the radio suddenly crackles and the voice of her father comes on the other side. Rose, I'm coming. It's time to go. He tells her, but she refuses. She can see the future and she knows that if she goes through that door, they will come in and they will kill her. Sure, but when you're through mourning your not dead self, go through the window. Take the fire escape to the roof. Bring every weapon that you can. Don't look at any screens. She pauses. You want me stuck on the roof? You won't be stuck. Go. Moments later, Ravager steps out onto the roof loaded for war. A ladder descends from a helicopter overhead, and Slade tells her to climb. He looks up, though, seeing a large shape flying towards him. Don't climb! Don't climb! He yells at her, and Man Bat collides with the cockpit, shattering the window. Slade throws his arm up, blocking the monster, letting his teeth sink into his forearm. His pistol goes up, and the cockpit fills with the smell of gunpowder as he empties it into the monster's side. Rose watches as the chopper careens out of control, exploding on the roof in front of her, and she rushes forward as Slade is pulling himself out, growling. 
I'm sorry, Dad. She whispers, pulling free her sword, and she twirls, slicing into him. Ow! What the heck? He yells. Rose stops. I don't think the undead say ow or heck, she says. No! Can you take your sword out of me? Slade asks her. Quickly, Slade explains that the creatures aren't zombies, and that his healing factor reverses whatever the hell the effect is. Interesting. He was right about you. A voice calls out, and they both turn, guns drawn. Mirror Master stares at them from one of the fallen helicopter doors. Don't shoot. It's seven years bad luck, and I don't want to see what bad luck looks like on top of the undead apocalypse. He quickly tells them the Vandal Savage has sent Mirror Master to gather Slade and his daughter to bring them to safety, in exchange for the protection that your presence would provide. He reaches through the mirror, dropping them some goggles that will protect them from the virus if they look at any screens. They step through the mirror universe where flashes of the destruction that currently rips through the earth can be seen. And finally, they step out into Savage's lair. He introduces them to the others that he has gathered. Solomon Grundy, Creeper, Cheetah, Captain Cold, Lady Shiva, Bane, and Deadshot. Everyone has been selected for a reason. The heroes are going to fail. They're not ruthless enough to survive. We're going to inherit what's left of the planet when this is done, Savage tells him. Meanwhile, back in Gotham City, gunfire fills the halls of the GCPD. Gordon fires his pistol, laying cover for Bullock. Move! Back to the cells! Batgirl then leaps out of nowhere and jumping onto the desk, kicking away at more monsters. We get to the cells, we'll be trapped, Commish! Bullock yells over the boom of his shotgun. We'll be trapped, but it buys us time, Jim tells him. Harvey stops. The bat ain't coming, he tries to tell him, and one of the creatures is then on him, tearing at his flesh. Gordon kills the creature with one shot and then looks down as Bullock begins to change. Kill me, Jim! He pleads and suddenly Batgirl is there snapping Bullock's neck. Gordon, act now, she tells him. The walls suddenly explode as the Batmobile launches through it, gunfire ripping out, killing the rest of the creatures. Red Hood hops out of the driver's seat. Not Batman, get in the car, he orders them. And with that, the three of them begin to rumble through the city with Jason telling Gordon that the current plan is to get out of the city. We can't leave, not yet. My daughter is still out there, Jim tells him. No, Jim. I'm sorry, she isn't. Car, show the heart monitor for Barbara Gordon. The screen flashes, showing the flat heartbeat of Barbara Gordon. And Jim is stunned, but also confused. Why do you have a heart monitor on? You're a smart man, a good detective. Batman is dead. You don't have to play his game anymore. Jason tells him, removing his helmet. Jason Todd, Jim states, looking at him. And then he looks back in the back seat. Cassandra Kane. Hello. She waves from the back, removing her mask. Bruce Wayne, Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, Damian Wayne, Barbara, are they all? Damian's alive the last time I checked. He's in Metropolis along with Alfred. The rest are all gone. Jason then shows him that they are the only three left in Gotham City. And Jim questions why he would be monitored. Batman was terrible at expressing anything with words, and he had absolutely no consideration when it came to personal boundaries. But he violated your trust and secretly monitored you for a reason. Bruce thought you were family. Jason tells him. Jim asks him to take him to his daughter. Jason doesn't think it's a good idea, but understands the need for closure. The three members of the Bat family lay in an alleyway trapped by vines that hold them in place. Jim cries as he looks at what remains of his daughter. More and later, move now, Cassandra tells him, lifting him up, brushing away a tear. And a few feet away, Jason looks down at the corpse of the Joker. It should have been me. I should have been the one to kill you. He whispers, pulling out some zip ties, telling them that they can't leave just yet. And with that, the Batmobile is rumbling through the city with Joker's corpse tied to the front bumper. You do realize that this is very screwed up, Jim tells Jason, taking a drink from his flask. It's the apocalypse. Don't judge me. Day three of the anti-life virus. Jason is looking through his binoculars, staring at the mass of undead that seem to be surrounding a building in the city. It's Bloodhaven, so an undead virus is almost an improvement. He tells them, survivors trapped inside, Cassandra tells him, when Jason informs them about the mass of undead. We can't just keep driving. We need to find somewhere remote to hide, he offers. No, we can't, Gordon tells him. No, we can't, Jason agrees. So they hop back into the Batmobile, ordering it to disable all non-lethal safety protocols. Rockets flare out, exploding, taking out large masses of creatures in a single blow. And the Batmobile rumbles through them, cutting down others beneath its tires. The car then picks up a signal for the garage, opening it and giving them away inside. Once they get in, though, they step out and they're confronted by a group of children. Hands where I can see them, 
Leave any screens in the car, the girl orders them. It's all right, we're the good guys, Jason tells them. And behind him, Gordon whispers that they might want to remove the corpse of the psychotic clown from the front of the car. Good idea. They introduce themselves and the girl leads them through the orphanage, and they discover that most of the adults fled and the ones who didn't well. They're locked in the gym, she tells them, pointing at the wooden doors that creak as something is pushing against it from the other side. Metal is wrapped around the handles, locking the monsters in, and she tells them that a superhero locked them in and sealed the doors. Then she went away, and she never came back. Are you going to go away? The three look at each other, and Cassandra gets a look of determination on her face. This is a good fight, she tells them. It's as good as place as any if we're not going to go anywhere. Jim nods. So Jason steps forward, shaking the girl who seems to be the leader's hand. We'll get you through this. Orphans gotta stick together. It's been three weeks since Gordon, Jason, and Cassandra have taken up residence with the kids locked into the orphanage. Three weeks of monsters swarming outside the walls. We have to do something, Gordon. It's time to talk about the undead elephant in the room, Jason tells the former commissioner as they both stand outside the locked doors within the building, the sound of trapped undead rattling against the strong wood. They affected a no threat while they're in there. Jim tells him he refuses to kill the caregivers and the children that were locked inside, those that didn't make it in the orphanage. Cassandra interrupts them, stating only a few words. Jim, the radio. The three go into another room when they hear Lois Lane's broadcast. The survivors of Earth are leaving, boarding two different ships. One of them is located in Themyscira, the other is in Poison Ivy's jungle in Gotham. Gordon reaches out, turning the radio off mid-broadcast. No. He says simply, but Jason's confused. Gordon, a jungle in Gotham? We could make it, Cassandra offers, and Gordon nods, leading the young heroes into the other room where the children are playing. But there's no way for the three of us to get all of these children to another city. We stay here, and we say nothing. Meanwhile, over at Vandal Savage's fortress on Ball's Pyramid, Mirror Master comes out telling Lady Shiva what he has found. Take me to her, Mirror Master, she demands. In the orphanage, Cassandra suddenly drops to her knees pulling free a battering as she hears her name called. Mother? She asks and stares at Lady Shiva. We have somewhere safe. She orders, turning away, but Cassandra refuses, leading her mother into the orphanage. Kids come too, she tells her, indicating at the sleeping children that she has been protecting. But Shiva refuses, telling them they don't have room. Then I stay, Cassandra simply states. Don't be stupid. The world is ending. You don't have to deal with it. Come with me. Shiva tells her, growing angry. The two women drop into combat stances as Mirror Master tries to talk some sense into them. They launch at each other, trading blows, and each attack is blocked. Cassandra leaps into the air, avoiding another hit. But Shiva gets through her defenses, dropping her to the floor with a swift jab to the jaw. It's at that moment that Jason is suddenly there, grabbing Shiva's fist, stomping her. She turns, kicking him hard into the face, knocking him to the ground in a spray of blood. Okay, Gordon tells her pulling back the hammer on his revolver with a loud click. That's enough of that. Shiva looks around at the group, telling her daughter that she offered her a chance since she was family. You could stay, Cassandra tells her, and Lady Shiva looks at her for a moment before turning back to the mirror. Goodbye, daughter, she says, disappearing. Goodbye, mom, Cassandra whispers. At their fortress, Savage demands to know where Lady Shiva and Mirror Master had gone. I found my daughter. She tells him simply. Savage grows angry, telling her that what they're doing is about survival. He reaches out, grabbing her by the arm, and Slade steps in, trying to calm the immortal down. You are not in charge here, Slade. Savage growls at him, and Slade nods, stepping forward. You brought the volatile group of killers under one roof. We're tense and worse. We're bored. Best not to piss each other off. We're not going to outlive the apocalypse if we kill each other. Savage suddenly grows calm, nodding. He apologizes to Slade and to Shiva for his behavior, and the rest of the group moves away. Savage turns to Slade, asking if he could speak with him privately for a moment. I'm not sure that's a good idea, Rose whispers to her father. Slade nods, moving down the fortress tunnel. I should have brought you in on this earlier, Savage tells the assassin, and the two step through the doorway, revealing the creeper strapped to a table. His chest is now cut open, revealing the organs within. Nearby, Solomon Grundy stands with a scalpel. Oh, hey! Creeper says cheerfully. Slade is shocked, unable to react quick enough as Savage pushes him forward, ordering Grundy to take him. The creature's massive fists connect to the side of Slade's face, dropping him. He wakes up later, strapped to the table next to the Creeper. You got betrayed too, huh? 
<laughs> Gotta say, did not see that coming. Slade is still groggy as words slurred. You needed me. He gasps. Savage nods, washing his hands. You're both immune to the anti-life virus. I'm going to pull you apart and find out how. Suddenly, a blade pierces Savage's chest, blood splattering against the wall. Don't you double-cross someone who can see the future! Rose snarls, pushing the blade deeper into Savage's back. She moves across the room, working to free her father. Next, she frees Creeper as the two of them make their way out of the room. Creeper, can you move? Oh, sure. It's not like this is the first time someone's cracked open my chest and poked it in my internal organs. Something about this face just invites a vivisection. He smiles at her. Grundy crosses the room, pulling the sword free of Savage's back, but Rose suddenly stops, fear on her face. Run! She screams, Savage stopping, demanding to know what's coming. What do you see? I wouldn't want to spoil the surprise, she tells him, dragging her father out of the room. I've lived for 53,000 years. I am rarely surprised. Savage scoffs when suddenly the entire fortress shakes and the wall behind him explodes inward with a loud boom. Vandal Savage looks up to see the bloody face of Wonder Woman taken by the anti-life virus. She moves fast, ripping him in half, spraying his immortal blood around the room. Grundy leaps forward, screaming as he attacks Wonder Woman. Outside, Rose orders Mira Master to get them out of there, but before anyone can react, Grundy comes flying through the wall, followed by Wonder Woman. Everyone turns their weapons on her, the room filling with the sound of gunfire and smoke. Captain Cold turns his cold gun on her, blasting her with ice. I'll slow her down. Go, McCullen. Get them out. He screams at the Mira Master. The villains all begin to escape out the mirror. I'll come back for you! Mira Master yells at his friend. Damn straight you will! The others appear in the orphanage, bringing a scream of fear from a young boy who comes face to face with Grunty. He falls back, crawling away as the creeper tries to comfort him. It's okay! He's not a zombie! I mean, well, he is a zombie, but he's our zombie! The maniac tells the boy. With the others through, Mira Master heads back through the mirror, hoping to grab Snart. He appears in the icy chamber, staring only at Wonder Woman. Ah, oh, crap! He whispers. Captain Cold grabs him from behind, biting hard into the man's neck, cutting off his scream. Back at the orphanage, Cassandra rushes down the hallway, brought by the boy's scream. You came back? She asks, staring at her mother. But Gordon is there too, aiming his revolver at Bane. And you brought murderers, psychopaths, and monsters. Some of us are all three in a convenient package. <laughs> the creeper laughs. Jason steps forward, his own weapons pointed at the villain's face, surprised to find Rose among them. What are you doing here? This is a story, probably not one for little ears. Let's talk privately, Jason, she tells him before turning back to the mirror. We're just waiting for one. She stares in the mirror for a minute, but finally Slate tells her, they're not coming. In the kitchen, Rose finishes explaining how Wonder Woman attacked them, feeling that possibly the anti-life virus can sense life. Jason nods. It would explain the unhealthy buildup of blighted ones surrounding the walls outside. He nods. Slate agrees, telling him that they need to prepare in case more superpowered zombies show up. Slate offers the idea that they start training the children to fight and defend themselves. They're innocent children! Gordon yells, but Bane merely shakes his head. No one gets to be innocent now, he tells the former cop. You can't protect them from this, Gordon. Jim grows angry, yelling at them all, and finally Slade sighs, asking everyone to give him and Gordon the room, alone. Slade admits to Gordon that he lost one of his sons. It was the most difficult thing that could have happened to him. We're not going to protect these kids by pretending the monsters aren't out there. We need to prepare them. This isn't an ideal situation for anyone, but I'm a practical man. I don't want to lead this room, and Bane will step in if you don't. He tells him, and finally Jim agrees, and the two exit the room, finding the waiting group. Jim rubs his eyes, still unhappy. I don't like this situation, but we'll make the best of it. Despite your crimes, you're all welcome here. But abuse the hospitality, and you'll be sent to fend for yourself outside these walls. And finally, he looks up, determination on his face. Tomorrow you meet the kids, and we start to prepare. Rose nods, finally stating that she has one question. What's behind those doors? She says, pointing at the sealed room. The ones who didn't make it, Gordon tells her, and the group begin to argue, telling the commissioner that it's insane to allow the deceased within the building. Gordon tries to argue, but finally Slate steps in. Go to the kids, make up an excuse for the noise. If you don't have the stomach for what's about to happen, let us take care of this for you. Cassandra and Jim leave, but Jason stays behind, making sure his pistols are loaded. Grundy opens the doors and the group level their weapons. My god, 
Jason whispers and Rose questions him, but he merely points at the young boy. I know that kid. His name's Billy Batson. He's... he was... it doesn't matter. The halls echo with the sound of gunfire, and so it began. The next day, the children met their roommates, and they began to train. Lady Shiva taught them hand-to-hand -hand combat. Deadshot taught the marksmanship, teaching them how to cave in skulls with a slingshot. Professor Creeper taught them the art of saying witty things when beheading the undead. There are hiccups as Bane tried to teach the children why humanity was its own downfall. I really can't hear you through the mask. You're all muffled, one child tried to explain. And throughout it all, the new group grew close, becoming family, playing with Grundy, Jason, and Rose tour the building, laughing at the children petting Cheetah. I have to admit, this is going far better than I was expecting, he admits. And in the gym, they find Slade yelling at some of the children, pushing them to push themselves. You don't have to be so hard, Jason tells him as the child runs away. Of course you'd say that. Batman was too soft, Slade tells him. Jason, shocked, almost stunned. Batman was? Are we talking about the same Batman? Violet scowl, pointy ears? He asks, and Rose yells at her father before he looks at them both. You do a thing? He finally asks. You should be. Not a lot of happiness out there. Find it where you can. We're all probably going to die screaming, he tells them. The two head outside, taking cover in the rain. They laugh, trading childhood trauma stories, when suddenly Rose stops as a view of the future fills her mind. You're about to try and kiss me, she tells him with a smile. Well, take all the fun out of it, he tells her, leaning in, but she just smiles. It doesn't. Inside, Bane is patrolling down the hallway when he finds a growling face. Leaning down, he tries to quiet the dog, not seeing the head poke through the mirror behind him. Outside, Jason and Rose pull from their embrace, hearing the sound of screaming and gunfire coming from within. They rush inside to find Gordon and Deadshot huddled with a group of children, guns all trained around them. He's in the mirror, Gordon hisses at them. A hand reaches through one of the glasses, pulling a child with it. Deadshot rushes forward, snapping the arm, freeing the kid. But Mirror Master pushes through, grabbing Lawton, pulling him through. Gordon fires, shattering the mirror, slicing off Deadshot's leg as the portal closes. Cassandra comes into the room, holding her shoulder, and she looks at the group in shock, explaining that Bane was turned. He ran right through me. He didn't stop, she explains. Where is he going? Outside. And outside, Bane rips apart the wall, allowing the host of undead to flood within the safe haven. The anti-life equation has improved its odds. Bane rushes forth, the anti-life equation having taken everything from him. Behind him, a wall of the Blighted Ones are following his lead, and Gordon and Deathstroke tell everyone to get inside as the dead draw near. But Grundy is there, leaping through the air, stopping Bane's assault. Bane was strong, but Grundy... He was something else. Bane, no more children! Grundy bellows, tearing Bane's head clean off his body. He launches it across the yard, destroying another of the Blighted One's heads with it. And from inside, Creeper laughs. <laughs> oh, wow. That is the first headbutt I've ever seen without a body behind it. The moment doesn't last long, though, as the undead begin to bog down Grundy. And he yells for the others to run, but the children refuse. Hey, get off our Uncle Grundy, Lolita yells, hefting her bat. They've been training for months with the heroes and villains, and they are ready for this. The kids launch their attack, but Slade and Gordon are there, pulling them away, firing their weapons. Damn it, kids, fall back, Gordon yells. Don't risk your life for a dead man, Slade agrees, and Creeper launches himself over their heads, pulling the big zombie from the grasp of the undead. Come here, you big, caring dead man. You can't die on Monday. It would ruin your whole poem, Creeper tells his friend, and he pulls him away, telling Grundy that the tree lobsters have to stay together. Grundy looks back at him. Tree lobsters. They continue to fight through the corridors, their weapons thundering in the closed space, and finally Gordon tells them that they all have to make it to the buses. We have to get them to the Gotham Garden, the one run by Ivy and Harley, Gordon tells them, but Jason doesn't think that's a good plan. All the heroes left, Jim. You honestly think the sanctuary's still there? He asks him, continuing to fire his weapon. Jim nods as he reloads. Do you have another option? Moments later, the door to the garage explodes open and the Batmobile races into the waiting undead. The worst road trip of all time has begun. The two buses charge after them, mowing down the anti-life zombies along the way. Rain splattering against the hood as the three vehicles begin the 33-minute drive from Bloodhaven to Gotham City. They charge down the road, the Batmobile clearing a path through the undead in the abandoned cars. They were having a good time, until Slade looked up at the mirror on the bus 
What's that? He mutters, seeing the ripples in the mirror's surface. And Mirror Master jumps through the rearview mirror, his claws slashing at Slade's chest. The assassin screams in pain, falling to the floor as the bus careens out of control. Gordon grabs the wheel as Slade's healing factor begins to kick in, and he stands turning back to the frightened kids. Knock out the windows, he shouts to them, but it's too late. Mirror Master appears again and again, pulling the kids with him through the reflections of the window. Grundy and the kids try to stomp him, but the undead are too fast. Mirror Master comes through again, his hands grasping onto the hair of Matilda, Cheetah's favorite, and she launches herself across the bus, her fist punching through Mirror Master's head. You don't get to take this one, she snarls as the former rogue dies. Matilda smiles petting Cheetah on the head. Good kitty, she smiles, and Cheetah turns, glaring at the rest of the people on the bus. Only she gets to call me that. The Batmobile checks in, and Jim tells the others that they've lost some of the kids, but they have little time to mourn them as they arrive at the Gotham Gardens. The city is packed with the undead, their bloody hands clawing at the forest walls of the sanctuary. Jason speeds up in the Batmobile, running through the crowds of the undead, when suddenly an alarm begins to beep, and Rose asks if that's a good thing. Yeah, Batman would never install a good alarm, Jason tells her. And a screen pops up as he tells her something is coming in low and fast, and Rose's one good eye goes wide. Jason, I could see the future, and I know what's coming, she gasps, yelling at Jason, buckle your seatbelt! The object slams into the front of the Batmobile, flipping it into the air, landing it with a loud crunch, flattening more of the undead in the process. And from the smoking crater, Wonder Woman stands. The super-powered death has arrived. The first bus stops, and Cheetah doesn't wait. She charges at the Amazon, hissing. Kick her princess ass! And Matilda cheers from the door, and the villain slams into Wonder Woman, her arch nemesis, but things have changed. The one that was the villain is now the hero, and the hero is now the villain. Slashing at her with her claws, Cheetah begins to win out over Wonder Woman, and inside of the bus, everyone watches. But Slade quickly realizes, Cheetah can't stop the Amazon by herself and Creeper nods next to him. All right, I guess I'm taking on an undead goddess. He jokes, cracking his knuckles, but he's stopped by Grundy's hand on his shoulder. Not myself, tree lobsters, the big man tells him softly. They shake hands and they launch themselves into the fight. Cheetah grabbing Wonder Woman and allowing Creeper to kick her hard in the face before Grundy backhands her. They were strong. They wouldn't be able to stand against her forever. Back on the bus, Slade orders Gordon to take all of the kids to the second bus, telling Gordon that he has to go after his daughter. I'm going to clear the path with the rest of you and get Rose. She might not like me much, but that's my fault, he tells the police commissioner, and Jim just tells him that he's going to. That's Batman's son out there, and you might need help with your little girl. We've lost enough kids, Slade. They radio their plan to Lady Shiva, who's driving the second bus, and she curses at them, telling them not to risk their lives for one person. And then she yells for her daughter, Orphan, who is ordering the other kids on the bus. As the last child gets on board, Shiva takes off, but Cassandra Kane is pulled free of the doors by the undead, bringing screams from the children inside. Stay on the bus! Shiva orders them as they stand, ordering the oldest to drive. She draws her sword, leaping outside to join her daughter in battle. Cassandra doesn't understand why her mother would do what she just told Slade not to. Why would she sacrifice herself to save her? Don't make a big deal out of it. Just accept that I love you and shut up, Shiva tells her, her sword cleaving through the mass of the undead that threatens to overwhelm them. Batgirl kicks another in the face, ordering her mother to head back to the bus, and they manage to jump on board. But at the last second, an undead reaches out, slashing Shiva in the back. She whirls, slashing its head off of its body. It's over, Cassandra. She tells her daughter as she turns back, her hand trying to hold in the blood from the wound. Tears fill Cassandra's eyes as she tells her mother that she'll take care of her. But Shiva shakes her head, telling her, a daughter shouldn't have to. You're the only person that I admire. Shiva tells her daughter one last time. Lady Shiva had the deadliest hands on the planet, and with her dying breath, she uses those hands to rip out her own heart. The children watch as the body tumbles off the bus. At the crash site, Gordon finds Jason hanging unconscious while Rose is trying to get herself free. You okay? He asks. Jason's out cold and a few integral bits of my body are broken, she tells him. Outside, Slade's guns are thundering, killing swarms of the undead, and he orders them to get on the bus while he keeps firing. But suddenly, Grundy comes flying through the air, destroying the bus in one blast. Our bus just folded in half and we can't make it to the next one, Gordon tells them. But Slade shakes his head as he reloads. Yeah, you can. I'll keep them off you, he tells them. 
There's a brief lull and Slade pulls Jason in close. Jason, I like you. Rose can glimpse into the future, so don't even think about hurting her. Or she'll probably kill you. Jason nods. I'll remember. Slade turns away, yelling for them to keep going as he keeps firing. Rose calling for her father, asking if he'll be behind them. That is definitely the plan, but in case I'm not, if you survive the apocalypse, build something out of this mess. Okay? He tells her. She reaches out, hugging her father for one last time. Slade hugs back, continuing to fire one-handed into the crowd of the undead. And the fight continues, with Wonder Woman squeezing the life out of Cheetah, literally grabbing her by the throat and just squeezing it until she stops breathing. And then she tears Creeper's head off of his body and slams her fist through Grunty. No day, kids! He gasps as the undead begin to feast on him. And as Rose looks back from the moving bus, she watches as her father fights against the monsters. His guns are empty, but his sword slashes into the rain. And at a brief moment, he was untouchable, unkillable. Wonder Woman then flies through him, his body exploding, and Deathstroke was gone. She slams into the front of the bus, lifting it high into the air, high enough that she throws it back to the earth, and everyone inside is screaming in fear as they careen to their death. And inside, Mary's eyes go wide. She knows what she needs to do. Shazam! She screams with lightning cracking across the sky. She flies upwards, lifting the bus up from the inside, gently placing it onto the ground. The kids are shot. I'll explain later, just keep driving. Get to the garden, I'm heading out there, she tells them. And she flies out into the storm, launching herself at Wonder Woman. She knows that a few months ago, she could never have held her own against Wonder Woman. But that was before she had three months to train with Cassandra Kane. Wonder Woman lashes out, but Mary grabs her fist, snapping them, before punching Wonder Woman hard back down to the earth. The earth shudders from the blow, and a massive crater forms beneath Wonder Woman's body. Mary flies down, lifting the bus off of the ground flying the last few feet into the garden. And inside, Gordon and Rose watch as the leafy gates open before them, letting them inside. Everyone gets off of the bus with Gordon reloading his revolver. Get ready, Wonder Woman will be coming. No, she won't. She can't breach the garden. Poison Ivy tells them from her place atop a massive tree throne. The crowd turns, seeing the others before them. It's magically protected against her and all of her kind, Dr. Fate tells them. Welcome to the post-apocalyptic Eden, Zatanna greets them. It's pretty if you can ignore all the dead scraping at the walls. Constantine adds, taking a drag from his cigarette. Ivy welcomes them, telling the children that they are safe here, and Harley just laughs, happy to have some children to corrupt. You're too late, Harley, Jason tells her. These ones come pre-corrupted, Rose adds with a smile. Though they are safe, sadness passes with the face of the children as they remember those that gave their lives to get them to safety. And time passes and they erect a statue of the so-called villains that gave their lives to protect a group of strangers. They were villains, saviors, families, tree lobsters. They lost. The heroes of Earth fell, and along with them, the planet. They lost so much that they didn't think that they had anything left to lose, but they were wrong. John Constantine sits in the Oblivion Bar, a drink in his hand, spending his days searching for the living amongst the dead, his nights drinking next to the ashes of his friends. John glances at the shoebox next to him, lifting his drink. I mean, there's probably other ashes in there too, but I reckon it's mostly you I scrapped up, Chaz. It's hard to tell one ash from another. They're not exactly snowflakes, he tells his long, dead friend. Suddenly, a portal opens up at the end of the bar, and Zatanna walks through. She looks at John, telling him that the world is depressing enough without him drinking alone. And John looks up with a sad smile. I'm not alone, Z. I'm never alone, he tells her. He looks around at the ghosts surrounding him, those of our fallen heroes. Big Barda, Mr. Miracle, Mr. Terrific, Blue Beetle, and Booster Gold. They all share a drink with John, having sacrificed themselves to save this planet. Wonder Woman reaches for Cyborg's head as the hero looks up into the sky. He decided to stay, believing that since the virus originated with him, it would be safer for him to stay behind. Let the survivors survive. Let them get off of the planet. He was wrong. The blighted Amazon rips his head from his body, throwing it away. It was five years later that he found something inside of his head that shouldn't have been there. A tracking device. Left by his friend, we'll say. He boosted the signal, sending it out into the void of space. He sent out a cry for help to a new world. 
to Earth 2. Main ship firing, John yells as Dinah and Cassie fly behind him. Dinah manages to use her green lantern ring to shield the planet from the attack as John and Cassie attack the guns. Got it, John, Dinah tells him. As the others rip the guns away, John reminds them to just disable the ship. They aren't trying to hurt anyone. I know, John, Cassie tells him. Batman, where are you? Inside, Damian Wayne slips through the corridors of the ship, telling John that he is just outside the throne room. All right, just remember, we want to talk to them, John reminds his friend. Sure, Damian agrees, leaping forward, knocking out one of the alien guards with a powerful kick. Was that a thud? Nothing, Damian tells him. Sounded like a boot to the face. Stupid super hearing, Damien whispers. I heard that. Damien moves in, dropping two more of the alien guards, while John reminds them that they are trying to broker peace with these people. That'll make it a lot more difficult if you take out the king's spleen and show it to him, John explains. These aliens have spleens? Damien asks, beginning to cut through the final door into the king's throne room. How should I know? You want me to find out? The door collapses and Batman enters the throne room. The king watches, flanked by two more guards as he tells a Batman that they have not won this war. Oh please, if we wanted to, we could have wiped out your fleet in seconds. This isn't a war, it's barely even a fight, Batman tells him. Oh, we will give you a fight. The king threatens, brandishing a fiery spear. Sure, do you have a spleen? Damien asks, pulling free two batarangs, and in a blur, John is standing between them, trying to calm the situation. He smiles, asking to bring the king to their leader. On Earth 2, in the remains of the great arcs that brought them through space, the remnants of mankind have created their homes. President Lois Lane stands before the king, expressing how they mean no harm to his people, that they have merely come to this world for sanctuary. Batman stands close, but he's interrupted by a message from Alfred. Your briefcase is beeping, sir. It seems to be beeping in Morse code, Alfred tells his young charge, staring down at the case that was the last gift from Bruce Wayne. Later. The new Justice League stands in the new Hall of Justice, Damien leaning over the table, explaining that the beep is the tracker that his father left inside of Cyborg. So it could just be beeps. Green Arrow offers coming up behind Damien, but Batman shakes his head, explaining, the Morse code is the letters J and L. Cyborg's calling for the Justice League, he explains, but Oliver isn't convinced. Maybe it's a trick. Maybe he's infected and the anti-life equation is literally trying to lure us back to Earth. Oliver tells him, believing that they have a good thing on this planet. Hardly anything is trying to kill us here. The others all begin to argue, but Oliver finally tells them that they should just call a vote. Ollie's right, we should vote, Dinah agrees, with Ollie telling her that it wasn't his main point. But the vote passes. John stands in front of his mother later explaining, you're going back. She says simply, John nodding, telling her that the Green Lantern Corps will protect Earth 2 while they're gone. You don't think it's too much to risk? Lois asks him. I think a friend is calling for help, Mom, John explains. Lois puts her hand out, touching her son's cheek. Come straight back. We've lost enough, Superman, she tells him. And he once more explains that he isn't comfortable being called that. So stop earning it, she tells him. Meanwhile, Oliver and Dinah are gearing up for the mission, with Oliver once again expressing how he doesn't like this. You voted, she tells him. Do you think I was gonna keep my hand down when all the kids were in on it? He asked. She smiles, telling him that he should stay on Earth too, that she'll be back. No, we should stay together and alive. Wait, wait a minute, did you just try to bench me? Oliver asks. I'm formidable, pretty bird. I killed the undead king of the sea while he was controlling a kraken. He reminds her. She smiles as he tells her once again. Oliver is quick to point out that she may have the ring, plus her scream. And then you have that sword that can kill a god. He begins, but she smiles, pulling free Wonder Woman's kryptonite forged magical sword, asking if he wants it. She kneels, offering him the blade, and he snatches it from her hand. Fine, I'll hold the sword, he tells her. Pretty sure you don't hold a sword like that, you wield it, she tells him. Fine, I'll wield the sword. And finally, the two of them pull each other tight. Pretty bird, I like it here. Promise we'll come back, Oliver tells her. I promise I'll bring you back, Dinah tells him as they embrace. Later, the Justice League arrives on the edge of the Green Lantern quarantine zone to discover Kilowog on guard duty. Yo, you better be careful down there, posers. I'd feel pretty bad about destroying you all, he tells them, telling them that he's guarding the Earth and the Sun. Your dad's still eating a star, kid. And that's when we see the original Kal-El still sitting in the Sun. Suddenly, the rings begin to chime with a proximity warning and the lanterns throw up his shield, but the projectile smashes through them without slowing and... Crypto! rushes up to John, the super pup's tail wagging at super speed. You know this creature? 
Kilowog asks, still ready to fight. Yeah, he's family. Inside the spaceship, Damien is smiling. All right, good puppy reunion. Can we get back to the distress signal? Cyborg's waiting. So a short time passes and the group finds the remains of Cyborg and Dinah steps forward. Vic, Cyborg, can you hear me? She asks. Leaning down, the head is quiet. So Cassie steps forward, holding her lasso of truth. If you can speak, this will make it happen, she tells them. They drape the lasso around Vic, and the head seems to come to life. He looks at his friends, recognizing them, and John steps forward. You called the Justice League, Cyborg. We came, he tells them. Vic's words are broken as he tries to speak. <laughs> he stutters. Overhead, Hot Girl flies, looking at the horde of Blighted that are running towards them. Hey, we have like some monstrous hordes of zombies coming in, maybe 10 minutes away. Monstrous hordes are about the worst kind of horde. We should move, Ollie tells the group. The group begins to move, picking up Vic's head and body as they begin to move towards Ivy's Gotham jungle. And Crypto begins to growl. It's okay, boy. We have time, John tells the dog. She's just here. She's always here. Vic struggles from his place in Cassie's arms. Dinah's ring suddenly pings with the proximity alert, and Batman's ship explodes in the sky. On board, Damien calls for John's help, and Superman is there, lowering the remains to Earth, saving everyone. But all around them, the smoke and the debris is showering the group. Dinah! Oliver yells as a haze of bloody fingers begin to wrap around his face. Dinah! I'm so sorry, pretty bird! He tells her as Wonder Woman slashes his body, cutting into his face and chest. Ollie! Dinah screams, her canary cry mixing with the lantern ring to push Wonder Woman off of the man that she loves, drawing blood. Dinah flies forward, grabbing the sword off of Oliver's back as she rushes Wonder Woman. Hot Girl's mace smashes into the Amazon's nose, staggering her, and Dinah stretches out with a massive green hand, smashing her flat into the ground. Vic struggles to speak again, asking them to stop, but Cassie can't hear him, asking him to repeat it. I heard him! John yells, rushing forward in a blur of super speed. Dinah! Dinah, don't! We can save her! He yells as Dinah launches forward, bringing the magical sword down for the killing blow. And John, he dives into the way, the blade piercing his back, stabbing through Wonder Woman. Dinah! There's a cure! He gasps. Roar Harper turned, peering into the destruction around him that was Chicago with his set of binoculars. They're coming. He whispers, turning back to the compound beneath him, shouting for the survivors that he has protected to get inside. Leaping from the building, he uses his crossbow to slide down a zip line and onto the pavement below. Mr. Arsenal, are the monsters going to get us? The little girl asks, clutching her teddy bear with a scared look in her eyes. But he just smiles at her. It'll be okay, Gracie. We'll wait them out. Like always, I will let them reach you. Go inside, he tells her. Someone shouts for his attention, pointing into the sky, and Roy looks up with a curse hovering on his lips for the briefest of moments. The blighted heroine, Fire, descends from the sky, launching green fire from her fingertips that engulfs Roy's body. Gracie screams as the hero dies, falling to his knees, burning away, when suddenly a portal opens up behind her and John Constantine steps out. All right, let's kick an equation in the ass. He snaps as his team follows him. This team is known as the Shadow Pack. The Blue Devil, a demon with a soul, strong, also impervious to damage. He launches himself, stabbing demons on his pitchfork. Ragman, drawing on the corrupted souls within his cloak for speed and strength, he leaps into the crowd of undead, his rags nearly useless at pulling souls out of the anti-life. Their leader, Detective Chimp, Bobo, able to tear people's arms off. Rose Wilson is among the blighted, swinging her dual swords, chopping people's heads off. And then there's Red Hood. Batman if he wasn't so squeamish. His twin pistols firing, taking out the blight with deadly precision. John continues to fight, hitting the creatures with magic as he asks Zatanna to deal with fire. Done, she nods, leaping into the air, but she stops, waiting for the blighted superhero to rush at her. As fire is rushing, she suddenly raises her hand, casting a spell with her backward speech. And mon fool! She snaps, and fire's flames suddenly extinguish, and the former hero falls from the sky, splatting hard against the side of a building. On the ground, John is trying to introduce himself to the survivors, when suddenly Swamp Thing is behind him. Bloody hell! He snaps as Swamp Thing growls his name. I need to talk to you about a garden, Swamp Thing tells the wizard. 
But John waves his hand for another spell, pointing out that they are fighting a horde of the undead. Mm. Swamp Thing grunts. When suddenly vines begin to grow out of the earth, wrapping around and stabbing all the blighted ones that surround them. And in a matter of seconds, all of the anti-life creatures are dead, and John admires the handiwork. See, why didn't you just open with that? He asks. Swamp Thing steps forward, telling John that he has sensed a second garden of survivors in Australia. I'm not going to Australia, mate. That place is dangerous before the undead. I'm not going to survive the undead, only to step on a stonefish and have my brain eaten by a drop bear. John tells him. But Swamp Thing rises up, vines and thorns coming out of his body. Shut the hell up! He snarls, and everyone stares shocked that Swamp Thing swore. That's new, Zatanna points out. Yeah, kind of proud of that. John agrees. Swamp Thing tells John that he is cut off from the second garden, that it is screaming in pain and he can't ignore it any longer. John nods, telling the hero to do what he has to do. There are humans there, and if you would like to save them from what I have to do, I believe you should come with me. Swamp Thing tells him. John finally nods, ordering Red Hood and Ravager to take the survivors back to the garden in Gotham. Later, the group enters the vast garden that Gotham City has become, and standing at the entrance is one Harley Quinn greeting them. She looks at the survivors, saddened that she sees only Rose and Jason. No, Zatanna? John? Danny? Rory? Not Bobo! That beautiful hat-wearing chimpanzee! She gasps, but Rose just tells her that they're all going to Australia. I was not expecting that answer, Harley notes. The Gotham Garden has become the safest place on Earth now, with Ivy's garden magically augmented by the Tower of Fate. Inside, Ivy looks up. Something warns her that there is something arriving. She yells for Mary and Kent Nelson. Shazam! Mary yells, becoming Mary Marvel, and the two leap into the air. Over the city, they're met by Cassie, who clutches a wounded John Kent in her arms, his blood soaking both of them. Help us, please, he won't stop bleeding. She begs them. They reach out with Dr. Fate, telling her that his wounds are magical. It's okay, you can let him go, Mary tells her. Inside of the garden, Dinah puts down Damien's ship with Batman exiting to find Jason Todd and Cassandra Cain. Jason! Cass! You're alive! He shouts joyfully, and Jason looks at him in the suit. And you're Batman now, Jason asks. Brusetti would want me to have it. Are you okay with it? Damien explains defensively. Jason looks at his brother. Our father made a lot of bad decisions. And then he pulls Damien in for a hug. This isn't one of them. Ivy looks up as Dinah descends, keeping the blighted Oliver Queen in a green lantern bubble. No, he does not enter. We have kept the anti-life equation out for five years. You think I'd allow someone to just walk in here with an infection? I won't leave him alone, Dinah tells Ivy. Then you leave here with him. You fend for yourself. I will not risk the lives of all the people here so that you can cling to a corpse. Ivy tells her, the ground rumbling at her feet as the vines begin to extend towards Dinah Lance. But the Green Lantern leaps into the air, beginning to fly away. Then we will go, she says simply. Ivy points out that the man is already dead. But that's when the head of Cyborg speaks up, explaining that there is a cure. That the blighted Wonder Woman told him that it was within him. Dr. Fate nods. I have access to science and magic, and now we have hope. We will find the cure. Cassie begins to walk away from the group, tears in her eyes, Damien following, asking what's wrong. She quickly explains that she had to mourn Wonder Woman. Seeing her like that was just too much. To watch her lose twice like this, she tells him, beginning to break down. I know, I'm sorry. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. Damien tells her, pulling off his mask and wrapping his arms around her, pulling her in for a kiss. Meanwhile, in Australia, the Shadow Pact looks at the garden. It's a bunker surrounded by a ring of fire, a moat of blood, and a thousand undead. John nods at the horrific sight, telling Zatanna that if she can hover them over the river of blood, he can get them through the ring of fire. You know, I just want to point out that we could just go home, put our feet up, maybe have a beer. Blue Devil points out. The group begins to hover over the undead, and after a few moments, the moat of blood is beneath them. But something catches Ragman's eye. The blood moat, it's shifting, he tells the others. It's not blood! Bobo yells, fear in his voice. It's Plastic Man! The undead shapeshifter lashes out, sharpening points of his body, and they begin to stab into the heroes. They pierce Ragman. They stab out Zatanna's eyes and then stab down her throat. They snake inside of the Blue Devil, piercing his impenetrable skin from the inside. And with their spell gone, 
Bobo and John plummet downwards into the seething mass that is the blighted plastic man. The mass begins to shift again, becoming rows of razor-sharp teeth and flailing tentacles. Meanwhile, from the shadows of the bunker, a group watches on. Zatanna wakes up with Bobo looking down on her. Are you an agent of the unliving? John asks as he helps her sit up. She shakes her head. Good, he nods, and they quickly fill her in on what happened, explaining that Blue Devil gave his life to save her. John tells her that they are currently inside a ball of vines and weeds while the blighted plastic man is trying to get in. Zatanna stands up, putting on her top hat and ordering Swamp Thing to lower the green. She leaps into the air and the monstrous plastic man begins to rear its attack at her as she flies through. Using her magic, she takes control of the hellfire around the bunker, burning plastic man to death. The group moves through the debris, finding their dead allies, and suddenly Bobo screams for them all to get down as the guns on the side of the bunker open fire at the incoming horde of the undead. The bullets stop the advancing horde, and John looks up from the ground as a voice calls out to them. Have you planning on coming in? This is your window. Cobblepot calls out to them. Meanwhile, back in Gotham City, Damian Wayne, who is the new Batman, has had a reunion with Jim Gordon, but is interrupted as Dr. Fate arrives, telling him that Superman has recovered. Inside the Tower of Fate, John awakens to Crypto wagging his tail and licking his face. He looks over at Mary Marvel, who sits by his side. You look familiar, John tells her, and with the utterance of a magic word, she transforms into Mary Marvel. After introduction, she explains what happened to John and how she was able to patch him up. Thank you, John tells her with a smile. Meanwhile, over at the Southern Bunker, Cobblepot, Maxwell Lord, and Professor Ivo give the remains of the Shadow Pack a tour of their home. They explain that they have soldiers and guards who work as the cooking and cleaning staff. Swamp Thing still isn't happy though as he hears the green crying out, and John is shocked to discover that Jason Blood has also found his way into the bunker. The Ancient Knight asks to speak with John in private, and once they're alone, he transforms into Etrigan. Before you start, could we please skip with the rhyming? John asks him quickly, and Etrigan stands before the sorcerer, explaining that hell isn't happy because the souls of the living are trapped in the blighted ones. Trigon is coming to wipe it all away. Etrigan warns, and he explains that even though the rich villains in this place are planning a new human race, it wouldn't matter because Trigon is coming to destroy the world. Sure. Heard it before, John scoffs. Their conversation interrupted as gunfire erupts from another part of the bunker. John rushes in to discover that Swamp Thing is attacking the bunker's guards, one of the last bastions of human beings that have survived, and Swamp Thing is trying to attack them. They've imprisoned the Floronic Man. They're torturing him. He's forcing the green to produce for them, Zatanna quickly explains. John steps forward, trying to calm Swamp Thing, but the Guardian of the Green isn't listening as he orders the men to release the Floronic Man. One of them refuses and Swamp Thing pops his head off. Bobo turns his head, hearing Cobblepot tell Ivo that it is time. When suddenly Amazo launches into the room, lasers shooting out of his eyes. The heat vision hits Swamp Thing, burning into him. Zatanna tries to stop the android with a spell, but more of them suddenly fly into the room. Z, they have more than one, John warns, and he creates a portal, and despite Swamp Thing's arguments, the group leaps into it as John promises that they'll return with a plan. The rich villains stand by, noting that the group will return. It doesn't matter. We'll take this world soon, Cobblepot tells them as they walk down the hallway, observing their army of Amazos. The next day, the group is listening as Cyborg explains that the cure is in his programming somewhere. They question him, but he tells them that he has been searching all of his coding and he can't find it anywhere. Death could have just been lying. Harley notes, but Cassie informs them that if Vic was using the lasso of truth, Wonder Woman couldn't lie. So after hearing everything, John stands ready. They know that there is in fact a cure somewhere out there. We're gonna find the cure and we're gonna save them all, he tells the group. And they begin to work through the problem with Damien noting that if there is an anti-life equation, then there must be a life equation. Bobo adds that possibly the new gods might know something about it. Hearing this, John tells them that he thinks he knows what they need, but it means doing something that he really doesn't want to do, bothering someone who probably prefers to stay unbothered. So a short time later, John and Bobo appear before an old cabin. The door opens, and they reveal a man in the shadows. How did you find me? World's greatest detective, 
John says, motioning at Bobo. Mr. Miracle steps out demanding to know what John wants, and he tells Scott that there is a way to save everyone, to save Barda. But Scott becomes angry, demanding to know how he could possibly believe John after last time. Ask me, John tells him, holding up Cassie's lasso of truth. There's a cure, Scott. We can save her, John tells him. Scott stares at him for a moment before asking what John needs him to do. First up, take a bath or a shower. Then we need your help in stealing the throne of a god, John tells him. Meanwhile, over in Gotham Garden, Kid Flash stands ready, warning the others as a boom tube begins to open up. They stand prepared for a fight, but it's John Constantine, Bobo the Chimp, and Mr. Miracle that step out. Batman appears behind the wizard, frightening him as he asks why he would open up a boom tube straight into the garden. A short time later, the group discusses the plan. John believes that the Mobius chair would have the answer for how Vic needs to access the cure that is buried in his programming. They've all agreed that it would be impossible to catch Metron and that they need to lure him someplace. Metron prizes knowledge above all else, Batman tells them. John nods, believing that Madame Xanadu's crystal ball and the ability to see the future should be enough to bring Metron to them. This could work, Scott tells them. I'll take Cyborg to New Genesis because I don't know how you'll be greeted. You'll be greeted with friends at your side, Superman simply states. He looks around telling them that anyone who could deal with space should come, when suddenly he realizes that Dinah isn't in the group. Stepping up, Harley fills him in on how Dinah left with the zombie Oliver because Poison Ivy would not let him into the garden. I'll find her, John says, leaping into the air, being the Superman that you would expect him to be. And Mary Marvel joins him, telling him that there are dangers in the world that he doesn't even know about. So they find Dinah sitting on a rooftop in the rain, the water mingling with the tears in her eyes. She leaps up when she sees John, hugging him with joy. Are you planning on sitting out here alone? Mary asks her as they sit next to her on the building. But Dinah explains that she isn't alone, and up floats the blighted Oliver before them. I promised I'd bring him back, she tells them simply. And John explains that there is a cure, and that they're going to need her help. When Dinah tells them that she keeps Oliver, Mary offers to sneak him into the garden to be protected by Dr. Fate. So a short time later, they bid their friends and loved ones goodbye as the group steps through the boon tube with Scott Free. And they appear in New Genesis, quickly greeted by Orion. What the hell are you doing here? You would walk into New Genesis with the anti-life equation, Orion demands as he points at Vic. Mr. Miracle tries to argue, but Orion punches him across the face. Stand, he orders. Standing, Scott says blood on his face as he struggles to his feet, and Orion hits him again. And they repeat this process until John steps in. Leave him alone, he says, punching Orion hard enough to knock a god down. And stay down, John orders him as he towers over the god. High Father approaches once again seeing his sons fighting. And quickly the group explains that there is a cure for the anti-life zombie equation. They might be able to save everyone. Hi, Father, we need the Mobius chair. Will you call out to Metron? Scott asks his father. Hi, Father explains that Metron does what Metron wishes. Even with their offering, he might not give up the Mobius chair willingly. But I will call Metron, his father promises his son. Later, Mr. Miracle hovers in the dead of space that was once the planet Apocalypse. He holds Madame Xenadu's crystal ball in his hands. He's coming. Everyone get ready, John tells the group on the radio. And in a blur of motion, Metron appears before Scott. I father said you have an object for me, something to see the future? Metron asks, not bothering with a greeting. He reaches for the crystal, believing that he can use it to see the disaster that approaches, but his arm is suddenly shackled by the Green Lantern. The heroes leap in at him, ambushing him, trying to wrestle the giant away from his chair. But quickly, he overpowers them, tossing them aside. Metron then steps aboard his chair once more, quickly escaping into space. Mary and John fly as fast as they can, trying to catch up. Wait, please! John calls out, and as Metron slows, John floats before him. He explains that they didn't want to fight, but that they only need his chair for a moment. And the god stops, and he stares at them as they explain what is happening on Earth. They explain the anti-life equation zombies. They explain that there is a cure. They explain that he alone can help them save the universe. I don't care, he tells them simply. But Mary has the wisdom of Solomon. If we fail to contain this and death wins, what happens to knowledge? She asks him, and Metron stares at them for a moment. You should have opened with that instead of an ambush, he tells them. Metron agrees to let them use the chair if he can look into the crystal ball. 
There is something I have seen in the future, but I know not how it begins, he tells them. With their agreement made, Vic sits in the chair, and energy crackles as the endless knowledge floods into his mind. Vic, do you know about the cure? Vic nods. I need to recode my blood. The life equation is there, he tells them. John tries to thank Metron for his help, but the god is barely listening. He tells them that he must go, and he quickly flees in the Mobius chair. He took one look into the future and hurried away. Dinah whispers, and as the heroes return to Earth, they are unaware of the Black Racer's presence. He is sitting and watching as one of the asteroids from Apocalypse begins to quake and glow, and suddenly it explodes, revealing the death within. Darkseid roars in rage and madness, and in New Genesis, the High Father turns and sees the fire that falls in the sky. He yells a warning to the others as he hears his son screaming from outside the gate, Father! Orion yells as the High Father rushes forward, and the unliving dark side is already among them. With the most powerful heroes remaining on a quest to obtain the Mobius chair, John Constantine made his move. He stands in front of a room in the Tower of Fate. When Dr. Fate appears, the magical hero looks at the door, questioning John about what's on the other side. What's in this room? Why can't I see inside? He questions. Uh, because the door is closed. John quips. Fate glares at Constantine, demanding to know what he keeps here. Oh, you know, a rack of identical trench coats, John tells him as he takes a drag of a cigarette. But Fate will not be detoured, as he demands to know why he can't enter the room, but John holds out his hand and the doorknob magically appears. He slips inside, looking back at the doctor. Look, don't worry about it. This is the Tower of Fate, so whatever is in here is clearly meant to be in here. Otherwise, you'd have to rename the place. John closes the door and steps inside. He turns to find the demon Etrigan waiting for him. Why have you summoned me, you sad Merlin wannabe? The demon asks, and John shakes his head, asking for an update on Hell. How long until Trigon comes? He questions. You should fear. He'll be here soon. Etrigan intones. John shakes his head, asking for a straight answer. He's pretty pissed. I say three turns until all life and non-life on this world burns. John nods, glancing at the shadows, asking Swamp Thing if he's heard enough. And Swamp Thing nods, and Etrigan leaves. The Australian Garden still cries out. Swamp Thing rumbles. John tells his friend that he'll deal with the Australians, and looks at Ragman's cloak. I'll need to if this is going to work, John tells him. And as the two step out of the room, Dr. Fate asks Swamp Thing what the room holds. A rack of coats. Swamp Thing says simply, and John laughs. As they cross through the garden, John tells Alec that they'll need a few people who don't mind dealing punishment. Are you as good as your old man? John says as he stops in front of Batman, currently Damian Wayne. Not yet, Damian admits. John explains that they need to do some questionable things. And I need to do them while Mary Marvel is a galaxy away, and I need a team to keep me alive. I can't say more, but it's for the good of the world and all that, John tells the young Batman. But Damien shakes his head, telling him that his reason isn't good enough. You don't trust me? John asks. I mean, of course not, Damien says simply, demanding the whole truth from John, and he lets him know that he'll know if John is lying. Constantine curses when he realizes that Damien is like his old man, and then he decides to tell him the plan. No one will die that isn't already dead. John finishes with it, and he leads him over to the rest of the team, and Damien smiles at Jason and Cassandra. A bad family trip with the Ravager and Swamp Thing, he says. Uh, actually, Rose and I are married, Jason tells him. So she's family too, Cassandra confirms. Damien brings them both in for a hug and tells them how happy he is for them. John explains to the group that he and Swamp Thing's souls are joined so he can bring them through the green. Moments later, Alec pulls himself out of a stand of trees, looking out of Ananda Parbat. That's a lot of anti-life, Jason notes as they come out of the portal and he draws his pistols. If there's a cure, we can't kill them, Cassandra tells them. But the heroes leap into the approaching army of undead ninja assassins, and as he fires, Jason asks Rose what they should do when they reach the gate. We knock politely, she tells him simply as her blades cut through another ninja. Get the blighted ones off me! She yells as she moves towards the door. Of course, keeping the undead off of each other was in our vows. Jason nods as he keeps firing. Rose knocks on the door and it opens with a squeak. Dead man floats out, greeting them. Welcome, my friends. Welcome to Nanda Parbat. He shouts as the warriors of Nanda Parbat flood out and begin to attack the ninjas. Follow me. Would you like something to drink? Maybe some snacks? He asks as he floats back into the city. Inside, John Constantine discovers the Spear of Destiny, which has been guarded for centuries. 
Is that what you've come for, Hellblazer? Rama Kushna asks him. He reaches forward, but Rama Kushna explains that she will protect him and his friends, but never allow the Holy Spirit to be taken from this place. And John lowers his head. I know, I'm sorry. He whispers as he whirls on her, stabbing the spear through Rama Kushna's chest. No, why? Dead man shouts as he flies towards them. I've never felt a need to explain myself to dead men. John tells him as he pulls out Ragman's cloak. He holds it up in the magical quilt, pulls in Boston Brand's soul. The others are rush over questioning him, but John doesn't answer, telling them that they're leaving. You stabbed a goddess, Jason shouts as they step through the portal. But John shakes his head and tells Jason that she'll heal in a couple thousand of years. But she never would have let me take this, he says, holding up the spear. Damien looks around, questioning where Swamp Thing has brought them. The Rock of Eternity, the Guardian of the Green rumbles before explaining that they need the wizard. They need Shazam's staff. Are you planning on stabbing him with it? Jason asks. But suddenly, Rose stops and her eyes widen. She pulls free her pistol out of fear. Get us out of here, Constantine, she orders, raising that pistol, firing at the bolt of lightning that suddenly shoots across the room. The bullets don't even slow Captain Marvel Jr. down as he slams into Jason Todd, breaking the troubled hero in half. Swamp Thing's tendrils grasp the former hero as Damien launches explosives at him. Rose goes to her husband, pulling off his helmet, and she pauses briefly to throw a knife behind her, killing the wizard before he can attack. Freddy continues to fight as John orders the others to find the st- Staff. Cassandra reaches forward, but doesn't hesitate when she shouts the magic word. Shazam! She bellows, transforming before their very eyes. She launches herself at Freddy. Cassandra was the greatest hand-to-hand fighter left on the planet, and the young boy didn't stand a chance. Rose eases her husband against the wall, apologizing for not being able to stop what she foresaw. <laughs> hey, it's okay. He smiles at her, blood in his mouth. I've died before. I'm not so afraid this time. I was just lucky. I got a second life, and my second life was with you. He tells her softly, and she kisses him as he passes from this life. They return to the garden, and Rose demands that John promise her that this was worth it. I promise that this is the only way, and if I'm wrong, well, we'll all be too dead to notice. As the others walk away, Damien walks over and reminds John what he told him about their mission. I told you I wouldn't kill anyone that wasn't already dead. John reminds him. Batman cracks the wizard across the jaw, dropping him to the ground, and John watches as the young man walks away. You deserved that. A ghostly voice whispers to John, and he turns to see Spectre floating behind him. Oh, what a shock. The ghost of Wrath thinks I deserve a punch to the face. John quips. Spectre leans forward, telling John that he is capable of stopping what he is doing. I know, Jim, John says, lighting a fresh cigarette. He looks at the Spectre, telling the Spirit of Vengeance to use a little insight. What do you think I'm motivated by? John asks. And the specter smiles at him and flies away. Good night, John. In Australia, Penguin leans over the table asking Professor Ivo once more if the Amazos are ready. Very nearly, Ivo informs him. Anger swells up in Cobblepot, and Ivo reminds him that one wrong calculation in Amazos' will will kill them as well. Penguin continues to yell, and suddenly two of the androids appear behind him, their eyes glowing menacingly. Considering I am the sole survivor of a superpowered, artificially intelligent army that can destroy the very planet that you're standing on, maybe you should review your tone. I will be done soon. The undead can wait a little longer. Meanwhile, over in Gotham Garden, Cyborg finishes recording his blood to the life equation. John nods, leaning down to pet Crypto, asking what their next step is. But Cyborg isn't actually sure how to turn the equation into a cure. If only we had the world's greatest biochemist with us. Damien notes as he tries to play fetch with Ace, and he leaves them to go speak with Swamp Thing. Little Batman, I am sorry about Jason. He seemed like a good being, Alec rumbles. Damien expresses his appreciation and then tells Alec that he wants Jason to be the last lost from this virus. And for that, we're going to need Alec Holland, Damien tells him. But Swamp Thing shakes his head, explaining that even Alec Holland can't create the cure on his own. Damien agrees and tells him that the man wouldn't be alone. So, a short while later, they're all brought together, linked by the green with Dr. Fate's telepathic abilities. Nobel Prize winning Alec Holland, Pamela Isley, former doctor of toxicology, Vic Stone infused with the technology of two worlds, Mary Marvel, Wisdom of Solomon, Harley Quinn, former doctor of psychology and medicine, Wallace West, the fastest mind on the planet, Detective Chimp, the world's greatest problem solver, and Batman, because he's Batman.
With these minds linked together, it wasn't long until Cyborg was standing before the survivors. I think I have the cure, he tells them. We can save them all. Superman nods. But at that time, the Amazo androids were released and they cut a swath of anti-life destruction across the world. Cyborg had developed the cure, telling the others that they needed to test it. Green Canary nodded her head. Ollie, she says simply. But Mr. Miracle steps in, explaining that it should be Big Barda. Dyna grows angry, but Scott explains that if something goes wrong, Barda might be strong enough to survive. We shouldn't risk Ollie, he explains. So they've removed a sliver of Canary's magic sword to create a needle strong enough to pierce Barda's skin and stepped through a boom tube. The team arrived on a small moon near Alpha Centauri. It was the safest place I could think of, Scott explains to them, and he leads them to a crater where he keeps her chained up, but fear shows in his eyes. Oh no, she escaped, he whispers. Canary whirls around at the last second as Barter comes plunging down upon them. She slams Scott into the ground with a bellow of rage. Superman, do it! Scott yells as Barter raises her fist to beat the man that she loves. And John moves at super speed, plunging the needle into Barda's neck. She bellows with rage again, raising her fist once more. And John's eyes glow red as he prepares to attack, but Scott yells for them not to hurt her. Suddenly, intelligence returns once more to Barda's eyes, and she looks down at her husband. Scott? She whispers, looking at him with fear, questioning where they are and where their son is. He's safe. He's on New Genesis. We'll go to him. We just have to save the Earth first, Scott tells his wife with a smile. Meanwhile, over in the Tower of Fate, John Constantine pulls off the cloak that was trying to attack his soul. Yes, cloak, I know my wicked soul belongs in you, but give it a rest, will you? He curses. Suddenly, the door to his secret room explodes inward and Zatanna steps inside. Hello, Z. John greets her, but she's angry and demands to know what he has done. She looks around at the magical weapons that John has gathered and asks what is he planning. No. Can you trust me? John asks her, but Z shakes her head. Of course not, I've known you too long, she tells him. John nods, telling her that he's going to do things, but will need her help. If I tell you what I'm going to do, you'll try to stop me, he explains. And he suddenly glances at the door, telling Zatanna that he spent years hiding this place from Dr. Fate. You just left the door open so that anyone could walk in? He curses as Phantom Stranger steps out of the darkness. The stranger steps forward, telling John that he must not continue down this path. The world ends if I step off this path, John explains, and the stranger looks at Zatanna, asking John if she knows everything that he's done. Without an answer, he begins to list off everything that John has done recently. I chose to do those things I didn't want to do because they had to be done. John snaps at the Phantom Stranger, asking if he's really judging him after what he did to get cursed for all eternity. How dare you! The stranger yells, tossing John across the room, but the wizard recovers fast, reaching for the Spear of Destiny. Try it! He dares the ghostly hero. Suddenly, a pillar of fire appears in the room and outsteps Jason Blood. Constantine, we have to talk, Blood tells John. He tells the wizard that Trigon will step foot on the earth in a matter of moments and the world will burn. Elsewhere in the garden, the strike team returns to earth with a cured Big Barda. Any trouble? Damien asks. Well, she did try to kill us a bit, John explains. And Cyborg is ecstatic with the results, knowing that they can bring everyone back with the cure. But John reappeared to ruin everyone's day. He tells them about the Amazo army. John wanted to rush out to fight them, but Damien convinced them that they needed a plan. So they planned. And if they cure the people as they went, the Amazos wouldn't have anyone to attack. Wallace moved fast. He read everything that he could find on production in a blur of motion. Ten minutes later, he was an expert. He moved to the Magnus Labs where they began to create the cure. Three billion people could be cured with the first batch that rolled off the line. But that number began to drop fast because Trigon appeared on Earth at 10 p.m. The Blighted Ones of Paris surged towards him and he struck them. Fifteen minutes later, the city of Paris had been purged. The devil came to scorch the earth, and in the tower they all felt the deaths. John finally brought Dr. Fate to see what was behind the door, and he asked Zatanna to wait outside, and inside, Fate saw what John had collected. Doctor, I'm going to need your helmet and amulet, John explains as he puts on the cloak. Suddenly, the phantom stranger steps forward, stabbing Fate with the Spear of Destiny, explaining that Constantine showed him the future. You would prevent what needs to happen. The stranger explains, and fate falls to his knees, telling the group that he will not relinquish the helmet. It could not be removed by your magic, Constantine, he tells John. John tells him, oh, we know. He steps forward to the staff of Shazam, placing his hand on fate's helmet, uttering the magic word, Shazam! 
The lightning strikes and the helmet was removed as John was magically charged. He holds out his hands, summoning Naboo's amulet. I don't understand. You have to have a pure heart to harness the wizard's power. Kent Nelson grasps. Yeah, I have one. Just don't ask where I got it. John tells him. Zatanna suddenly steps back into the room and she is shocked by the wounded Kent Nelson. Phantom Stranger and Etrigan are standing with a magically powered John. I'm not gonna lie, this is exactly as bad as it looks. John admits to her and he tells her not to worry that fate will live. She steps towards him asking if he'll return. Hey, it's me, he tells her with a smile. That's not an answer, she tells him. And John smirks reminding her that she is the only person on the planet that he doesn't want to disappoint. They kiss it gently in those last moments, and with a crack of lightning, John flies out of the Tower of Fate, rocketing towards Trigon. Ready or not, world, I'm coming to save you. It all begins in Brisbane, Australia, where the main swarm of Amazo androids spread like locusts, brutally ending the unliving. Unstoppable killing machines programmed to wipe out all anti-life on Earth, each strong enough to face the entire Justice League. But this wasn't the Justice League that they were built for. These were warriors, wielders of the living lightning, the greatest trained fighters on the planet, holders of the most powerful weapons in the universe, and literal gods. A desperate last line of defense, risking everything to protect the anti-living from the artificially intelligent. They have the cure, they need to stop the androids. So as the Justice League fought the Amazos, the Phantom Stranger and Zatanna traveled to Paris to join John Constantine in a fight against Trigon, only to find that John hasn't shown up for the fight. Trigon stops for a moment from his spread of destruction and looks at the Phantom Stranger asking, Shouldn't you be walking forever in limbo? You're not supposed to choose a side. But while that fight gets ready to take place, over in the Australian Garden, the source of the Amazo army, the Super Sons, travel to take them out remotely. John looks out at the burning remains of the infected, stating that they could have saved them. They didn't have to die. Damien tells him that the people inside couldn't have known that there was a cure. Not to sound callous, but we can't stomp for the dead. Before John could react, he is struck hard across the face, and Damien calls out to his friend, but at that moment, an Amazo crashes down, barely missing him. While John holds the android in place, Damien leaps up, placing a small device on the Amazo's head, and a second later, it electrocutes it. The Australian bunker has proven impenetrable for five years, but its residents tried to kill Superman's best friends, so that was about to change. A few seconds later, the walls of the bunker explode and John walks in, holding the Amazo's head, asking, Where is Professor Ivo? We need to stop these things. Penguin walks up, telling him, No, that won't be happening. We've planned our personal oasis here long before the virus struck. Do you think that there isn't a measure to kill a Superman? Guards! But as Penguin points his umbrella, the guards remain still and Penguin asks, What are you waiting for? The guards look down from their post, telling him, They are not hurting Superman. Before Penguin could argue, he begins to choke, and all of a sudden, all of the residents inside falls to the ground. Damien asks what is going on. However, it was all according to plan. Outside, Constantine is using Ragman's cloak to absorb all of the corrupt souls. And Constantine knew exactly where to find the most corrupt ones still on Earth to power up his abilities. Superman flies out asking what he's doing, and Constantine pulls back Dr. Fate's helmet, telling him, It's okay. The cloak only targets the truly evil. If they were taken, then they deserved it. Besides, I'm going to need them to deal with some certain doom out there. You know, take out a demon who could otherwise destroy the planet? Superman asks if there's anything he can do, but Constantine tells him, Nah, I've seen the future, and Superman didn't make it. So just worry about saving everyone else. Superman tells him that he's a good man. But Constantine shrugs, telling him, not really, but it's nice to hear Superman say it. As Constantine takes off, back inside, Damien sees that Ivo has already been killed prior to Constantine's arrival. So John and Damien take the Amazo head to the only other person that might be able to help them get into the android's head, Cyborg. Damien explains that they're looking to see if they can figure out how the transmitters work. And through that, they want to try and infect their systems. Cyborg asks, are you suggesting we give the Amazo army a virus? And Damien says, that's exactly what we're suggesting. And John tells him, and while we're working on it, me and Flash will move as fast as we can to administer the cure ahead of the Amazos. So the two suit up with Flash stating, I'm North and South America. That leaves you for Europe and Africa. As John flies over to Europe, there are things that his telescopic eyes couldn't ignore. 
back in Paris, Trigon slams his foot down on the Phantom Stranger, telling him, You should have stayed out of this. While Zatanna lays defeated, Constantine teleports in and helps her up, telling her that he needs her to do a couple of things. First, hold the spear. Second, I need you to tell me that I can do this, Z. With Zatanna's blessing, Constantine walks to Trigon, telling him that as much as he'd like to see the Phantom Stranger get trodden on, he's gonna need to let that man up. Trigon laughs. Well, if it isn't John Constantine, oh, the eternity of torment that awaits you in hell! The never-ending nightmare that will... Constantine stops him. Oh, will you shut up already? And with the speed of Mercury, paired at the power of Zeus and the strength of Hercules, enhanced by all of the Lords of Order and a hundred angry souls, Constantine strikes. In short, Constantine just decked a giant demon. He uses everything at his disposal. The wisdom of Solomon matches with the dirty tricks of a lifetime of avoiding fights. Madame Xanadu's crystal ball to see the future seconds before it happens, and even creatures from other dimensions, but it wasn't enough. With one fiery punch, Trigon buries Constantine into the ground, leaving him a bloody mess. Satana runs over to help him, but Constantine smiles, telling her, Goodbye. And it was at that moment that things began to look bleak. The heroes were losing, the Amazos were overwhelming with their power, and just when all was lost, Cyborg did it. He infected the Amazos systems, and all across the world, the androids began to fall out of the sky. And that's when Superman showed up. He told Trigon to stop. Trigon says that he just killed a being connected to the most powerful magics in the universe. I will not stop! Constantine has seen the future. He knew that Superman would die if he faced Trigon, but Superman was faster than fate, stronger than the inevitable. As John charged in, Satana watched, and then she heard a faint laugh behind her. She looked back to see the ghost of Constantine asking how, and Constantine tells her, yeah, I'm a dead man. It sucks, but this is part of the plan. I wasn't being a real shite when I took Boston Brand's power. All that magic that I stole, He's still connected to it. And right now, I'm the most powerful dead man ever to be seen, which also means I can do this. Constantine flies up and into Trigon's head. Trigon falls to his knees, telling Constantine to get out of his head. But within a few seconds, Trigon begins to shrink in size, and through Trigon, Constantine says that he's going to need that spear. Trigon asks what's he going to do, and Constantine laughs, <laughs> just a little something. Calmly, he takes the spear, stabbing it into Trigon and his very soul. Zatanna rushes over asking why did he do that, and Constantine says that his soul was set for an eternity of torment. Just disappearing, well, that's gonna make a lot of demons in hell very, very annoyed. But if there's one thing that he can say before going, it's that he's going to miss all of this. With the looming threat of Trigon and the Amazos taken care of, the heroes now had a chance to help Flash continue giving the unliving the cure. They spread across the world, they rid the unliving infection, and in the end, they were able to cure two billion people. Some including friends, leaders, and even family. So many that were lost were found again, and they managed to bring them all back. In this universe, there are many similarities to the one that we know, though there are slight differences. Krypton was under siege by Brainiac, and both the young Kal-El and Kara escaped the Doom Planet's fate. But while Kal-El was sent to Earth, Kara was sent to New Genesis. And while Kara isn't the only one with special powers on New Genesis, there was something festering within the gods that lived there, something that would become a problem for everyone. But over on Earth, where the deceased issues have been going on for five years, five long years of anti-life equation viruses ravaging the defenseless planet, many have fallen, friends, family, heroes, and villains. But then came a cure. The heroes that we once thought were gone were brought back, though there were some that were gone forever, killed before the discussion of a cure even started. However, there was one hero who, if cured, could it change the outcome of the future and give the heroes a fighting chance at whatever may come? You see, in the heart of the sun, Clark Kent has been feeding for the last five years, absorbing so much power that he'd need several of the strongest individuals to hold him down. And that was still a big maybe. Clark's son, John, being the only one who could possibly withstand the intense heat of the sun, went in to pull his father out. And out he came. Clark was much faster and stronger than anyone could imagine. Even Green Canary's weapon, the greatest weapon in the universe, 
was shattered like glass. Between the strength of the heroes holding Clark, there was enough raw power to shift a planet from its orbit. And still, they could barely contain him. Two days went by and the Green Lanterns paid a visit to Madame President Lois Lane since there was no word on the return of the heroes. But before he could get any answers, Jon Stewart's ring tells him that there has been an energy spike. One that is apocalyptic in nature. At that moment, a boom tube opens up and everyone gets ready to attack with a voice calling out that it's okay, it's just them and... Well, Damien and the others make their way out with a cured Clark Kent stepping out behind them. And the first thing that he does is hug his wife Lois. But that wasn't the only one that was brought back. Jonathan Kent returned as well. Though a reunion was in order, the ones who allowed passage, Scott and Barta informed everyone that it was time that they returned to New Genesis. Jacob is waiting and they don't know when they'll be back. Clark tells them that he understands. They owe their son all the time that they can give him. However, the reunion wasn't all happiness and smiles. Even though a Batman did return, he did return alone. Alfred Pennyworth was already having a hard time with what he had done. How he had killed Master Grayson, Tim, Bruce. Damien tries to comfort him, stating that even Bruce didn't know that there was a cure. He did what he had to do at the time. Alfred tells him to please try and not absolve him of his sins. Dick Grayson, Tim, and Bruce could have all been saved. I was the one who pulled the trigger, Damien. Three times I killed my sons. But while the earth slowly began to heal, things began to return to normal. This time, there were two Supermans protecting the Earth, John and Clark. And the very next day, some of Brainiac's probes began to make their way to Earth. But before Jessica Cruz's ring could even sound the alarm, John and Clark were already in space, ripping through the drones. They knew, though, that if Brainiac was sending out probes, he himself was not far behind. A few hours later, Brainiac's ship arrived, and both father and son went to investigate. Clark was ready to protect his son from any threat that Brainiac posed. But Brainiac no longer posed a threat. He was half destroyed. He told Clark that the gods are dead, but still they come. The new gods will poison the universe. The dead gods will be the end of everything. It's been five years. Five long years that Big Barda lost after being infected by the anti-life virus. She was the first to be cured by the virus, and the first thing that she could think of doing was seeing her son, Jacob. She asks if he's grown, and her husband Scott tells her that he has, but he's still their boy. Barta worries that he might be angry at her for being gone for so long, but Scott says that the boy can be angrier at him. He was avoiding being a parent because of his guilt. At least for her, the excuse was that she was in fact dead. Marta laughs, telling him that he's right. Her excuse is so much better. As the two travel to New Genesis through the boom tube, hoping to see paradise, what they find is that the celestial city has fallen. Barta begins to panic, worrying about what could have happened to Jacob, and then she notices another boom tube. But this one is red and darker. She reaches her hand in, determined to find her son, but suddenly a voice yells for her to stop, and she finds herself tackled to the ground. Scott runs over to help Barta up, but Black Racer stands up telling him, She is a god. She will heal. Scott asks, What is that thing? What the hell happened here? And the Black Racer tells him that Dark Side happened. The unliving Dark Side struck. All that weren't killed are now the agents of the Anti Life, and the Mother Boxes have been infected with the Anti Life virus as the new gods have been. Now only the dead and the unliving can pass through the Doom Tubes. Barda asks, where do the doom tubes go? Where is the unliving dark side? Meanwhile, we see the first planet that the undead gods struck, and it was Kuragar, home of seven billion people. Kuragar is the former home of Sinestro, the current home of Natu, and the home of highly trained soldiers all wielding advanced weaponry. But they were nothing in the face of deities controlled by the anti-life. Not long after the invasion, a distress was sent out across Kuragar's entire space sector and it reached War World. And at War World's heart, set Kuragar's most famous citizen, Thal Sinestro. While Sinestro rallied his Yellow Lanterns back on Earth 2, an unlikely alliance began to form in a destroyed spacecraft. 
Guy Gardner says that they can't seriously be thinking about working with Brainiac of all people. You guys know that he destroyed a whole lot of planets, right? As someone who regularly puts his foot in his mouth, even I think that's a bad idea. Superman tells him. You know that he's right here, right? And? Should I be worried about hurting the feelings of a planet-killing supervillain? Half-functioning Brainiac then says that he understands their hesitation and their distrust. But I can offer to show you this on good faith. Superman takes the small capsule from his hands as Guy is asking him what is it. And Superman tells him that it is the last surviving city of Krypton. It is Kandor. Batman asks why is he willing to give that up? And Brainiac simply says that he collects knowledge. If the universe dies, knowledge dies with it. Despite the considerable power at my disposal, unliving Darkseid tore me in half. I barely escaped the attack. And unless we halt them, the undead gods will spread the anti-life equation across the stars. The universe will end. Meanwhile, just outside of Kuragar's orbit, Sinestro uses the full force of his lanterns alongside his war world to fire down on his home world to defend it. The collective blast is shielded by the attack. He looks down as Sinestro sees a bright green shield, and behind it, his daughter, Sorenik Natu, and her husband, Kyle Rayner. Sorenik asks what is he doing, and Sinestro tells her, It is not what you think. I am not attacking our home world. You must get out of my way. Then something that neither the yellow nor the green lanterns could have possibly expected arrives, a Kryptonian. The unliving Supergirl didn't stop to fight the lanterns though. The anti-life equation had a larger threat in its sights. The techno-organic virus attached and infected the largest, most destructive computer in the galaxy. It took control of War World. War World began to fire upon its own yellow lanterns. And while those lanterns are being slaughtered, another more dangerous threat approached. Darkseid flew closer, with Sinestro telling Sorenik not to hold anything back. We have to destroy him! For a moment, all was equilibrium. The gods' eye beams versus the will and fear of a father and daughter. But then that equilibrium was broken by the Kryptonian. She came slamming and disrupting everything and using that to his advantage, Darkseid grabbed Sinestro by the head as he screamed for Sorenik to escape. But before he could finish, his head was ripped off of his body. Sornik was ready to fight after seeing her father literally ripped apart, but Kyle told her that they can't do this alone. We have to go! The two of them fled, and all that was left was the destruction of the Yellow Lanterns. But among that destruction was the headless body of Sinestro, whose ring began to scan for a suitable sentient replacement. Darkseid took that ring, and it told him that he has the ability to instill great fear. As it attached itself to the unliving dark side, he responds, Yes, everything fears the end of life. It was just two months ago that there was a war. A war between the planet of Ran and Thanagar that's been going on for generations. The Thanagarian soldiers would have taken the planet years ago if not for Ran's protector, a man from Earth named Adam Strange. Strange had been brought to Ran by the Zeta Beam. He fought for his adopted world, and he fought for his family. But the problem was that the Zeta Beam had moved him between worlds and was not under his control, and it tended to wear off at the worst times. During one of those skirmishes, Adam was sent back to Earth, to Gotham of all places. He quickly looked up the date and place for the next scheduled Zeta Beam, but upon his departure, he noticed that the city looked decrepit. Also, while leaving, he saw Wonder Woman off in the distance. Except it wasn't just Wonder Woman. It was an infected Wonder Woman. Adam Strange had arrived in Gotham two months ago, a month before the cure was found. Two weeks later, Adam returned to Ron, where he found his family, but with him was the infection, and the threat spread further across the universe. It was only a few days later in the Rylox system that an alien stopped by a bar looking for a fearless noble warrior. A man asks what is the pay, and the alien says that he's looking for someone noble, and he clearly does not fit that description. The bar falls silent as Lobo gets up from his stool, grabbing the alien, asking, And how would you describe the main man then? But before that alien could answer, a Thanagarian warship descended, and with it, Infected Thanagarian soldiers began to pour out. The undead ruthlessly killed anything that they could reach, which included Lobo's bartender. 
Lobo grabbed the soldier that killed the bartender, yelling, That guy poured me my drinks! And with instinct, the soldier started to claw away at Lobo. He stood there, unfazed by the attack, and the soldier says that he did not turn. Lobo tells him, Oh, I can turn! And he begins to twist the soldier's head around and around until... Pop! As the headless body falls to the ground, Lobo looks at his wing, stating, and I'll be taking these, because nobody gets away with killing Lobo's bartender. With all the motivation he needed, Lobo flies straight into the Thanagarian warship's engine room and within seconds brings the giant spacecraft down. Moments later, he walks out of the flaming wreckage, lighting his cigar, and the alien from before tells him that he is a great warrior. Lobo blows his smoke into the alien's face. No shit! You want Lobo to save the universe? Let's talk turkey. Meanwhile, on Themyscira, the Amazons and the friends alike gather around to say their goodbye to Diana. After each says their parts, Queen Hippolyta gives the signal to Green Arrow and Artemis to light the pyre. There is one more in attendance that no one expected. Ares, the god of war, appears, stating, Diana was a fine soldier. And Hippolyta tells him that many gods were invited today, but the god of war is not welcome at the memorial for a warrior of peace. As swords are drawn, Ares says that he is not here to ruin her daughter's funeral. He is here to show them something. Moments later, everyone is brought into the Hall of Gods. They need to arm themselves for what is about to come. Green Arrow looks at a bow, picking it up, stating that the weight feels a little off. Can he tweak it? And Ares asks, You want to tweak the golden bow of Apollo? A bow that hunted the great beast of Carcoon that slew the Leviathan lion? Green Arrow looks at him. Yeah, it's a little top-heavy. Fine, you can tweak it. Ares then goes on to state that there is a war coming, and one that cannot be won, the final war. It will be glorious, but ultimately futile. He will stay to watch the end, but every race in the universe will die. Many people ask, how is he so sure? And Ares holds up a book stating, because this has all happened before. This is how the entire universe was infected. As Green Arrow looks at the book, he says that this is a historical record though, right? How did you beat it last time? Ares tells him, we didn't. This is a record from a universe that was lost. Just then, Black Canary gets an alert from her newly found Green Lantern Ring advising all lanterns that they have to report to Oa immediately for briefing. Green Arrow then asks, Is that the threat you're looking at? Because we already have a cure. We won against the anti-life equation. Oh, you are not fighting the equation. There is something much larger. Darkseid had no idea what he was playing with when he merged the anti-life equation with death. What he has unleashed. What has turned its gaze upon you? Ares then returns the book. This is no equation. This is older than numbers, older than gods. This universe will die. You thought you knew your enemy, but you knew nothing. Erebus is here. More and more of the galaxy began to fall prey to the infection. Ganthet of Oa calls upon all lanterns and their allies. He says that the threat is still growing, and if the virus isn't dealt with, the anti-life equation will soon be beyond containment. Twelve planets have already been destroyed. Over a hundred billion lives have been lost. Another seven planets with species clearly seen as assets by the anti-life equation have been infected. They are not sanctioning a lethal force. These infected worlds must be wiped away. But we have a cure, Superman tells him. We can help these people. Ganthet tells him that though they respect him as Superman, his compassion has been misplaced. The spread just must be stopped. Cyborg says that they're talking about the wholesale slaughter of beings who can be rescued. And Brainiac chimes in. The Guardians are right. Destroying any infected is the most logical course of action. Guy chimes in. Yeah, great. Ganthet, if Brainiac is on our side, maybe we should be rethinking this. Superman steps forward. I will not allow you to destroy entire worlds. And Ganthet stares him down. You will stand against me? As people from both sides begin to rise up, Kyle Rayner steps in. Whoa, 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 can we take this down a notch? I think we're all on edge here. How about we just try and use our words? Ganthet says they cannot risk more powerful beings becoming agents of the anti-living. Kalel of Krypton, you will be detained here on Oa. 
as Ganthet uses his ring to contain Superman. Superman punches through it, hitting Ganthet and slamming him into the ground. The Lanterns quickly come to the aid of Ganthet, and the others too arrive for Superman. And an all-out brawl begins with Ares watching. Marvelous. Damien yells out, Okay, there's something wrong here! I can feel it! Pulse is elevated. Judgment clouded. Emotional response is heightened. We are not in control of this situation. Ares looks at him. You all just needed a little nudge. You need to stop this! Another voice then chimes in, telling Ares, You should listen to the little Batman, because I won't let you hurt Superman! Everyone suddenly stops looking back. And Superman asks, Mixel Pitalik? And the fifth dimensional imp in a bowler hat just smiles. As tensions between the heroes and the guardians rose, everyone found themselves at a standstill until Superman threw the first punch that sent both sides into a fighting frenzy. But as the brawl erupted, Batman quickly noticed that things were seemingly off, like their emotions were running a little too high. After a few moments of putting things together, he realized that it was Ares who was manipulating their anger. Before things could get any further out of hand, Superman's own little guardian, Mr. Mixel Pitalik, appeared before the God of War, stating that he wasn't going to let anyone hurt Superman. Even the Guardians knew not to stand between those two cosmic powers. But it was Superman and John who told them both that they need to stand down that they have too much to fight for to fight amongst themselves. However, there is something that gave the Guardians pause when Black Canary mentioned that Darkseid talked about something called Erebos. Ganthes says that Erebos is something beyond a virus, that the core cannot wipe away the infected planets, and all Lanterns are to report back to Oa to protect the central battery. As Ganthet takes another look to see just how far the virus has spread, he brings up the monitor of planets recently infected, and there is one planet that sticks out with exceptionally high activity. Kilowog looks at it and realizes that it's Bolivax Vic, his homeworld. Immediately, Kilowog takes off, and before any of the other lanterns could follow, Ganthet tells them to leave. If Erebos is at the heart of this, they must call a meeting of the Quintessence. Guy tells him, right, cool. Go decide whether the universe is worth saving by a committee. We'll go fight these things. Ganthet tells him no. No lantern is to face off with the anti-living before the quintessence has spoken. Mr. Middle Pitalik says that it's okay. He and Superman will handle Darkseid and save Bolivax Vic. It'll be a great team up! Bolivax Vic is a planet to 16 billion lives that are all connected by communal mind. As Kilowog arrives, you can already feel the overwhelming emotion, the terror. Before flying down, he's stopped by John and several other lanterns telling him that he isn't going down alone. Kilowog asks, didn't the Guardians tell you all not to engage? And John says that the Guardians say a lot of things. And Guy says, a lot of rules, not a lot of loyalty. Within seconds, everyone is on the front lines of the ravaged planets, doing what they can to save the inhabitants. Superman rushes to protect the innocents, but at that moment he's punched to the ground by a blue and red blur. He looks up at Supergirl, asking why is she wearing that. That symbol is supposed to represent hope. Supergirl turns to the innocents that Superman was protecting, and then using her heat vision, she incinerates them where they stand. Superman gets ready to stop her, but then he's hit from behind by a pair of Omega Beams from Darkseid wielding his newly acquired Yellow Lantern Ring. Mr. Mixelpedalic floats down. All right, all right, enough of that, new god. What should I turn you into, a houseplant, a persuasive essay? All Mr. Pedalic had to do was think it, and Darkseid would have been undone. But Mr. Mixelpedalic didn't have time to think. Without uttering a single word, Darkseid holds up the corrupted mother box and shows him the equation. It was all that it took for a creature many consider to be a joke to become the greatest threat in the anti-life equation's army. Mr. Mixelpedalic began to rip apart his own face. He grew in size and the lanterns quickly surrounded him, trying to stop him. He reached out grabbing John and Kilowog but not before they could shield themselves. He squeezed on the small bubble with Kilowog telling John that he shouldn't have come. But John laughs, nothing could have stopped me. While the other lanterns try to pull Mr. Pitalix's fingers apart, their strength is no match and the fifth dimensional imp crushes the two of them. 
With no one able to stop the rampaging Mr. Mixel Pitalik, he rockets through the planet of Bolivox Vic, destroying it from the inside out as he shoots through it. As he flies, he turns his attention to Oa towards the central battery, and he did not stop. After destroying the battery, all of the Green Lanterns were severed from their power, exposing the core to gravity and the vacuum of space. During all of this, the Quintessence began their meeting, and they can see the Erebos has no intentions of slowing down. Hera says that they're about to lose this universe, and the Spectre says that he will not stand by and allow that to happen. Hera asks if he's speaking as the Wrath of Presence or as the man Jim Corrigan, and Spectre tells her both. And just as all hope seemed lost for the Lanterns, a miracle happened. The Lanterns found that their powers returned as the Spectre restored what was once broken. Mr. Mixel screamed, VENGEANCE! And the Spectre tells him, Agent of Entropy, I am the spirit of vengeance, and I am very pissed off! Clark Kent can see and hear everything, and he can move at such speed that time almost stops around him. So as Bolivax Vix exploded, he was caught in the planet's destruction, but he saw and heard it all. He watched in slow motion, helpless, as 16 billion lives were lost. For the second time in his life, the man from Krypton was powerless as a world died, but he was not the only one feeling the effects of helplessness. Kyle Rayner too watched as not only innocent people died, but his friends. It wasn't that he lost John and Kilowog. He realized what they had lost, plain and simple. There was no hope to come back from this. But even with the loss of a planet and the anger rising, Superman remained steadfast as he looked at Darkseid. However, Superman did not act on his anger. He didn't wildly begin to swing. Instead, he did what he does best, and he told Kyle that they hadn't lost yet. We're still here. But there were bigger things going on at that moment. The Spectre and Mixelpedalic were raging in space, quite literally ripping the fabric of reality with every strike. Black holes were punched in space. Planets and stars were all sucked into oblivion. The remaining Green Lanterns tried to aid the Spectre by slowing the imp down. They tried. They died. However, while the universe hung in the balance of the two fighting giants, the other heroes aboard Brainiac's ship discussed plans on how they can deliver the cure. Barda offers a one-way path through her boom tube, but her priority is on saving her son before anything else. But there's one thing the heroes fail to realize. All the mother boxes are connected and in turn spreading the affection from those who are already undead. Before anyone could act, a doom tube opened, and the undead Isaiah leads an army through, ready to kill anyone that they can get their hands on. John Kent and a few of the other heroes attempt to hold back the horde, while those without powers attempt to escape. Lois Lane calls out for everyone to hurry and get to the arcs, but more doom tubes begin to open up. It was at that moment the universe changed. Adam Strange cut down Leslie Tompkins. What transpired that day may have begun decades earlier, but the catalyst was Leslie. Meanwhile, out in space, the two colossal giants continued to struggle and try to overpower each other, but Erebus was in control of a fifth dimension being. He could just reshape reality. So Superman had other plans. He took his anger and delivered a punch of his own to the imp, stunning him long enough that the Spectre could deliver a fatal blow. Spectre told him that he will not win this. The heart of the universe will keep beating. And though Mixelpitalik was defeated, it wasn't before reaching into the Spectre and tearing out the host from within. The Spectre faded, and Jim Corrigan drew his last breath. He told Superman that this universe is a miracle and to not let it fall. Back with the others, Damien and Alfred watched as the woman they once knew, the woman who devoted herself to healing, turned into the antithesis of everything that she stood for. They couldn't grieve long enough as the unliving father of the new gods crashed into the planet. Without thinking of himself, Damien told the others to get away while he keeps him busy. He swung, punching Isaiah in the face, and Isaiah swung back, effortlessly showing the difference between mortal and god and watching him fall helpless to the ground was a nightmare for Alfred. Without thinking, he moved to protect his last son, Damien, and he screamed, and it was a scream that he contained when the little boy lost his parents in an alley so long ago, a scream that he held in as he ended the life of the three men that he loved, 
a scream of defiance, of grief, of mostly fury. And in that moment, there was a voice that responded across the cosmos. It was a harmony of rage. And in the middle of that scream, two became one, and the specter found a new host. The combination of the two was the spirit of vengeance and the rage of man. They will not allow another son to be taken from him. It was that day that Alfred Pennyworth ended a god. The undead hordes have reached Earth 2, the second home of mankind. Oliver covers President Lois as she evacuates people to the Ark while the war is continuing around them. Also, Lobo has arrived. He most likely won't make anything different. Well, looks like a fragging fun time, the last Caesarian shouts as he arrives on his space bike. He roars forward, grabbing an infected light ray, ripping his head off in the process. On Earth 2, Mr. Miracle and Barda continue their fight, but Miracle pauses for a moment to turn and see their son. Mr. Miracle hesitates, and that's when Jacob, his own son, attacks him, ripping through his chest. Elsewhere, Alfred has become the Spectre, the Spirit of Vengeance. Using his power, he rips through the head of the High Father, who is infected and nearly knocked the head off of Damien. He then turns back to his last son. It's alright, you're safe, he tells him. But Damien looks at him, cuts on his face. No, I'm not. I could feel it in my head. The anti-life equation, I can't stop it! Damien gasps, feeling the anti-life equation beginning to take him over. Cassie lands nearby, taking Damien in her arms. I'm sorry, Cass. I tried. He whispers to her, but he looks at Alfred, telling his old friend that it's not too late. I know you're going to want to tear them apart, Alfred. You'll want to destroy it, but you have the power to save. Damien gasps, the infection beginning to take control as he begins to tear at his own skin. An infected Maxima lands nearby, but Cassie is angered, lashing out, knocking the powerful alien away. Alfred stands still, surveying the death and the destruction around them. And above them, a boom tube opens and the infected yellow lantern, Darkseid, descends upon the planet, flanked by powerful allies and an infected war world. The specter begins to rise before turning to Cassie. Wonder Woman, keep them at bay as best as you can until I return, Alfred tells her. Cassie looks at him in shock. Return, where are you going? I need you, she shouts, but the specter flies away, heading deep into space. No, there is somewhere else I need to be, he says to her. Meanwhile, Superman roars forward, attacking Darkseid, hitting him with a blast of heat vision. Brainiac is there to help. Hold him, Kryptonian, he says to John. But Darkseid turns and the infection begins to spread throughout Brainiac's body. He immediately heads back to his space, now infected by the Erebos virus, where he intends to infect the hundreds of worlds that he has trapped within small bottles upon his ship. But Cyborg follows him, not wishing for the plague that he has brought to this world to spread any further. He blasts Brainiac from behind. We know your name. We know what you are. You can hear me, Arabos. These cities are under my protection, Cyborg tells him, and Brainiac glares back at him. You cannot protect the universe! He snarls, tentacles lashing out to infect Cyborg. But Cyborg smiles. Brainiac can't infect him again. And Vic then takes control of Brainiac, adding his technology to his own. Brainiac is mine now, he says with a smile as he's transformed. He turns around, suddenly having an idea, and he returns to Earth 2. Below them, the citizens are still rushing to the Arks, Oliver looking back to President Lois as a swarm of infected Thanagarians rush them. Madam President, I hate to say it, but there's hundreds of undead between us and the Arks. I'm not usually one to point out the shortcomings of a bow and arrow, but even I have to admit I'm a bit limited in what I can achieve here. But it's at that moment that Cyborg lands among them, scattering the aliens. Lois, where's Kandor? Cyborg shouts with a new, Brainiac-inspired voice. Out in space, John Kent continues to fight against Darkseid, but he sees Warworld positioning itself to strike Earth 2 and destroy it. Keep fighting! John shouts as he flies past his friends with a mighty Cassandra Kane taking charge of beating down Darkseid. John rushes forward, flying in the path of the destruction beam coming out of the war world, protecting Earth 2 long enough for him to fly into the beam and destroy it from the inside out. 
weakened. He tumbles towards Earth to below, but he is met by his father and an army of recently enlarged Kandorians. Dad, I stopped it, John tells his father. Clark Kent Superman looks down at his son with a smile. I saw, son. I saw. The Spectre has now returned, bringing with him shipments of the cure from Earth. He scatters it over Earth to healing the infected, and Damien opens his eyes. Cured. He sees Alfred, Cassie, and Leslie Tompkins leaning over him. He's awake. His injuries aren't too severe. He'll be all right, Leslie tells them. The other heroes are holding down Darkseid, trying to give him the cure, but his skin is too tough. That's when Lobu arrives with the cure in hand. I know a technique. He grunts as he shoves his hand down Darkseid's mouth like he's a dog who needs to take his medicine. The cure works, but Darkseid's big chompers come down upon the Caesarean's hand, taking it with it. You bastard! I use that hand for some of my favorite things! Lobo shouts. Darkseid is cured. He stands confused by what happened and the specter appears before him. You were taken. We brought you back. You have been used, new god, by an entity known as Erebos. Darkseid gets to his feet, turning to Superman, one of his greatest enemies. Darkseid was made upon? He asks and Superman nods. Yes. Darkseid's eyes blaze as he grinds his teeth. My vengeance will be terrible! He rumbles with rage. On Earth 2, the tides of the battle have finally begun to turn in the favor of the heroes. Alfred has delivered the cure needed to revert to those who were once turned undead by the anti-life equation, and the people have started to have hope that they may actually survive this. And even new allies have joined them after Kandor was freed of Brainiac's control and the unlikeliest villain has taken up arms to try and fight back Erebos in the form of Yellow Lantern Darkseid. But while there are many reunions, there are many goodbyes. And those mortals that were buried were buried next to the gods that they fought alongside. Death too was even there to mourn the High Father, the Black Racer. However, with the Black Racer there, Damien had a question for him. His father and his brothers taught him to respect all life. But before he became Batman, before he became Robin, he was an assassin. He was taught to look for weaknesses. He has been thinking about how to bring the fight to the source, and Erebos is a primordial deity. He is darkness personified, and the only thing that can destroy the dark is the light. If Erebos is anti-life, he may have an idea. One that he wants to run by him to see if it could even work. After speaking with the Black Racer, Damien visits Cyborg inside of Brainiac's ship about his plan. Because if Damien's plan is going to work, Vic is going to be the key to stopping it. After explaining the details to Cyborg, the two call on all of the remaining heroes to go over their last ditch effort to stop Erebos. Heroes and villains answered the call along with the old gods and the new. However, there was only one problem with getting to Erebos. He now resides in a limbo outside of their universe, and for them to reach that place, they must pass through a doom tube. The only problem is you have to be dead to travel through a doom tube. Cyborg says that he's been working on a workaround that should be ready by tomorrow. And as for Erebos, he and Batman believe that they have a weapon that can end him. However, to ensure the deity can't escape, they need to be inside of Erebos when they unleash it. They just need to attack it from two different angles. One being the fight in the front that will hold his attention. Darkseid chimes in. I will fish Erebos. Guy Gardner asks if he's intending to monologue him to death. He's then hit by the Omega Beams and simply states, Yep, yep, I know, that one's on me. Why was I mocking Darkseid? But at that moment, Ares chimes in explaining that Darkseid cannot hold the attention of Erebos. When they ask if Ares could hold back the primordial deity, Ares tells him it would be suicide. Cassie asks if he's a coward. Since when is the God of War's plan to hide from it? And Ares says he does not hide. Lois then demands to know where Ares was when her son was standing between this planet and Annihilation, and Lobo chimes in, probably watching. It's what he does. He's more of a creepy stalker than a God of War. Lobo's taunt is what works on Ares as he turns his attention towards him. But Black Racer stops him, telling him that if he faces Erebos tomorrow, he will not be alone. Death will be beside him, as death has always followed war. 
So Ares releases his grip on Lobo and states that he will hold the attention of Erebros. But after all is said and done, Damien tells Cassie that she certainly lived up to her title of Wonder Woman back there. She laughs, stating that goading the God of War into working for them was his play, but she did execute it very well. Speaking of plans, they're going to have to be careful tomorrow. They were already close to losing him once. And Damien says that that's just it. He needs her to stay behind in case they fail. Even with the Green Lanterns here, Damien doesn't trust the Guardians to do the right thing. And the newly freed Kryptons, well, they need to be trained. Cassie says that if he's trying to spare her, but Damien tells her no. He's asking Wonder Woman, the greatest warrior that he knows, to protect the entire universe. So Cassie wants to know what is the weapon then? If only he and Cyborg can use it, what did he come up with? Damien tells her that he cannot tell her what the weapon is. So she turns to leave, telling him that she wants to trust him. But there's still a little too much of his father in him. As she leaves, John flies down with a package, telling Damien that he got him a present. He tells him it's a birthday present. It hit midnight in Gotham about the same time that he thought it would be a good idea to punch the father of the new gods. Apparently, the wisdom coming with age thing doesn't apply. So Damien opens it up to see a brand new Batman suit, a white one. John says that he thought, since they're fighting a primordial deity tomorrow, maybe the personification of darkness could come up against the Light Knight. Damien smiles. Feels right. And no matter what happens tomorrow, John tells him that they're going to win and they're coming back. Yeah, we're gonna win, John. The next day, everyone straps in to be killed. And Cyborg explains that their hearts will stop for only a minute, but just long enough for them to pass through the Doom Tube. Once their hearts stop beating, War World will carry them through to meet with Erebos. They're all shocked and they're all presumed dead. So War World creates a path to the place where Erebos resides. And it's much bigger than anyone was expecting. As Ares and the Black Racer are the first to leave and engage Erebos, Ares says that they cannot win this. Black Racer tells him, No, we cannot. But we will fight and lose the battle and let the heroes win the war. Erebos stares at the two. When there is no one left to fight a war, when there is nothing left living to die, there will still be darkness. Meanwhile, Green Arrow uses the Bone Quiver of Apollo to pierce the darkness when everyone else combined their strength and unleashed their power. Once that crack was made, Lobo flew in to tear it open, allowing the others to pull open a gap big enough for the entire war world to go in. Inside, Cyborg tells Damien that it's time to unleash the weapon, but Cyborg, searching through his memory banks, realizes that he doesn't know what it is. It's like whatever their weapon has been removed from his whole damn conversation. Damien, what have you done? Damien tells him he's sorry. Bruce was a paranoid man, and when you bonded with Apocalyptian tech, Bruce didn't just hide a tracker in you, he hacked your entire system years ago and left the control with you. I found a theory. The anti-life virus leapt from your mind, and we needed the opposite. I found it in you. I found the life equation. I extracted it and erased it from your system. Now it only exists in me. You don't need to do this. Really? You have the greatest technology of two worlds. Your own brilliant mind and the calculating speed of Brainiac. Explain how there's another way, Vic. It can be me. It started with me. But Damien begins to glow as the life equation takes hold. It's already started, Cyborg. It's in me. As soon as we entered Erebos, a chain reaction began. Well, I'm not leaving you here. But that's when his thrusters activate and Damien tells him, You don't have a choice. I've already programmed your flight path back. Goodbye, Vic. As he rockets out, Dinah wants to know what's going on and asks where Damien. Cyborg says that he's not coming. And they have less than three minutes to escape. Darkseid asks, Did the weapon fail? There was no weapon. It's Damien. It was always Damien. Damien took the life equation and activated it inside of Erebos. It's like when matter and antimatter collide. There's about to be a big bang in the center of Erebos. No one can survive what's coming. A universe is about to be born inside of Damien and Erebos, expanding at the speed of light. John radios out shouting, I'm not leaving. But Damien across the radio tells him, It's okay. I'm already gone. Darkseid compliments Damien. Tell the child that his plan is most impressive. And Green Arrow yells that he doesn't need validation from Darkseid. Damien radios back to Green Arrow, telling him that this is how he said it would end. Don't you remember what you said to my father the day that he died? You were talking to Bruce over the radio, but you were looking right at me. 
Batman isn't going to get taken out by a virus. You're not going to get sick and fade away. You're not going to sacrifice yourself for the galaxy, outwitting an evil as old as the stars or something. Green Arrow tries to think something to argue back with, but all he can do is sigh at how right the comment was. Meanwhile above, Erebus grabs Ares, telling him that he can feel the light inside of him. What have you done? What did you do? As Ares attempts to free himself, Erebus squeezes his hands, crushing the god of war. Darkseid tells everyone that Ares is down, and Cyborg opens up a boom tube, telling them all that they now need to leave. But inside, Damien sits and waits for his inevitable end. Erebus speaks to him, explaining that this will destroy the both of them, but Damien tells him not really. He'll become something else. Erebus tries to bargain, but Damien denies him. Damien tells him that this is just his end. Back outside, the last of the heroes depart, and John tries to stay, stating that he won't let Damien die alone. Alfred, as the Spectre, tells him that he doesn't have to. I could take you to Damien. He explains that he will get himself and John out just before the explosion. No one has to worry about John. So while Superman waits for his son, Alfred brings John to Damien, much to Damien's refusal. He yells that they can't be in there, but Alfred says that there is nowhere else that he would rather be at this moment than beside his son, that he can't harm them. Damien explains that they can't save him. John sits beside him. Yeah, I get that. So I thought maybe I'd just sit here, you know, so you weren't alone. Damien looks over. If I told you what I was doing, you'd never have let me do it. John laughs. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have. And you were right. You were a great Batman. As Damien smiles, the final moment arrives, and Damien says, Thanks, John. As Erebos is destroyed, John, Alfred, and Superman all make their escape. And soon everyone begins to realize the sacrifice that Damien made for them. The sacrifice that Batman made for them. For a boy born as an assassin, someone taught to not care about life, he fought against it all, and he ended up saving all life. Sometimes Alfred would visit the cosmos that Damien made, reflecting on having no idea how much a parent would sacrifice for their child. Not until he had his own did he understand what he would give up for them. But he would do anything to prevent any harm from coming to them, and how deeply he misses them. His bats. His sons his whole universe. And there you have it. All of the deceased storyline in one easy to digest video, if you consider a video this long, easy to digest. If you want to see more videos like this, consider liking and subscribing to the Comic Story and channel. And if you really like the full stories, check out our full story channel, where some stories go before they eventually reach over here. It's our secondary channel. I hope you guys enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.